This is a sad day. A oh. red day. I've been day looking forward morning. to this. <laughs> sad a day. day of mourning for Halo. <laughs> for it's the John it's Halo the weekly well, Halo funeral. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it's it's been dead so long. It's hard to feel sad about it. <laughs> uh, it, it really is. It really is the version of stop, stop. He's already dead. And then it is kind of interesting that the flood like, be kind of before you get pulled away. <laughs> yeah, Master Chief, everybody. But Halo just, has yeah. become the flood. The flood are now meta commentary on the Halo franchise itself. If if this was mm. smart, I would agree with that. But this is just dumb zombies. It's not the flood. Uh, yeah, I guess that's actually true. By just calling them the flood, I'm already giving and, it way too much credit. The second uh, faction of zombies in the show, because the Covenant, uh, the first true, faction, the first of faction of zombies, you run right. into incoming fire. <laughs> It does feel like though is like it gets battered by the games, and then it's like we could we could continue to shit on it through other mediums. Like you could not also, you could just <laughs> just not. <laughs> but I'm particularly thrilled about the idea of continuing the story that they created in season one. I guess they had so many ideas for where to take it from there. Oh, and yet, oddly enough, it seems yeah. like they pulled back on a lot of them too. It's an awesome yeah. season. <laughs> a season they chose to not recap as well. They recapped they the events right. of every episode, but not the events of the first season. Interesting. Yeah, so I don't remember like almost anything about the first season. I had I well, had watched the whole thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. I think I think right. I remember this chick. I think I remember this bit. Uh, okay, you whatever. you even for a moment forgot Quan Ha. She's like the best character. What do you mean? Well, I did remember that she had a dumbass haircut and now that's better <laughs> yeah they tried so to fix her. that they realized but really, it's like it one improvement there <laughs> they had their priorities right they fixed their hair <laughs> yeah that, that new showrunner <laughs> he man he really he really turned it around he did such a great job improving on what was you know a rocky foundation he was a bit, you know yeah, there was potential lately. there though there were some ideas that were interesting and compelling you know Absolutely. Who is John Halo? Who is the man behind the mask? What it, we we need to explore the relationship between John Halo and John Halo. Uh, oh, sorry, I mean John Halo and Master Chief. Yeah, they're completely. I thought you were going to say people. John Halo and Cortana, but then I was like, oh, oh but they just that yeah, just didn't exist. Even, never mind. Even, yeah, and they have a relationship <laughs> with each other. Well, that's not that was never like a part of Halo, like on an almost basal level, is the the connection between a human and a. In an Fingers artificial right. intelligence in his head, right? It's an adaptation, all right? It is an That's adaptation. true, it's an adaptation. So they they could have made it better. Cool. They could have done something different and better. They could have adapted the Tation. What does that mean? It's pretty self-evident, isn't it? I wanted to bring it's up... like the Borg. ...that uh, uh, it was May 22nd that the re-upload of our stream of the first season happened. I believe, just to introduce, you know, everyone here... Uh, John was part of it. It was it was big fun. Patricians sort of uh, recently started to interact with us, but he's uh, he's been known to dabble in Halo, and hence why bring him in. And I believe I made good on my threat of the previous stream of, of Halo with ER. I, I said I was going to have him watch <laughs> season two and bring him back for this. So <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> uh, and here we are. You know what uh, you're getting into. You signed up for EFAP. I guess. <laughs> We've been going for Did years. I, you know I don't remember doing that. Did I? Yeah. But hey, you know, here we are. And uh, much like last time, I will be relinquishing the pilot seat because I'm just not as much of a Halo man as, uh, as my friend Fringy here is, who I've experienced many conversations of torture listening to him about how Halo's been destroyed. Rags, of course, relatively big into Halo as well. Boy, I, I sure am, do love Halo. I less so. I, I'm hyper familiar with 3 and Reach. And when I say hyper, I mean I've forgotten a lot of it, but I played the fuck out of them in, back in the day. I gotta get around yeah, to sorry, 1 and 2 at so some point. He gets to enjoy the show just on a fundamental wow, this is just like an awful piece of television yeah. kind of life. <laughs> yeah, uh, the whereas... sadness is something that we get to particularly... Right. Uh, I get to just yeah, be confused right. about it regularly. <laughs> like, I'm just like, a regular like bad a show instead like, of a bad Halo show. Distinctly sort of grim experience of watching something that you used to love get consistently destroyed for the last decade. Kind of culminating in this show, really. It does feel like the culmination of a decade-long destruction of what used to be one of the biggest gaming franchises ever. Ever. Mm. This thing sold systems. Everyone knew about Halo. Mm. Everyone. I mean, Master Chief was... I mean, he still sort of is. 
but in well, particular, yeah, now, he was super Laura iconic. Croft, you know, he he's now only like number seven on that list of uh, the most oh, yeah. iconic video game characters. Lara Croft is number one above Mario and Pikachu. <laughs> Do you have the list? It might be even, it might be um, worthy of a very short rundown of that list if you have it handy. Uh, yeah. It's a very well, interesting. We all, are we all familiar with that uh, that BAFTA like list of the most iconic video game characters? Mm -hmm. I'm familiar <laughs> with it. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I it is a bizarre list. Man. You can't remember all the placements. Um, I uh, remember. Here. I can remember overall. the one wrong one. Well, yeah, but there's, there's one distinctly like, wow, really? <laughs> um, okay. What I was happy about is I have not come across anybody in any I've of the shows here. I'm a part of that have defended that number one slot. Everyone has said that's stupid. Um, it's it's um it's insane. Uh, for for reference, for those who don't know, there was like a list that BAFTA did for like the top, you know, the most iconic video game characters. So ascending from, well, ascending here let's ask um. What do you right. before we do the the list before we learn the truth? Chat, yeah, Chad, who who is the objectively correct answer <laughs> for the most iconic video game character? Yes, there, who would you? One answer. Yeah, Chad, give us your go ahead and give us because one is pretty obvious. Give us your top yeah. three most iconic video game characters of all time. So give yeah, it, give us your top three. Who you think are the I mean, most can, the three most iconic? Probably already say even by Chad. Like, so Mario's out of the way. Good. Correct. Yes. <laughs> we've, now that we've established yeah. the correct, the objectively correct answer, that only a fool yeah. would say otherwise. To. Who, who would chat say is next? Because at this point, I think that there are like a few really, really, really like strong but easy answers to that. Seen. Yeah, I would of, probably say. I, I'd be inclined. Yeah, to Mario. Pac-Man's totally fair to me. Um, Mario, Pac-Man. Um, I'm seeing a startling lack of a very obvious choice though here though, which is very interesting. That's the thing. There's a lot of obvious choices. Well, you've got a, you've got a pretty. I think that a particularly obvious choice. Um, the the line piece hold. from Tetris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that... Oh, I was. Oh, I was thinking about the paddle from Pong. Um, Are those guys the same was, guy? Uh, is that the same actor? <laughs> yeah, it was actually a cameo. Same personalities. <laughs> it's a. Allegory on depression. A twenty four made like, it. Fight, fight club. Fight club with Pong, where he realizes that the other Pong is him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, I've seen a lot of Link, which I think is also another pretty obvious choice. I'm, Link is uh, fair. I, I'm surprised that there wasn't as many people saying Pikachu, since Pokemon is like, Pikachu's I think actually, one. I think Pokemon might actually have made more money as a franchise than Mario at this point. I'm not sure. It's, I think it's it, really but, like but Pikachu's think it has, not really actually. like a figurehead of each Pokemon game. So but Pikachu he's, is the mascot of Pokemon. He is the mascot of Pokemon. Um, he is. He goes past video games in a way that's just yeah. like cultural phenomenon. Well, like Mario shows trading cards, all that stuff. Sense. It's just that Mario is like kind of like. When you think of video games in the most general sense possible, Mario would be like the first character you'd think of. But I suppose with all those answers out of the way, let's let's go for number two. We are a good amount of mm -hmm. uh, Kratos in there, which is interesting because he is... Kratos is not a bad he, one. Yeah, part of a couple he's generations. To to he feels yeah. like you'd be right at the top of the sort of next tier. Um, um and then Gwyneth, yeah, of course. Right. It's what's interesting to think about is that with. You know, that there'd be like a lot of characters where as soon as you mention them, you'd be like, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, you'd, you'd think, Samus. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh well it's interesting that you say that because I feel like you'd be there there are certain characters, you know, like from Rockstar games, right? It's like, look, Grand Theft Auto Five is like I think the second best selling video game ever. I think you would I think it would have to be accepted that like maybe Trevor would be like pretty high up on that list, even though you might be, yeah. Mm -hmm. be the kind well, of Well, I would say um I would say that I think uh, Steve from Minecraft is yeah, probably I think really, really high up there as well. Yeah. Minecraft was, is um, the best-selling game of all time, after all. Part of being iconic, I would imagine, is that if it's multi-generational spanning, if my fucking parents can identify mm -hmm. it pretty easily, which they would be able to with Mario, then uh, it's it's got a lot of power. Pac-Man easily. That's why those two are really, really strong choices. But someone a like a... Um, yeah. You know, like a Master Chief or Kratos, like I think my parents' generation aren't going to be able to do either of those. Um, but younger, but they'll know Pikachu and Pac-Man, and you know. they might they'll probably be able know to Donkey Kong. <laughs> I'm not sure. Probably, they probably know Donkey Kong, right? 
I think, think that's so. One. I want to well, say that. That's the really that's... awkward part is that if you think about a list of iconic video game characters, it's going to look a bit a like a lot Smash of his Nintendo. Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, like there... Nintendo hey, Nintendo did the work. They get to cash in. There was that other tournament that was held where Zelda games just slaughtered everything that they went up against. Well, like in terms what do you of mean? My favorite games they did like a, a bracketed tourney of not game characters, but the games themselves. And uh, I think in every category where a Zelda game was up, it won the vote. Mm. And it culminated in, I think, Ocarina of Time winning. Like Ocarina of Time is at the game. top of all time game lists a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Very frequently. Which is why I was wow. surprised that like Link wasn't considered number one if Zelda was so consistently a winner in that um, other bracket. I well, the interesting thing is that in terms of actual like sales, it's now more recently that Zelda has become like ultra successful. It, it's always been very successful, but like Breath of the Wild, uh, kind of catapulted it into we're talking like tens and tens of millions of copies sold. It's it's like the Switch has made it to where basically every Nintendo series is more successful than it's ever been, uh, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon because it can be seen with basically every series, Metroid Dread is the best-selling Metroid game. Kirby mm. in the Forgotten Land is the best-selling Kirby game. Uh, Mario Kart 8, I mean, even down to, you know, the general franchise, like Mario Kart 8 is the best-selling Mario Kart game. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, I think, is the best-selling Super Smash Bros. game. Um, yeah, it's just like every single series is getting even more and more successful on Switch, which is why, to spoiler, this list is very underrepresentative of our Nintendo characters <laughs> compared to where they should be sitting. There's... There's the tournament that before this game's character list was making the round itself for being a bit atrocious. Well, anyway, yeah, I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a list that will make them happy. But, 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 uh, but as to list. as to the number one most recognizable video game character, if, obviously yeah. Mario. Obviously, well, Mario. Yeah. We, we reveal the list now. Yes. I mean, yeah. Well, here's what yes. the real list is. Uh, fools that we are. We've been, yeah. you know, so, we've been prattling on with our cool. delusions, but. <laughs> Now we can it, check out what the real list is. An ascending order from like number. Have you got it from like ten to one? I got one through nine oh. on you. Well, I'll just read it's from top 20, twenty on the list, right? Yeah. So, well, I think it goes even further than that. But twenty yeah, is Nathan 20. Drake, uh, which is like Nathan yeah, Drake. I don't. Uh, I don't know if he should yeah. be on that list, but maybe. Well, it's, maybe. look, all right, it's recognizable. Uncharted is a very popular series. Uh, number nineteen is Ellie. Uh, eighteen. The Last is, of Us. Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. Well, I just, I, 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 yeah, I probably should read out the game as well. Uh, eighteen is Kazuma Kiryu from Yakuza. Seventeen is Ast Asterian from Baldur's Gate Three. I haven't played it yet. All right. Uh, all right. So I, I think <laughs> that I haven't no. played Baldur's Gate Three, but <laughs> no. there is no way that any Baldur's Gate Three character should be on the top twenty iconic characters oh, of wait, all time. They, yeah. Absolutely not. Are they in no. more than just Baldur's Gate Three? But they're citing Baldur's Gate Three, or is it? No, they're there's in older. Gate 3. Uh, Asterion, Probably I think, not. was in two, but I mean, the, he's Baldur's Gate Two is not an iconic. Yeah, game, I don't think so. that would even budget. Yeah, it, it is. A, there's a lot of recency bias with Baldur's Gate characters being I think on this that, list. Surely, yeah. part of iconography for a character is that you haven't even played their game and you know some of the characteristics. I think I don't know any of his characteristics other than Fucks like... Bear. I know why Shadowheart <laughs> is on this list. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I think that's uh, yeah, that's an interesting element of like, what does it mean to be iconic? And it, it does seem like your awareness of them spans like beyond even just like having even played the game. That there's some you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, I recognize that character. I've heard of him. I I know what games he's been. Especially in or people like, like us who play games a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, 16 is Cloud from Final Fantasy 7, uh, which mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. Final mm -hmm. Fantasy 7 is mm -hmm. like the most popular one. So, uh, 15 is Crash, which is interesting because it's like, man, it has been like a long time since his heyday, but goddamn, during his heyday, what a lad. Uh, I mm -hmm. think he should be higher, but that's just me. <laughs> fair. Number 14 fair. is enga Engagement Bait, uh, the wrong Solid Snake. Hmm. Uh, uh, oh, well, yeah, 14 is Solid Snake. Uh, that is which, not Solid yeah. Snake. It, that's uh, what does that, I have on there? Uh, that's Big Boss. It's Big right? Boss. Yeah. Whoops. Or sorry, it'd be the snake that you know snake. you can program on your like on your like calculator. <laughs> He's pretty yeah. iconic. Yeah. The snake that's from pretty snake. iconic. Pretty iconic. Um, the titular snake. 
13 is Steve from Minecraft, who should be much higher. Much uh, higher. He should yeah, probably be top five. five. Yeah. Um, number 12 is Pikachu, who, again, I think should be much Another higher. Top, top five. Um, three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is Pikachu beaten out uh, by fucking Baldur's Gate 3 character? That doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> the people who answered this list are silly. I think, I think it is just... We're encountering the problematic areas yeah. of the list now. Like, <laughs> the seriously yeah. big ones. Well... Yeah. well Eleven is Arthur Morgan, which I think is really fair. When you that actually could turn out to be the perfect it, place for him in retrospect. Like how beloved the character is, yeah. Uh, number ten is Shadowheart from Baldur's Gate Three. So already we've encountered like that. There's only one Ma spoiler. The only Mario character is Mario on the list. All right, like and yeah, there's oh yeah, there's oh, yeah, there's two. no way a Baldur's Gate Three character should be on this list. I'm sure the well, game is excellent and amazing, we, but let's be honest. We mentioned it before, but like Bowser should be on the list. Bowser like should be on the list. Recognized video game characters. It, if if we're not limited to one person. I'm series, surprised if Eggman made it as well. I, yeah. yeah. I would it's pick weird because a lot of these people. Shadowheart. Shadow, Heart, Shadow the Hedgehog. I would say that Shadowheart isn't even the most recognizable character from her own game. Mm. It's, I, I would uh, say a lot more people talk about Harlack because of the porn. Yeah, this is our courage. Um, so, uh, yeah. Go on. I was just going to continue reading with the list. Stuff That's fine. Yeah. Uh, number nine is Kratos from Good Old God of War. Yeah. Which, again, yeah. when you think about it at this point, it's like, yeah, I mean, he is pretty recognizable. He's probably the most recognizable been... PlayStation character at the moment. Yeah, he's been around a few generations and That's the relevant. big thing about him is he's, he was big for several eras, which is, or at least big more than one era, now. which is always handy. Um, number eight is Master Chief, which is an interesting one because we'll talk about this when we <laughs> oh, get yes, into we will. the show. Yeah, we'll talk about all Mr. Chief should be on the list. But what I am curious about now is like what kind of demographic would be rep what kind of demographic would be most likely to put him really high on the list, and what kind of demographic at this point would be like, oh, I mean, yeah, like he's yeah, like I mean, I guess I know who he is, but like he's not been that relevant for a long time, you know. So, like, Probably lost point points he's because also, of the show. I think we'd have to argue he's a bit <laughs> diluted now too. He's like all over the place. Yes. If you if you made a list in like 2010, I could imagine Master Chief being like quite high. But uh, now it's it's like hmm, he probably does slide because there's just other characters that are on people's minds a lot more often than he is. Um, I guess it's interesting because if you were to pick another Xbox character, well. Funny, if we think about Xbox ownership, it's like, hmm, I wonder how high Banjo Kazooie, for instance, would end up being. Uh, I wonder if you did the list in like 2013 or 2012, how high Marcus Phoenix would have ended up on the list. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, it's interesting to see yeah. where you place it in the timeline, what characters would end up higher. Because, like, again, if you, like, if you place it in the PS2 era or like PlayStation 3, it's like, I wonder how high you get like Ratchet and Clank, for instance, um, or, or uh, like Jack and Daxter. But uh, anyway, number seven is Link, which again is insane. He should be like top five, top mm. maybe top three. Um, yeah, yeah, number maybe six top, yeah, five, top five. <laughs> six is Pac-Man, which is like, yep, Pac-Man should be pretty high up. Now, now here's where we start to get into the what the really like. Number five <laughs> is Sackboy from Little Big Planet. No, that's a name Wait. I haven't heard in him. That first iconic minute. character. It's just yeah. like. I'm fine with him being recognizable to some degree, but like you can't be beating all these other. There's no way this. <laughs> it's not happening. Look, I like Zack Boy. I like the character design. He's fun. But Little Big Planet came out like 15 yeah, well, years there's, ago. There's, there's gonna be so many people who don't even know who that is, or don't even know what Little Big Big Planet is. And it's like, oh well, yeah, yeah. If it was like you're speaking to a very specific time when like Little Big Planet was a uh, was a big thing. Because something like, like a Pac Man. I feel people discover Pac-Man whether or not there's even a new Pac-Man. Just that's just something everyone yes. finds out about. Well, kind of yeah. like how everybody heard of Space Invaders and yeah. Tetris and Pong. Those are just things that you know about. Um, mm -hmm. no, number four is Sonic, which is it's funny because you'd be like, yeah, I mean that that makes about sense. It's like yeah, but it won't. <laughs> which, which characters are still to come? Number three is Agent Forty Seven from Hitman. No way. <laughs> That's insane. That's silly. I would be surprised yeah, yeah. if he was on the top 20 list, period. The fact that he's yeah. number 20. Why would they even say that? What? Like, I'm trying to think what got that many people to say Agent 47. I have no like, was What it happened? Story? That came out like a couple of years there ago. There was a I movie. Guess. Yeah, but that came out a while ago and nobody liked it. 
That's true. <laughs> the movie. Um, uh, remind me again how this list was even procured. Was it like a, a voting based thing or? It was a poll of 4,000 players. Okay. So, uh, okay. so were they journalists? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that like Hitman is intergenerational. He's had, he's had his ups and downs over the years, but to be number three. Yeah, is a no way he gets There's no three. way. No, he's in he that is, like uh, he's in that Kratos Solid Snake yeah. Master Chief pack of like he's been relevant. He's a for little a long below time. them, I'd say. I'd say yeah, he'd be like he'd be like in the realm of like twenty to thirty would probably be where he'd be slotting in. I reckon maybe a little bit higher, but certainly maybe, not number yeah. three. That's crazy. Um, okay, number two is Mario. <laughs> number two, <laughs> which if and you didn't know what number one was at this point, is you just be like, who is number one? They, they beat Dude, out. Who, Mario. Yeah, damn. Who is number one? We haven't mentioned this person uh, yet. One. We haven't done that. So number one is Lara most... Croft from Tomb Raider, the most iconic video game character of all time. Oh, she's from a game. <laughs> I'd only ever seen her in porn. That's how I recognized her. <laughs> I only yeah. ever knew it from the iconic <laughs> movies with Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Boy, I find like this one so interesting because I remember, like, you know, in the early 2000s, it's like, oh, Lara Croft, oh, wow, Lara Croft. But, like, that was a long time ago. And I feel like Tomb Raider, look, I don't think, to I feel like Tomb Raider hasn't been that culturally relevant for a long time. I feel like Uncharted, it's been, it, it um, it, like, it's come up time, recently with, know? like, cultural war stuff, but... I guess, certainly not come but... up recently because of an amazing new game or anything. Well, I mean, the last game came out like five years ago, and nobody really talked about it. Like the, I, I and then there was that movie that came out that nobody watched either. We got the, um, um, I watched it in theaters. But the remaster that came out for the Why? original three games, right? I was curious. There's about that. It. I, right. This is something that it's probably something that's worth adding. Is like Tomb Ra <laughs> uh, like Lara Croft being somewhere on the list. It's like, yeah, she'd be fairly yeah, high up. In... But like, so she's she'd in that same yeah. Agent 47 pack. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. She would I, I be above she, Hitman. Yeah. She'd probably be around Kratos level, a little bit below Kratos, I think. Because she's I iconic wonder, to a degree. But how, how high she would end up on that, uh, on that list if, if we were being like... You know what would be interesting like is if... People have heard of the character, sure, but... As if the mm. six of us took this selection of 20 and ordered them in what we believe to be most to least iconic and see how our lists compare. Oh, um, I guess the interesting thing is that it's like, what does it mean to be, for lack of a better word, impartial, I guess, in, in terms of, like, figuring out where the characters sit? Because, I mean, I fucking love Crash Bandicoot, and it's like, well, how high do I think he would I'd actually just probably go by slotting? what I think is their recognizability within all generations averaged out. Yeah, I would just say, do the parents mm. test. Would your parents yeah. recognize that character, put them at the top? Um, I guess... That's an interesting one because how many parents would recognize Steve from Minecraft? Yet, how high do we think also Steve the, should be? The two variables I think we'd a lot have to consider people... are the parents one, but then the sheer impact they have with the current generation as well. Like, because Steve would be mm -hmm. huge, um, potentially more than Sonic's current impact, but Sonic has a huge uh, Sonic has a legacy generations, impact. yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Like Mario, Sonic, Pac-Man. Interesting that Mega Man's not on the list because I feel like even Mega Man, yeah, Mega Man. Enough, Oh yeah. What the fuck? enough legacy that he should be, even though it's you know been a while since or it hasn't been that long since the last game, right? But I'm surprised he's not here somewhere. What a list. Anyway, oh yeah, it, Mega Man, yeah. It, it's a it's a crazy it's a what a list. Of a list. There was a it's time crazy. where Arbiter would be on this list. There was a fucking time. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah. Halo that's that, that's that, that recency bias thing. Like, if this was asked, let's say, fifteen years ago, you know, Sam Fisher would be on this list. Ooh, but, yeah, you know, Sam oh, Fisher. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, it's it is interesting to think about how that had the flow of time. Now he's down into probably the top fifty at this point. Oh, yeah, probably. Which is still pretty good, is, but yeah, people think he's in a Cabela's game now. <laughs> I get it. Thank you. Well, that was, was that a nice tangent. To, to not, made? Yeah. That really was a nice tangent noise? to not talk about the uh, Halo show. Well, yeah, that was uh, a nice little tangent. Yeah, it's uh, um, it's about time for the misery. We've been trying to delay it, but there's just <laughs> oh, nothing we can oh, do. Oh, the misery! By the time that we're done, we're going to be looking like uh, I look all right. So in the thumbnail, that's uh, that's that's good old Arbiter in this show. But I like to call him Mister Mandibles. 
because I like to give them fun names to differentiate the characters. So we're going to be looking a bit like that probably by the end. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty miserable. But look, all right. Begging for death. It's, we'll get. We'll be miserable important. together. So don't worry. It's important. We'll look like um, this him is... at the end of the first episode of Smiling Friends. Uh, oh me. yes, that's a good one. <laughs> that, it looked that... like uh, the All Quiet on the Western <laughs> Front kid. What well, thousand yard stare? Yeah, I forget yeah. the name. I've read the book. I forget his name. Um, so I figured that the, the easiest way to start <laughs> is good old, good old like, uh, what did everybody think about uh, Halo, the television series season two? Why don't we go? Yeah, we'll go left to right. So ER, why don't you? Tell us what you uh, thought about season two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> clear clear um, the minds for the rest uh, of this. Uh, uh, mainly trash. Um, but uh, I, I just I, I I literally couldn't follow most of what was going on. I didn't <laughs> understand. Like I legit didn't understand m many of the plot threads going on. Why anyone was doing what they were doing. Um, that's good. That's, uh, that's, that's that actually excellent. might work to the strengths to, to the show's advantage. Yeah, so not being the able show, to the, show, the show right. yeah. is like, oh, thank God. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> I, I think that might end up. I being will a say, um, show. what uh, I'll let you finish, but what we will do is we'll definitely be doing a brief summary of season one because I know that most of you in chat don't remember what happened. Uh, <laughs> and this this season two makes it very confusing. But yeah, continue. Season two um, doesn't even remember what happened. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, oh, well, what else is there really to say? Um, kind of a uh, it. Uh, it was expected, but you know, uh, the dude was it in his fucking suit for how many episodes? I think it ended up Eight. being four episodes. Uh, from episode like about ten minutes into episode three until the very end of episode seven. <laughs> yeah, that was very very noticeable. Um. Mm -hmm. Fun times. And um and there's one other big point, but I'm I'm forgetting because this this show kind of fried my brain a little bit. That's uh, okay. Yeah, that that that's that's kind of the gist of it. Terrible. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> slightly better than the first one because I remember the first one was so surreal and experienced that I just look all right. Better better ending at least. We'll uh we'll talk kind about of wreck <laughs> <laughs> um so i hate it uh as i really really dislike it um but i i don't know that i would call it an improvement if i if i ever did it would be in the most like marginal slightest sense possible but like th this season is riddled with problems all of its own of its own making uh aside from the ones that it inherited and frankly the ones that it created uh, in part because they wanted to run away from certain aspects of season one. Um, but on the other hand, they clearly could tell that they couldn't. And it seems like there was a degree to which they thought that some of the ideas in season one were actually workable. And so what you end up with is like a season that's comparably messy to season one. Um, terrible character writing, um, horrendous world building, an absolutely insane plot. It seems to stem from the writers having, like, this idea that they need to create these insane, like, subplots and conflicts in order to keep things interesting rather than just adapting the central conflict that was present in the games. And yeah, of course, it's a continues to be an incredibly unfaithful adaptation of uh, the games. I hate it. Um, that's my piece for now. <laughs> John? Uh, I, this was crushingly boring. Uh, lame <laughs> yeah. overall. I had such a hard time paying attention. I have a fidget toy. It helps <laughs> me with like editing and writing sometimes. And I was mashing things on it like crazy, just trying to get myself to like pay attention to what was happening. I had to rewind it a bunch of times because I was just like, what the fuck happened? What was that? What's going on? There are like, there's some filmmaking and editing decisions that are just so fucking jarring where I'm like, I can't believe they did it like that. So much of the dialogue is flawed. I don't care about any of the characters. When anybody dies, there's no... You don't feel anything. It's just like, hmm, okay, cool, I guess. Well, not cool. It all sucks. Almost all of it sucks. Like, there's a few action scenes where I was like, that looks kind of cool. There uh -huh. are a couple scenes where the dialogue I did find interesting. But then whenever that happens, it's 
like only in a matter of minutes until it's like, oh, it's dog shit again. Um, yeah, it was. I wouldn't have even bothered watching this season, honestly, if if uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I knew I was gonna like talk well, about friends it. Like so, us. so I just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just slogged through it and uh, just really disappointing. I can't believe it took us this long to get onto the fucking Halo ring, like two seasons. Mm. <laughs> like it should have should have taken one season at most. To get onto the prologue ring. of all fucking time, yeah. So, yeah, wasn't impressed. It was pretty lame. good. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, it was <laughs> great. <laughs> Ten awesome. Uh, um, well, me so thumbs up. What do you think? I was, uh, as mentioned, in a unique position for the most part because this comes across in an abstract way as just another weirdly high budget sci fi TV show. And then someone was like, like spilled a bucket of Halo on it, and it was like, oh, he messed that up, and it's like, eh, it's fine, whatever. It's all it's all stuff that you recognize, but it's all just misplaced and randomly thrown in. Not that I would ever be able to tell that fully, but that watching it, it's just like any other really bad TV show. It's the the basic cause and effect of everything is so fucking muddled and confusing. The um the writer's goals are so obvious with almost every scene. Like you'll just have the very forced uh events happening but you know whether it's um character payoffs that are on the way that need to be set up your, your typical stuff like one of the funniest ones and you guys will see this when the halo episodes come out is uh there's an episode that begins with a character who's uh you know just like admiring birds and we were all like he's dead <laughs> like it's the, like, he's, <laughs> he's like look at look at this guy he likes his animals oh isn't that sweet oh he's such a nice guy <laughs> well he's bizarrely fun. they're trying to characterize this character <laughs> Yeah, His time is limited. That's the that's what Walking Dead used to be known for. Like the memes, it was like, oh, whatever, get a character that gets slightly more attention than usual. It's like, well, they're fucked. And um, yeah, that goes the same for like everything that's built up. Um, and then you know you have that, but then you also have these really wide stretches of time where you fall asleep, wake up, and you've missed nothing. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll just keep going. <laughs> and of course, you may be like, well, wait, what was, you know, 7x23's, you know, singular pattern file? And then your friend just goes, oh, yeah, left. And you go, right, yeah, I got it. Just <laughs> making sure just so I can, <laughs> you know, keep up to date. But um, every once in a while, they'll throw in a scene that's clearly like, it's just funny, even from my POV, right? It's uh, kind of playing on the screen now. You'll see it soon. But the, the scenes of, you like that, don't you? Yeah. Look at that. They're, they're doing their fights. You remember Halo, you did your little fights. And they, I feel like more of that was given this season. Not much more, but more enough that they were like, surely people on social media will say they like this. Come on, we've done their thing now. And then once now they do it, do yeah, once they do it, they're like, now we can have our three hours of characters talking <laughs> with their helmets off. And you're like, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I thought it was absolute shit, um, but kind of funny. <laughs> um, I kind of wish it was funnier, but, you know, we, we take what we get. Patrician. Um, I had come into this with a kind of unique perspective as somebody who was very invested into this back during uh, Halo's heyday. I was one of those that read the books and all that. I think the books are good adaptations of the games. They kind of mesh well together. You don't need one to enjoy the other. And um, But I had missed the first season because I just didn't hear anything positive about it. So why would I expose myself to that? So I got to come into this with a fresh perspective of OG Halo fan kind of fell off the wagon a while ago and hadn't seen the first season. And they had talked in the marketing about how this was going to be like a, a uh, correction to the great error that was the first season. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to be negatively biased towards the show if I don't watch the first season. And uh, all of that marketing was a lie. It just seemed to be continuations <laughs> based on what I heard of things that were wrong with the first season and my perspective wasn't rewarded because um they don't do a recap of the first season and so <laughs> I, I, I fringy gave like a five minute summary and that was all i had to go on for like half of the plot lines that have nothing to do with the halo games where it's just knockoff expanse show um but the main thing that bothered me was as somebody who was familiar with the books it's very unrewarding to watch this show because they do reference a lot of the things from the books, but they change almost everything about it. So they're just saying names that you recognize. Key example being, for example, Onyx, 
Ghost of Onyx was a really well uh, accepted sh not show but book and they use the Spartan 3 program but they it's completely unrecognizable to the Spartan 3 program so it's just a reference that exists for the sake of having a reference and so uh, as a Halo fan I just found myself perpetually disappointed because I can get into this whole like insurrectionist pre finding the ring plot line if they actually did it the way that it had been done well before but if they're not going to do that they should just skip to the part that they are shown in the fucking games so it's it's <laughs> i take it that you liked it thumbs up yeah it was a, I, I was a big that, fan you, you my it, favorite though. scene was john chief getting beaten to death for uh, acting like a psychopath all season that was a good one. It was that was <laughs> cathartic, oddly. Yeah, if, if, I mean, if there's one thing to be said about season two, it's that it is consistent. <laughs> oh, God damn it! It is consistent in uh, John Halo's continuing inconsistent insanity. <laughs> Just as, like continuing over into this. Yeah, they've created well, a well, fascinatingly strange the, character. Um, whoever this guy is, Riggs. What do you think of season two? Ooh boy. Um. The other day, I saw a picture of Arbiter and Shipmaster Vadum having a, a gay sex together, and it was it was really quite good. I really enjoyed it. I the dialogue was good. It characterized the two differently. Arbiter was a bit on the shy side, but you know we all knew what we were there. We were there for good proportions, great line work. I enjoyed that one image, that one JPEG more than the entirety of both Halo show seasons. If you squished them all together, put them in a blender, strained them, and took out all the good things, it wasn't as good as that one image. I hate this show. I, it's not my most hated show, but as someone who really, really enjoys the first five Halo games, Halo 1, 2, 3, ODST, and Reach, um, they made up a pretty big part of my gaming childhood. I think that Halo on the uh, on the Xbox was the first first person shooter I ever played. Um I have a lot of memories of playing Halo with my friends at sleepovers, birthday parties, visits, get togethers, that's all that that's all the, that whole thing. So to see it desecrated like this is legitimately uh kind of upsetting to me and I hate it. Yeah. I I hate what they changed. I hate many of the details about it. I despise so much about this show from top to bottom. The characters, what it's trying to say thematically, the details they brought in for the games, the, the way that the plot unfolds and the bizarre structure. I hate it pretty much through and through. My, um, my compliments to the show would probably not broach anything past the most superficial that thing looked kind of cool kind of comment. But that's really as far as it goes. This show should not have been made, and if you are a big Halo fan who is just waiting for that big you know, show-slash-movie adaptation that, honestly, it kind of deserves, then, unfortunately, I will have to refer you back to the books or to the excellent graphic novel. But apart from that, hmm... Thumbs down from me. Thumbs down from me. Talking. So yeah. Talking. It's uh, not a... It's, yeah, it seems so like not as good as the point. Nobody here, nobody here particularly enjoyed it, which is kind of interesting to think about because um, the general sent... It's funny to say the general sentiment since I don't even know that there is one. I feel is like there... this, uh, this season has been distinctly less um, talked about than season one, which makes a lot of sense, really, when you think about it. Like, if you come out with a first season that is pretty much unanimously seen as being shit um yeah there's there's a lot of people who just aren't going to show up next time around and then there's the fact that you know like halo at this point's at the lowest it's ever been um but i mean the 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 sort of the idea surrounding this season is well it's an improvement <laughs> it's an improvement <laughs> on season one um isn't it amazing which, uh, that we're in a culture that like allows that to be the commentary for something that costs hundreds of millions of dollars well, it was better than yeah. that really, really awful season of television that was also like a hundred million dollars. Like, it's, like it's, it's a child crazy. who's doing little crayon drawings, and it's like that's really good compared to you're even better. Look, last year you did that. This year you did this. That's great. <laughs> I suppose what's interesting when you say that is it's like they simultaneously get the benefit of look at how hard all of these people worked on this thing. You can't dislike it because that would be mean. But then simultaneously <laughs> get the benefit of like 
Well, yeah, but that you know, like it's it's not like this is a one hundred million dollar. It's not like this show has a budget considerably higher than basically the majority of television shows ever produced throughout all of time, or even the majority of films that have been made throughout all of time. They they had so much money. It's crazy. It is not fair. Well, it's not fair. Well, they yeah, got so I mean, much money to do this to Halo. It just isn't fair with all the stuff that you could do with all of the incredible potential that exists in the Halo universe to make a show, it just isn't fair that someone was able to be given a check of this size, and this is what well, they made. I mean, I mean, in a sense, like, getting a set... The, the thing is, I think the second season got um, greenlit before the first season came out, so I guess they came into it with a lot of confidence, which is pretty funny. Um, but it's, it is pretty crazy that after season one, they'd be like, yeah, let's, let's continue with this. This is a... It's a good idea to continue with this premise that we've laid for ourselves, because... Before we dive into season two, it's probably worthwhile to go through briefly, not for too long, the general events of season one, just to get everybody up to speed on uh, on essentially how the first season of the show made it to where the idea of a faithful adaptation of Halo, even in subsequent seasons, should have been accepted as being impossible. Um, it, it is like season one is uh, leaves you in a place that is so massively different from the games that there's no point in even clinging to the hope of, whoa, it's going to be faithful. Um, and then, of course, you've just got the fact that it was a really terrible season of television. What You know what? What does everybody here generally remember about season one? Like, what would be the thing that sticks out to your Master mind? Master like, Chief oh, fucking died. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's right. That's, the, that's, that's what that's... I remember. But wait, Smash how could, how could that be possible if he was in this? What do you mean? They explained I know. it. They fully explained it really quickly. This was a prequel. They put right? him oh. on a. They put him on a medical table. Yeah. Mm. Oh, those are good. That's Injected right. him and with they life, black, and then they jumped ahead six months, and he's fine. <laughs> squeeze the life. Yeah. Yeah. For syringe. reference, everybody, just to Not just to catch you up. Squeeze from your man nipples. Mm. At the end of season one, uh, John Halo, they, they were they were having a battle with the Covenant. Um, when they were about do. to find Halo using ancient Forerunner artifacts called Keystones, and they were losing. And so John Halo talks to Cortana and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill myself, and you're going to take over my dead body so that you can save the day. Cool. And then he walks up to a brute who hits him with a gravity hammer and kills him, and then Cortana takes over his dead body and saves the day. That's what happens at the end of Season 1. Mm -hmm. That's a thing that happened. We're not fucking with you. This isn't a yeah, joke. That's actually what happened. It has been near two years not... since we talked about this, so some people may have forgotten. <laughs> it's possible. It's that they were being, it, it was in, immensely confusing, but they were pretty, they were very, I'm not even going to say, they were pretty clear. They were very clear that he that he was dead. Uh, he, he died, but he didn't. That <laughs> makes no fucking Matt sense. Returned. Like, why would the hammer kill him? Like, why would he think like this is this is my sacrificial moment? The hammer will hit me, and then I will be dead. And I mean, I'll be out of this like, show. I like, I like yeah, how you yeah. said that. Was evidently, like, it didn't. The the main thing that doesn't make sense <laughs> that like the whole plan itself is insane. Yeah, I'm gonna die, and then you can take over my corpse. That makes sense. Yeah. And so, just to be clear, the, Cortana and Master, or sorry, John Halo were friends all through that season right up until that no, point where she took uh, him over they, they were aware of one another they met the, sh the show is like they become friends kind of in episode nine after having very few conversations with each other but why would he let her take over him if they because, like didn't really because know the writers or trust think each that they other do have a relationship that's why because the writers think that they created a relationship because the writers have them. the audacity to think that they're even marginally prepared to write a television show mm-hmm the reason in the show is that they decide they're outnumbered and they need to get the artifact off the planet. So it's like, you take over my body and then I can operate with like 100% efficiency and just like taking everybody out. And then, you know, we That's get the away idea. with Is there any want. stated reason that they couldn't do that while he was still alive? Uh, no, not only because the show sets it up that it was the idea that Cortana was designed to be able to supplant his consciousness has nothing yeah, to do with whether true. or not he's I'm dead. Not, okay, yeah. Nothing to do with whether or not he was dead. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> if you're dead, your body doesn't work anymore. You <laughs> what the fuck? Dead means, yeah, dead <laughs> means your body cannot support the conscious yeah. state of the brain. That's what death do we assume like. you do you think, uh, for instance, you're the expert, do you, do you feel there was maybe mm. a plan for story that they scrapped? Like... Yeah, absolutely. So, so for reference, um, the season ends with 
Halsey giving a big speech about all of their brilliant ideas and their really smart themes that you wouldn't know because you played the pew pew shooty game and we're making the high art and talking about all uh you know humanity it leaps forward and all that shit and um the the episode ends the season ends on John Halo's cracked visor so I think it was very obvious that the direction they were going in is yeah maybe he saved the day but at what cost to himself look at him he's barely a man he's a shell he's a husk he's just a machine and we'll see what that looks like in season two and then they were like oh fuck that and changed their mind yeah it does it does have like fuck that energy considering that the second season basically starts with oh six months later he wakes up and then we just are doing a different thing yeah he's totally fine life goes on think about the pivot of the season ends with Cortana having supplanted John Halo's consciousness to Cortana has been taken out of John Halo and they will not reunite until episode eight. The finale of the season. It's obvious yeah. that that wasn't where they were going with the story. That's like, the, yes, that's the clearest pivot uh, in season two, which I suppose we'll talk about it a bit more length later. But I still want us to recap the more memorable moments of uh, <laughs> of the first season. John, what is the, what's the thing that you remember most about season one? Like a moment, or a, oh, a subplot. The f- the whole wedging McKee in, mm-hmm. and it f- it f- and it feeling like she's gonna be the replacement for Arbiter basically throughout the whole show. And I, I feel like they're sort of sticking to that. Well, good that she was I've only seen. a season one and... element, right? Because she died. Yeah, well, she got shot. No way they would ever. Yeah, she got shot. No. Oh yeah, yeah. was she? Yeah. Was she's very back... explicitly killed, but now she's back. Well, uh... I. Let's put it this way. If you show somebody with a ho- like bleeding out of the middle of their chest and when they fall to the ground, they've got dead eyes. I assume they're dead. Not that they're going to be up and about uh, next season. So, yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's safe to say that she was dead. And for some reason, the writers of season two thought it would be a good idea to bring her back. McKee's back in season two, guys. She's prominently. She's yeah. Prominently. They don't well, even attempt to get more than Cortana, that, do they? They don't explain it. They don't give a reason. Um, the only thing that they do with it is that she kind of can't use the artifacts so well anymore. That's it. But they don't explain why? how she's alive. I think it's because, like, oh, well, she got shot, so something happened, and now she can't do to it her anymore. Genes. I thought it was <laughs> yeah. She to her had genetics. to have a uh, connection with Johnny Boy. Johnny yes, Boy. and that and that restarted her connection with the Forerunner stuff. So that's all good. But yeah, she's back, and I agree with you, uh, John. It's like. Basically, I think it's safe to conclude that the rationale for them was you can't relate to an alien, so the the, the bad guy's got to be a human. Uh, even yeah. though if we're keeping elements of the, if we're adapting the fact that the Covenant even exists and are waging a war on humanity, it makes it a little bit odd that the central figure of their religion and the only person who can use the artifacts of their gods, and the and that it's known that the only person who can do this is uh, Mackie, that she even has a name, Blessed One. Seems yeah, this weird is known. Be going She's not a war. secret character. Yeah. Like, it, it's just, it ruins everything. It can't work. And it's stupid. Um, It's stupid, the idea that you need to have a lame human character instead of a cool alien character. Uh, either because yeah. you didn't want to do all the animation for it, or because you probably the more likely reason is they're like, "We well, can't be an alien. We can't. It can't be an alien. We can't have like an alien POV character. It's got to be a human." I do think it's a bit of that, like worrying that audiences aren't going to connect with an alien character, and also budget reasons. Like any time yeah. there's an alien on screen, like the VFX budget goes up considerably. So it's just like long term, we'd rather have a human character play that role basically you can't have a sex scene with an alien yes you can (laughs) well you can (laughs) it's um they didn't want it it's it's funny you mentioned john like the 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 budget thing because if you guys recall in season one uh there were i think three episodes it might have been three or even four episodes where you do not see a single covenant like alien you don't see an elite you don't see a like a jackal you don't see a brute you don't see any covenant at all and like i think i want to say like th- at least three episodes of, of season one maybe four a long which, um... a long time one mm-hmm. of our biggest complaints about the first season was how like they're the aliens are conspicuously not present and not mm. only are they not present, they seem to be not at all discussed by anybody to the point where we were legitimately asking if humanity was aware that they were being destroyed by an alien race or if everyone was taking like amnesia pills. And we get a similar problem in this season 
but it is mm -hmm. something that they've been consistent with at least, which is humanity yeah. doesn't really seem to care that there's a conglomeration, that this massive galactic alien confederation that wants to destroy humanity. Well, it's it's um it's a problem that's consistent in both seasons that um that the the more prominent antagonistic elements of season one and two are, hum are humans um not not the covenant uh in season one Halsey was uh, a really prominent like antagonistic character uh, as well as elements of the UNSC chain of command uh and you also had the Quan subplot uh where there was like infighting there that really didn't have anything to do with the aliens at all. And season two has created like new threads where th there's a more prominent antagonist than the Covenant. Like at least in terms of the amount of screen time that's dedicated to dealing with those plots. Um, and I think I think it does does seem to stem from this like idea that the Human Covenant War, from the perspective of the writers, isn't interesting enough uh, to justify the existence of the show. That they need to create um, intrigue and and, and like Arts. drama. And, um, uh, like and and subplots involving like breakdowns in the UNSC uh, and infighting in humanity, which is bizarre for a Halo show. Yeah, it's it's strange that ultimately the I mean, especially the books. The books are essentially military themed books. The characters are basically all members of some branch of the military. It follows the Spartans and other military characters and this massive military conflict, and it goes into a lot of the logistics and command structure elements of it. It isn't like a human drama. It is a military-themed drama at most is the furthest you can bring it. Um, and it's to the strength of what it is. It, it is a, an excellent strength of the books that you get this from a military lens, um, and that's the perspective of pretty much all the characters in it. Um, it Not is a to, uh... book about a war. It, it's a book about war. Not to throw us too off topic on that thought, because it's a bit more to do with the kind of change in Halo as a series. Something that I've definitely noticed, especially since 343 has taken over, is like kind of turning like as though Master Chief is like a superhero who did it all by himself. Um, as as though there wasn't like a massive amount of uh people and and um and like aspects of the military that were supporting him and that were there with him the whole time. Like the idea yeah, that they forget about all those Marines on the Gauss cannon in the back seat. Well, it's just um. Do you guys remember the opening cutscene for Halo Five? Do you, Do you guys remember like what that nope. cutscene was? I don't. Is, is that the one where they they far? surf down a mountain and shoot at Prometheans? Yes. Okay, oh yeah, yes. uh, I remember that. Yes, it's the basically the long and short. Oh, of it that is, one. Um, yeah, yeah, that five was Team Osiris that were the main characters of Halo Five. Um, basically, they jump out of a pelican and just like fly into this war zone and just blow past. A whole bunch of Covenant and Prometheans fighting each other like pretty effortlessly, like superheroes flying around with their jetpacks and everything. And from an animation perspective, it's a really cool cutscene. But like, I think that's really bad um, in terms of in terms of like reflecting the the change in like what's happened with uh, Spartans. Um, that it used to be that yes, Master Chief was the most powerful person in like any given situation, but that it was a massive military yeah, effort. Work like, for it a big effort involving Marines and involving ODSTs and command, uh, combined arms warfare and everything like that to this place now where it's like, well, Master Chief, he's like the one guy, the superhero who will like solve all of the problems. And that you can kind of see it reflected here that like you said, Rags, it do you don't get the impression that like the military component of the story is particularly prominent, even though so much of the story is focused on the human conflict and like the UNSC and Oni and all of the infighting there. And yet it really doesn't feel like much of a military story at all. And I think a big part of it might just be that it's, it's difficult to see the military component in like the battle situations. It's just John Halo blasting through everything single-handedly for the most yeah, part. Um, they, it's in between the, the occasional intermittent terrible fight sequence. You never get that scene where, like, here's the, here are all the, the commanders and the COs and the people in charge and the higher-ranking people, and they're in the forward operating base or on their ship, and they're looking at this big tactical display of what's happening in the battle. They're communicating with this person who tells the soldiers to do this. This person tells this ship to do that. You get no sense of tactics or strategy happening. So there's no... If you go into this show thinking it'll be like the games or books and there's going to be this, um, like this war component to it that's interesting and tactical and strategic, 
you're just going to be super disappointed because the people who made this don't have any interest in that or don't know anything about it or it's just it's not the story they want to tell or have any interest in telling Which i would again, say it's kind of an issue if you're adapting a halo i would say that you would also struggle to really care about what's going on in the storyline if you haven't read the books though and that's what makes it a bit of a paradox to watch is I who totally is this agree. show for yeah totally agree with that like the the idea that the show is made for people who don't watch Halo, if, if you didn't know anything about Halo, you would be lost on don't. the most basic, the most basic of things of like, why is the Covenant even at war with humanity? You would be absolutely lost on those basics. That is something or that like, why... became pretty obvious for me was that there's so many moments of just like, oh, I was supposed to know what that is, wasn't I? <laughs> like from <Exactly>. something else. <laughs> or like, yeah, oh, there is a... Yeah. Um... There's a non-zero amount of people in the world who will watch this show, and for whatever reason, the show will make them want to play the games, and then they'll kind of experience it in reverse order. Most people will play the games and then watch the show, but there are some people who will watch the show and then play the games, and I can't help but think what a bizarre experience that is going to be for them to go from the show to the games and see, like, mm -hmm. oh, this is completely different in basically every way. Yeah, it's got to be strange. Oh, by the way, Mola, what what is the most? What's the thing that you remember most from season one? Like, what's the thing that jumps out at you? Well, I mean, it can't not be that that wonderful meme. It pops up on meme faps every once in a while of uh, uh, Maki going to touch the uh, the artifact and the guy behind it grabbing it, like been into ashes. I remember that whole sequence being pretty hilarious. By extension, uh, uh... their um their wonderful <laughs> sex scene that was definitely needed. You know, because I was thinking about how, um, like, what is the latest the high budget sci fi person with alien sex scene that we've actually gotten? I was like, oh shit, it was uh, Rebel Moon. I think that's the closest we've gotten. There was that weird tentacle monster that the guy was having sex with. Oh, Hopefully, yes. we will get the full scene in the extended. Um, maybe we'll even get it in Rebel Moon 2 coming next week. Um, but you I know, hope so. I'll, yeah, we'll see the romance blossom. Yeah. In any case, yeah. Uh, oh, there's so many little bits. I remember. Uh, a distinct memory of him raging with the Iron Man perspective. Um, uh, oh, like, yeah. In episode blah, blah, blah. five, uh, in episode five, they have a big battle, and John Halo jumps on a banshee and flies it directly into a phantom, and it explodes with him at the <laughs> epicenter, and he's fine. Uh, and he just walks out covered in, covered in a uh, covenant blood, and he starts punching the mandibles off of an elite, and he's screaming with the Iron Man POV, and it doesn't even make sense because when they cut to what's actually happening, his head is like moving. So if he was looking at the elite, his like eyes would have to keep moving, but because they don't care, he's just staring straight ahead, screaming, which is one of many of um my because that's the thing I remember most from season one is John Halo screaming. My favorite one is when he screams, "What am I?" Yeah. After uh, touching the keystone, I love it. It's because well, so we know funny. their attitude, right? What the whole am um, I? having emotion, having a person's face doing emotion that that's that's art. art. That that's storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you're so like, uh -huh. "What am I?" Or he lunges at at Halsey in an attempt to beat her to death because uh, he's so mad. And then screaming. Um, he, can, so he's many... a, he can get in line if he wants to punch her to death, okay? He's, he's just, he's he's such an unhinged, like, that to me sticks out as the most Are you going to say loser or lunatic? I, I, well, I was like, I'm indecisive. I think Because he, <laughs> he started with the, the you started with yeah. loot, and then he just quit. And I was like, which one I... was it going to be? I think that's the main legacy of season one is the absolute destruction of Master Chief to the point that he is John Halo or Jimmy Rings or Master Chief. Jimmy you Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Jimmy Rings. It's a fun name. But that's it is like fun. John Halo it... encapsulates it excellently as part of the like the meta meme of this is John the person. This is person from game. This is game person. Yes, this is him. You recognize him, right? And it's just like this horrible facsimile, just like these bits of his armor clinging together with like bits of flesh and a skull like a big skull at the top um but i mean it's you think about like what you see in season one in terms of the creation of a central character is that they basically like created somebody who is impossible to predict to where the writers can make him do whatever they need him to do to create drama um he's on he's insane he doesn't know what his emotions are he's discovering them for the first time and that's making him crazy. So therefore, Ooh. when he makes a bunch of insane, irrational decisions that allow the plot to move forward, you can't complain because that's just who he is, a lunatic. 
If for people so, who might not such remember, a useful archetype. Uh, throughout the first season, Chief is touching the artifact and it's unearthing memories of him mm -hmm. getting kidnapped by Halsey, Halsey as a kid and yeah, being put through house. the Spartan program and, and basically tortured through the process. And he's like, I get that he's mad about that, but like, I still don't think Chief, like character from the games, even going through that experience would like go totally unhinged like that and try to punch Halsey or, you know, stomp that alien's face. Like it just it felt way too jarring. Something it made me kind of like, not like him. Like, yeah, it's I'll just too you, extreme. A bit of a a bit of a problem that the show has, and it. By the way, I I would say like who the Spartans are, particularly with their emotion suppressing pellets. It's interesting because you've got the scene playing right now. Mola has been like massively fringy. Further, you can't confused. just say that and not explain to the people what you mean by emotional suppressing uh, pellets. Okay, so basically the war in the show. <laughs> you say it so Spartan. matter of factly. <laughs> The Spartans have emotion suppressed. It's not that the Spartans are naturally stoic as a result of essentially years of training and conditioning. Um, it's not that their past experiences have actually turned them into who they are. It's that they have a pellet in their spine uh, that suppresses their memories and makes them robots. Except it kind of doesn't because um, not only is there a lot of like uh, confusing elements in season one that make it very unclear. Like what exactly does a Spartan look like without their pellet? Because they certainly show emotions in season one, but like. In season two, you've got this scene where they introduce a new Spartan scene we've never seen before called, Co uh, called Cobalt, who are aggressive, confrontational, jealous, um, snarky. Um, like, they have a whole bunch of traits, but they are um, essentially chastising Silver Team, which is the main team of Spartans that includes John Halo, because they have feelings now because they removed their pellets. It's very, very, very confusing. And it helps the writers because it makes it even harder to pin down who exactly John Halo is in season one and continuing into season two. And really, all of the Spartans, it, it creates a, um, a, a, a confusing aspect of like, who are they actually and what do they actually believe in? And it was on the point that you were talking about, John, in terms of the nature of like this aspect of his history being something that's upsetting to him. Something that in season one, they don't really want to deal with at all. And it feels like it's part of the reason why the Covenant um, storyline is in the background so frequently is that you have to pair how he's feeling about all of that with who he is now and the unique position he's in to fight in the Human Covenant War. Um, but it's not something that they pair together to explore, which is really stupid because it's just good drama. That's interesting. Like somebody mm -hmm. who's had a difficult, a really terrible thing happen to them, the consequence of which has now made them a uniquely capable person uh, to save humanity and how does that make them feel and and how much are they willing to set aside as part of that uh broader conflict but instead they're just like don't want to deal with that i suppose by the way as you know to almost like try and tie off the relevant things from season one Quan was a major part of season one guys do you remember yeah, how, uh, was huge. Storyline? she was like the prominent character of the first fucking episode she had a whole, whole episode show. with all her own uh, episode seven was a Quan mm -hmm. episode. In closing on what you were just saying, by the way, because I was just trying to remember the quote, uh, you know, Futurama, the, um, it's like, being a robot is great, but we don't have emotions, and that makes me sad. Like, the, <laughs> that, that, that would summarize their approach with the, uh, the Spartans. Definitely. Definitely. I would um, also just uh, like to add, regarding yeah. the pellets, that the removal of them was the dumbest shit like because they are yeah. performing self-surgery on themselves with a knife at the By base ear. of their spines they're being yeah. told what to do yeah master chief was told what to do verbally by cortana in his head and then he performed the surgery that he could not see on his spine and pulled the pellet out well and also he yeah, was standing up in front of a bathroom mirror naked and the instruction that cortana was giving wasn't even that specific she was just saying like 10 centimeters or something but it's like which direction you haven't you haven't told him like you, know, you need I to tell decision is it horizontal or vertical <laughs> he's got a blade in his spine you got to tell him exactly what to do otherwise like you say, risk paralysis i think nah. the funniest part of that scene is that john halo was seriously going to try and do it himself before she told him how to do it he was actually <laughs> holding the knife at his back with no idea where exactly it was because he was actually going to give it a shot without a help. Yeah. It's that kind of, you know, take charge attitude that I, that I really like about John Halo. He's just going yeah. for it. You can't be mm -hmm. indecisive. You can't have analysis paralysis. You have to perform surgery and then have actual paralysis. <laughs> yeah, you can't let someone stop you with rules about stabbing yourself in the spine. Fuck that. Red tape. Are you a man or a mouse? Yeah. 
I feel it is important to explain that Quan had a major storyline in season one because it's important for your context going into season two. She, like Rag said, she was a major POV character. She had a big subplot in Madrigal that also had some connection to the Forerunners as well. And she got a whole episode all her own where she basically like fought a bunch of uh, bad guys and won. And the very clear setup at the end of her story is, look at her go, she's going to fight for the independence of her home. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, could look, we, right, um, see, could we yeah. say she got Rose T code? Uh, yes, I think it's safe to say that she very much got, for reference, guys. Uh, Madrigal, the planet she was going to fight for the independence for, uh, was destroyed <laughs> off screen between seasons. <laughs> so funny, yeah. Not destroyed. I don't know and if it's, it's as bad as Rose Tico. No, to be Rose Tico is to be disliked so heavily by the audience that your role is reduced significantly. Okay. massively sidelined and have your own storyline cut off um it's it's so crazy it, it's it's like guys to get hit with all of these retcons and like changes and pivots in the story in like 15 minutes is stunning it's, it was like it's, yeah we were it was whiplash because the show just starts and we're like no 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 no, no. you can't do this what about i watched that first season god damn it and now you're just like acting like that doesn't matter that was my life that's right. She even said that this isn't my life while talking about the new storyline they'd given to her. It's funny. <laughs> I suppose, um, hopefully that gives everybody a general idea of the shenanigans of season one. Uh, because I think if you were to do a poll, thought, most people in chat would still have no idea what's happening. It's impossible to catch <laughs> Yeah, I'm 50-50 myself. In a short amount of time, look, all right? Don't it's, worry, we're going to get to the reset we're button We're really trying. Soon. We're doing Don't our best. <laughs> I the suppose, second um, season will start and you won't have to worry about it. Before we, like, dive headfirst into season two, I think what uh, I find interesting to talk about in oh, relation to... You just said to... feet first. Uh, why? Because of the ODSTs. Yeah, but it's headfirst because they're jumping into, like, no, a they, shallow end of the pool. First into hell. Head first. It wouldn't it be yeah, funny to be, like, their skull. as implications yeah, they, of yeah. how fucked this is, they would send their ODST into head, head first. Yeah. No <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Just no, the imagine. ODSTs would be like an, a naval unit, like a water navy unit. That's how the Halo show would handle ODSTs. Well, like that they 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 drop into the ocean and do deep sea. Ocean no, they're, just, they're just they're just aquatic <laughs> units. Ah, I thought uh, you were trying to say they would drop into the ocean, yeah. they just drown. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll get that ocean one day. <laughs> I, um, do we get any stratagems? No. No, no stratagems. The only thing that happens is that as your pod slowly sinks into the abyss and you run out of oxygen, we play Halo Season 1 and 2 nonstop as you sink into the dark. <laughs> Have fun. Um, what what I found interesting, I guess, coming into because it was two years separated between Season 1 and 2, um, and the looming thing over Season 2 was we all know that everybody hated Season 1, and you know that they hated Season 1, so what are you going to do about it? Like, did anybody here have any expectation in season two that it was actually going to like improve? More action. Well, is that um, what they would want to do? More, more action. Get more killing of Covenant. Wasn't was there like. a writer's strike between the first and second season? Well, then it should have uh, gotten better, right? The the second season was shot before the writer's strike happened. So, okay, remember yeah. season season two got greenlit before season one premiered. I think season two began shooting. Some months after season one uh, aired and wrapped up, I think about a year ago. So it was all more or less set in stone before that happened. There's also a shift in showrunners. I think initially had two showrunners, Stephen Kane and someone else. I can't remember. And then one of them left. And then the other guy left. And then yes. a, like a new guy came, o came on, David, David Weiner, I think, for season yeah, two. David I, who I He's think is a <laughs> Walking Dead guy. Oh, um, okay. That, I, I think they, they might have picked him because of like the flood introduction. I'm not sure about that though. <laughs> uh, yeah, spoilers, guys. I introduced the flood in this season. It's well, there's be zombies before. Don't the worry, flood they're not show. recognizable. Don't worry. <laughs> if they hadn't um, told us it was the flood, we would have been like, "Ooh, were, they, what's this weird thing they made up for the show?" The Covenant practically well, acted the flood until weird. then, anyway. That's Which true. Is, something that um is interesting to look at is kind of in in terms of like the approach to season two was the nature of um how in talking about it before it came out there were certain like kind of 
it's interesting to see, I guess, what you would call like the marketing strategies through the kind of quotes that are being given by like actors and 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 uh, executive producers and stuff going into the season because there was definitely much more of a look, guys. We're going to do more of the things that you like while also basically admitting that they were still making their own show. Feels like the noteworthy one is uh Pablo Shriver saying. You know, like, if you don't like Master Chief taking his helmet off, then, like, you're just not going to like, this show's not for you. Um, yeah. Which is pretty funny, right. considering what the happens in season two. It's great marketing, though. Top notch. And that was after well, yeah. a couple of weeks of them, like, trying to vigorously show off various posters of them wearing the helmets. So he well, undid to... a lot of the marketing that they had been doing. I, it's funny you say that, because they pivoted to a lot more uh, posters of him not wearing the helmet um they they had a lot more posters of him not wearing the helmet uh than wearing it for the promotion yeah, of I, season I, two. I remember and made fun of the one where he's on the pelican and not wearing his helmet but do you remember the one of him sitting on a throne i don't remember there being a throne there was <laughs> oh, okay one of him like sitting on a throne um okay let me see if i can find it i mean that kind of matches the character's ego i guess oh yeah <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't come this far in and not mention the uh, strip club scene and how the season just seems oh to be John God. Halo getting a harem. Mm. Oh, like, yeah. there's a lot of weird, weird decisions with John Halo here. Oh, of it course. is. That's that's a good way to just describe the both of these seasons. Uh, the second one. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the one I was talking about. But yeah. there is a bizarre. It, it, there's just a bunch of bizarre decisions that they made creatively for what to do with this show. Um, and then they wow. become even more bizarre when you pile on like this is supposed to be like a Halo show about Halo, those games and books. Um, it just makes it even more weird. I think the clearest uh, way to see the nature of how they wanted to market season two is you can think about in season one, the marketing uh, never had uh, Master Chief John Halo man with uh, his helmet off it was always in his full suit other characters had their helmets off but it was it was like they had an awareness that that was going to be a big deal um which is funny because they definitely they definitely failed in terms of reading what people wanted but season two all of the marketing has been full of reach it's all been full of reach full of reach full of reach you guys like reach you like halo reach you mm -hmm. like the full of reach uh, but if i like if i like the fall of reach why did i only get like three quarters of an episode about it Mm. <laughs> and I think it, it yep. is so thoroughly explained by this arrogance that like you you guys don't understand when you have the face we can the actor because you know the actor and the director right, Mahler, would probably I don't understand. discuss it regularly about how much better their decision is. They probably had scenes probably. where he does he finishes acting they say cut and it's like good god can you imagine how much we would have lost had you had your fucking silly helmet on you'd be like I know it's crazy they're gonna so realize how wrong they were. <laughs> As if yes, they uh, but they've exactly. never looked to understand the argument. They've always just been like, no, Helmet covers well, face. For those who hadn't seen it, in season two, they write in a reason why John has to be separated from the armor, which is that Oni abandoned Reach in the middle of the night and took the armor with them, but left the Spartans behind so that they could say that the Spartans died. Yeah, um, we, we will talk about that extensively, but that <laughs> point about how they tried to create a reason to remove his armor so that they could be like, look, guys, the reason why he's not wearing his helmet is not because he's choosing not to. He can't. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to talking combat. about a particular character during the events of the Fall of Reach. One guy <laughs> with his old grenade they, launcher. They really <laughs> doubled down. <laughs> An un unfortunate <laughs> victim of Black History Month. They um, really doubled down on the no helmet thing, and that really... Yeah. It came off as so arrogant, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. they were I definitely that, spiteful. I, yeah. I'm just gonna. I would say that, like, I basically believe completely that they have the attitude of we're making like our art, while you guys just want to have like your little shooter game where you shoot the aliens, and that's fine, and that's fun that you can do that. Um, but we're like we're running with um with our really like great law that we you know we're creating this really riveting story that's asking what does it mean to be a human and all that stuff um yeah because they definitely i definitely get the sense that they think they've made something better which is what i find really funny to think about because um to jump really far ahead they do go to halo uh in episode eight and i was struck while watching that of how less impactful it was with all of the visual effects that they had of this like massively detailed 
you know, Vista of Halo, that that was way less impactful than in Halo Combat Evolved, walking off of the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the escape pod dropship, looking up at Halo in all of its Xbox, uh, original Xbox glory, that that was far more impactful than the consequence of two seasons of build-up and all of the visual effects you needed to realize it exactly how you wanted it in high detail. Um, it's crazy just how much better and more valuable the games are as art than this fucking show. It's one of yeah. the things that makes me angry thinking about this show is that is is just like you had all of the resources and you created something that without Halo, nobody would care. This would never last. You wouldn't even get the second season. It'd be done. Nobody would talk about it. Nobody would remember. It'd be of no value to anybody. It's always the, felt the so Halo strange game... when there's Go a ahead. blueprint right there, you know? Like the easy yeah, yeah. And not only that, if you copied it one to one, people would be happy and you can take credit. That's just how it works. You can be like, yeah, I adapted it well. So, you know, give me praise. I mean, it is pretty uh, obvious. Oh, sorry. Go for it, John. Well, I was, I was just going to say that. I mean, if you look at just the, the Halo game cutscenes, particularly the blur remasters for the um, for Halo um, two. two yeah. And I can't remember if there's another one, but like there's more emotion in the high charity cutscene of of uh halo 2 than there has been in the entire two seasons of the show so far which is like no. a fucking joke and he never takes his helmet off and it doesn't matter because like you can tell what he's feeling because of the way it's shot like the way he kind of moves his head like it's all there you know well, that might be all they had to do is look at it annoying misconceptions that they are trying to spawn that uh, can't work is that John, like the idea that, that like John Halo is the way that you have to do it when like Master Chief is very much emotive at the moments that he needs to be throughout the games, through animation and like you said, through cinematography, through music supporting, like whatever's happening in that scene. Um, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, uh, like just uh, uh, for somebody who would say that be like just watch wally like can you watch wally and understand like how wrong you are in your right. attitude that there is like a necessary amount of aspects of a character that need to be visible um in order for them to be relatable and emotive like wally doesn't even have like a, a he doesn't have a mouth you know like he barely even has eyebrows <laughs> And it's like, look at right. how expressive that character is. And he's he is dramatically and massively more expressive than John Halo without his helmet, like, ever could even be. It doesn't <laughs> even come close. Well, what's interesting yeah. is, um, I, I had to step up for just a second. I assume you're talking about the insistence that he take his helmet off all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. But um, if you hadn't mentioned it before, I assume you did. But yeah, playing the games, both Master Chief and Cortana, because a lot of Cortana's lines come delivered as just a voice. She does not have any sort of digital manifestation that you see. She doesn't have a face. She doesn't have any, you know, any posing. It is literally just the voice. And there are many moments in the games where Cortana in particular has, you can tell exactly what she's feeling just based on the delivery of um, voice lines what she says to Marines, what she says about Marines, what she says to Chief and the situation that they're in, what they have to do. You sense the sarcasm, you sense the sadness, you sense these emotions that Cortana has when, if anything, she has even more of a restriction overall than Chief does. Because Chief is always at least being able to emote and look around and he's got like, well, emote in the sense of he has like a body that body he's language. using. And Cortana doesn't have that. And through, through the vast majority of her lines, she's just a voice in your head. And yet you can still pick up very clearly her personality. Meanwhile, so the games were able to do this with multiple characters. Think yeah. about the line delivery consistently from uh, John Halo as well when you think about the nature of voice acting. Because, like, seriously, I feel like the only way that the lines are ever delivered is, what happened to Cobalt? Why are you? It's <laughs> Oni, they're doing it. The Covenant are here. Like, it's always the same, like, gravelly delivery every single time. Oh, you've really just reminded me of him raging at the man who changes the little wooden blocks on the news update <laughs> thing. That yes. shit was so funny. It's it's the you only reason they were wooden Put blocks is so a guy could Put show up to do that for him to get yelled at. Right. <laughs> we just didn't that have it in the budget for a, a regular screen, so yeah. we had to have the wood blocks. <laughs> so, so you guys understand. 
I know, there's fucking monitors and screens everywhere else, but here they have to have like a fucking 1950s baseball (laughs) scoreboard thing where they, (laughs) like, what a fucking waste of, like, staff power. To to change the blocks, I don't know, man. uh, understand what was happening in that scene. We mentioned before, there's a new Spartan team called Cobalt, and they get sent on a mission that John Halo believes is suspicious for crazy reasons that we'll talk about later. And he's just standing in a room talking to his fellow Spartan Kai, and there's just this intern changing like a Is that placard two? on episode two. It's like right before the intro. I will um, try he's and just find changing it. a little placard that says Cobalt is on standby. And John Halo is like, Wait, what? Why'd you change it? What happened? Cobalt and are on standby. What happened to Cobalt? <laughs> and the dude's just like, I just, I changed the board. They tell me to change it, then I change it. <laughs> I don't I'm just doing stations. my job, I'm, sir. I'm not the general. <laughs> I'm just the guy who changes the blacks. And then this is my contribution to the world war effort. He jumps out of the room after demanding that he change it back to go yell at uh, Ackerson, who's this new character that in the first episode, he grabbed his arm when he was trying to leave. So that, like, because again, John Halo is a nice unhinged guy. That's not even the most unhinged thing he does this season in terms of just general demeanor. There's one, there's one instance where he just like stalks a woman to her apartment to confront her. <laughs> like, it's crazy. It's a crazy Dude, what strikes guy, me about right? the the guy changing the ball. It, it is like a janitor clearing out a locker, and then he's like, "This person's not dead. Why are you doing that?" And the janitor's like. Yeah, I, was, I don't know what's going on. I, I, was, I was told to... Why are you... The guy's fucking face. It's such a funny scene, but it's totally not intended that way at all. It's meant to be a dramatic no, scene. A lot it's of the scenes. Be, oh my god, what happened to Cobalt? Oh my goodness. By the way, the answers as to what happened to Cobalt are so insane that I don't even think the writers could explain it to us coherently. <laughs> um, the, the answers are to... as insane as Master Chief looks throughout this season. The last uh, thing I'd like to touch on before we just dive straight into the plot is um, it feels like in the time since Season 1 uh, came out that the video game adaptation landscape has uh, really like changed a lot. Um, there's been uh, like a lot more adaptations have been coming. I mean, Fallout just came out. Um, but also that there's been like massive success for a lot of them as well. The Last of Us was incredibly successful for HBO. Uh, Mario was one of the most successful films uh, of the the year. Like I think Sonic Two came out and was really successful as well. Um, yep. And that there's generally been like a clear shift that we've entered into. I'd say we've entered into an era where, at the very least, video game adaptations are gonna look like uh, the game. Um, and in better instances, they'll try to actually like capture the spirit of uh of the game in in a more like apparent sense or just do like direct adaptation uh, or you get stuff like arcane where it's like you've you've created something that you know if you just looked at league of legends it's like hard to tell that they would be belonging to the same thing but at the same time there's a lot of like references and nods and it's clearly from a place of love and then halo season two comes along and it's just mm-hmm. like kind of fascinating to think about it being like kind of a relic of a time when uh Th- these adaptations were particularly embarrassed like to be adapted video games. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. this this adaptation, more than honestly many adaptations, feels like it's just like spite driven against the the thing it's adapting. Like you get the feeling of the people who made this, who wrote this in particular, actually really dislike Halo, and maybe even the people who like Halo. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, it's such and... a it's such a waste because the idea of like a, a super soldier in armor with an AI who's like a uh, a woman who like ha- banter's with him, but who is also like this super sophisticated AI is such a brilliant concept, and uh, I mean it definitely worked for the games. But here, yeah, it's the like... the stoic man uh, and the you know the charismatic woman as a pair. You know the. The, going the on duo a, in a, working in an alien war that gets massively yeah. turned on its head by the discovery of an ancient alien construct that houses an ancient evil uh, that is unleashed and throws everything into it's it's Halo Combat Evolved is an awesome game. It has a great campaign and like down to its core, it's a really cool premise. Um, yeah, that if you watch the show, you would be pretty lost on like seeing how be, it could be connected, yeah. other than most surface level stuff possible, basically. It was like the people who watch the show and then want to get into the games to check them out. Mm-hmm. Halo Combat Evolved is going to like shock them. They'll be like, "What? This is what it was?" And like, yeah, oh, yeah, totally different, completely different. 
<laughs> well, I think that's probably enough uh, preamble. I think the the first plot point that has to be talked about is the most prominent part of the marketing, yet, as I think Patricia mentioned earlier, is uh, startlingly short in terms of the amount of time that it actually lasts for, which is the fall of Reach. Um, that was like a huge part of the marketing. And um, in a sense, you could describe it as being the main plot of the first four episodes, but the fall of Reach itself takes place over the course of one episode of runtime. Like yeah, it's, it's all condensed four, into one shitty Reach. episode, yeah. And, and, and the, yeah. John Halo sleeps through like half of it too. It does. Uh, that's right. In episode five, they are leaving Reach basically after the first 10 minutes. And it's over. Reach has fallen. It's done. <laughs> um, to remind everybody, an entire uh, video game was made dedicated to Reach, and it was called Halo Reach. Uh, and it was uh, Halo uh, Three Reach. It was nice. Halo Three Reach <laughs> Revengeance. That's the one. Uh, and Awakening. It was many <laughs> hours of diversely seeing the different parts of Reach that were getting destroyed, not just this one city that. Do they ever say the name of this city? Reach City. It's Reach City. It is called show, Reach City. Is... I am not memeing. I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not it's, it's, it. it's the street of Reach and the town of Reach and the city of Reach. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the Reach Bridge. It's the place they call the planet Reach. He I'm on Reach Street. Reach I need house. backup. <laughs> Reach Street? Which one's that? Oh, shit. <laughs> I, I'm I'll not send joking, up a flare like, like last I'm... time. I want to emphasize, Chad, I'm not memeing. I'm not being sarcastic. It is called Reach City. That's we what it's called. Have, um, <sighs> do we have an Earth City here? Is there a place called Earth City? Maybe they would make one really far into the future when we've got, like, alien intergalactic relations or something. They would have, like, a designated what? Earth City or something. Oh, but... like Chinatown? In yeah, the maybe. Friend, maybe. Maybe, but, you know, obviously that there's nothing cool. like that in this. Reach has absolutely no world building to the point where no you don't character. even know how important it is. You don't really know what the fuck's even going on or where. How much of a significant loss for the, the human side it is to lose Reach. You don't there know. Is an Earth City. It's in St. Louis. Uh -huh. Oh, it would oh. be. Oh my god. <laughs> No, it's fine. Uh, they're fine people. Um, One of the things as well is that in the first mission of Halo Reach, you instantly, you have, like, uh, George has to, like, be the interpreter for them in the group. Because Reach is, like, it's another planet of humans. It has m ethnic diversity in different cultures. It's not just one. Yeah. It's not just space. It's just not, it's not just space land. There's they have, actually, uh, like, cultures there. They have, like, uh, Hungarians there, isn't it? I think that's the, that I forget one family that George talks to. Yeah, I, it's been a while. I forget the specifics, but you go when you go from there to the more like that rural era, area that they were in, and then you go into the city and you see like the you see all the you know more city uh, style stuff. You know the vending well, the machines with Moa burgers on. and stuff. The variety architecture is different. Yeah, uh, like biomes as well because Reach is a planet. It's so a it planet. A yes, the point it's not a Star that, Wars like, planet. It's a planet planet. <laughs> it has Reach. many different biomes halo reach depicts a broad military campaign spanning i want to say i think it's about two months in terms of like the total amount of time that passes going to a variety of different locations on like a big battle that's constantly changing and evolving and um and and the stakes are like going up and down and and uh at, well no the stakes are high all the time but rather like the dynamics of the battle are constantly changing and then you compare that to the fall of reaches depicted in the show, where it's like one episode of one battle in one city, and then it's over. It's done. Reach well, yeah, fallen. that was Reach City. Yes, part of the right. part of the battle of Reach is John Halo hanging out in like an antique shop so that they can show off all their. Like, oh my God, you're right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> their twentieth century ultra, items. Uh, oh, um, they had a little Xbox there, which uh, when we mm. were watching it was particularly like that's just like annoying. Um, the idea that you would have like an original Xbox in there, like, look, we're having fun. It's like a game that you remember, and you're like, "Fuck you!" No one remembers this game. No like, one remembers this like, game. No one's played this game. Oh, it's, well, like, it's like someone punching like, you over and over again, and then they hand you a chocolate bar. You're like, I, "What are you doing?" You like chocolate, don't you? You're like, are you mocking me? Yeah. Well, yeah, because that that's emphasized as well is that um, even though the Fall of Reach has an episode dedicated to it, there are like significant portions of time that are dedicated to weird non sequiturs. I'm not even talking, because one of the things I really enjoy about, my favorite moments in Reach are generally the quiet moments, 
like uh the scene where noble six is sitting in the uh the the falcon wait yeah the falcon the it's yeah hornets were in hell the falcon that's is right it's falcon in reach yeah new alexandria as the city's burning in the background like at nighttime as he's about to like link back up uh, and talk to carter and then go on his mission just silently looking over the destruction of this city, but like still heading into the battle anyway to try and save as many people as he can. It's like a particularly powerful moment or um, after Cat dies and they step out into the ruins of uh, New Alexandria after it's been glassed or, uh, you know, like the the ending of the game of him standing uh, at, the, uh, at the shipyard as all of the Covenant are about to close in on him. Like a lot of the quiet moments in the midst of this massive military campaign are particularly memorable. But the quiet yeah. moments in episode the four... The music serves it well, was, uh, too. Oh, a lot absolutely. of good music. I love the soundtrack. Um, well, the soundtrack mm -hmm. in the show is really lame, by the way. But, I, uh, I forgot is... this plot point <laughs> that the Reach people didn't know they were being invaded, yeah. and the Reach characters Reach. are like trying <laughs> yeah. to tell them that there's an invasion going on. And John <laughs> Halo... <laughs> the Covenant are known for their subtlety. <laughs> That, I, I guess uh, to, to, the, 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 the idea with all of that being that um, there are quiet moments in this episode, but they're like weird. The like, weird um, distraction, yeah. waste timing. Yeah, things. Where um, they're standing on like a bridge ready to, and they, by the way, they call it like that they're doing Thermopylae because the riders are really clever. They're Spartans, so it's like Thermopylae, you get it? Um, they're like standing on a bridge and they're about to fight a bunch of elites that are like charging down there and, and there's all this gunfire and it just hard cuts to... He's Halsey and Soren standing in an elevator, having like a little awkward conversation with each other. It's insane. <laughs> I, I don't understand like the rationale behind these weird cuts. Um, yeah. Uh, you, oh, oh, oh was... this one take. You got to talk about this one that you've shown on screen. I saw someone in chat mention is like so. Any reference to Noble Team is like, um, no. be thankful I'm that there isn't. God no. There's yeah, yeah. references to places from Halo Reach, uh, Visegrad Station and Sword Base, but that's about it. Oh uh, yeah, Sword Base was just a narrow, dark, concrete hallway. <laughs> that's because that's because they apparently it was a shitty, start slimy the concrete. Yeah, box. In this setting, they didn't start the Spartan Three program until after the fall of Reach. That's well, the TV it, show lore. Bear in mind, Patricia, is so worse than that. The Spartan Three program hinges on the necessary destruction of Reach and the Spartan Twos. As orchestrated mm -hmm. by Oni. So there can't be yeah. a noble team because the Spartan threes don't exist in this show's continuity yet. <laughs> I feel like I, I just, just threw that out there. Yeah. Everybody would be like, wait, what do you mean? Like they deliberately necessarily sabotage the defensive well, reach. It's just like any yeah, that's you know, it happens in You're militaries, obviously... you have to make sacrifices. Get rid of mm -hmm. reach and you can get some Spartan threes or something. That makes sense. You well, need yeah, to take your medicine. What are you talking about? This is the, madness. The... The briefest way to summarize it so that everybody has a general understanding of what's happening is John Halo concludes after the big battle he has in episode one on this planet called Sanctuary that the modus operandi of the Covenant is go to a place, take down a comms relay, invade, uh, and that they, they were doing practice to prepare for Reach. And then there's a big subplot about Cobalt Team having gone missing on some mission. The logistics of it don't make any sense at all, but long story short is they got killed by the Covenant Oni now knows that the Covenant is on reach. Oni are now prominent players in this season. And they basically conclude that they have a plan in place. And their plan is to abandon reach, not tell any of the civilians that reach is about to be invaded, not tell huge portions of the UNSC that they're about to be invaded, to take some of their assets off world, including the Spartan armor, so that... But not reach the Spartans. Fall, not the Spartans, because that is part of their plan, is that reach will fall... Uh, John Halo and the Spartans will all die so that they can recruit people into the Spartan 3 program for a Hail Mary throw thousands of people uh, at the problem mission of just throwing these under-trained, under-equipped Spartan 3s that are basically worse than ODSTs on a Hail Mary mission to destroy the Covenant and find Halo. That's They're the worse plan. than the guy you bumped into on the street earlier today. Whoever that was, these guys are worse than that guy. They <laughs> suck. Like it's 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 to say that they abandoned Reach <laughs> is actually putting it lightly. They were yeah. actively sort of aiming for its total destruction. Yeah, they planned plan. for it to yeah. be destroyed. <laughs> Rags on that note. Reach Reach was an inside job. If they hired that random guy off the Billy. street, and the random guy off the street said, "Okay, first things first, I guess I'll play the game," and they all look at him like, "The fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? This guy is crazy." You, you okay, bud? And he's like, "Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that." It. 
it is truly unhinged, like the way that the fall of reach, like the idea that essentially a huge part of why it happened is because the UNSC and Oni looked at reach and were like, yeah, this is acceptable loss. Uh, we can, we can, we can deal with, it. not only can we accept losing this, but it's going to be beneficial for us creating the Spartan 3 program that not only do we lose Reach and all of the civilians and much of the military that we've left behind on there, but also necessarily the Spartans, uh, who up until this point have widely been regarded as the most valuable asset that the UNSC has. Oh, and another aspect of their plan as well is leaving Cortana behind so that she can be captured by the Covenant, so that she can relay information to the UNSC so that they can find Halo. The only reason that that's able to happen is because she builds enough trust with McKee to be able to leverage a Covenant ship's mm -hmm. communication abilities to communicate with them on Onyx. And she finds the location of Halo because when Mackie touches the Keystone, it transports her consciousness to Halo with John Halo and she is able to use her being there to triangulate Halo's position in the stars so that they can find it. Fringy, well, wake up. This, this wake up, Fringy. The... Fringy, wake up. This was yeah. after the miracle of Maki convincing the Arbiter to not continue flying to high charity. So Cortana was yeah. almost at the just captured, basically. Uh, yeah, now, absolutely. We can, we can get into the 1768 issues <laughs> that arise as a result of that plan. For instance, you might think, well, if you're familiar with the source material, I not you were that gonna that say reality. Anything, but if you're familiar with the, the laws of logic <laughs> and human reason, then you might think, wait, I thought that having an AI fall into the hands of the Covenant is like, basically, we lose the war, right? Because then mm -hmm. they'll find out the location of Earth and all of our planets, our assets, things of that nature. So the idea of us engineering specifically the idea that this one hyper-advanced, super-smart AI is basically given over to the enemy, that that's obviously profoundly retarded. That's that's biblically accurate retardation. There's no way that we would do that, right? Well, you, you'd be did. wrong, of course. Um, oh. You might also think, well, this is this is an alien civilization that, in terms of technology, is way ahead of our own. So the 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 sheer hubris that you must have to think that, oh no 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 no, we'll give them a piece of our technology. They won't figure it out. They don't know how it works. We'll we'll out technologicalize. The, uh, the this is hyper advanced alien civilization that's trying to destroy us, right? The the element of the flaw of any plan is that you assume you know more than your enemy does. It's like, man, you are putting a lot of eggs into this ridiculously misshapen basket. But that'll help them get to get to Halo that they know is going to be Halo. I've heard that reason. word. I, I I feel on that in terms of like fighting Halo, it's what this is a good example of not only the writers like ignoring what came before, but like the writers actually forgetting major plot points from the first season. Um, something that happens in season one is that uh, John Halo he holds onto the Keystone, and he does a big flump face, and uh, he and Mackie get transported, like their consciousness gets projected to Halo. That's the way that they describe it in season two is that their consciousness is projected there. Um, and so they're standing, you know, on a projection Why? of Halo looking around, uh, but, <laughs> but like that as a piece of information doesn't help them. Uh, and in their view, they need the two keystones together. Uh, there's like a smaller one and a bigger one. Um, and at this point, the Covenant has one and humanity has one. But if you bring those two together, it will reveal a map of Halo, like to where, how you can find it, among other things. That's how you're going to find Halo with the map. But in season so, two, Cortana says, well, no, if you get transported there, your consciousness, I can figure it out by looking at the stars. And it's like, well, wait a minute. In season <laughs> one, you were in Master John Halo's brain when he got projected there. So you know where Halo is because you got projected there. Or like at the very least, the information will be as uh, translatable to you because you were in his brain and you're not in Mackie's brain, which raises a question of how could you figure out where Halo was in Mackie, whose brain you're not in? Uh, was transported to Halo. You would have no information. So it's like a twofold problem. They've forgotten that this actually breaks season one. It means that they had already found the location of Halo and should already be on their way there. But at the same time, she can't get that information now. I think if the writers were in this call, they would be like, what are you talking about? Like, what, yeah, what's Halo? Events? <laughs> like, I don't follow. Like, Maki? Who is that? What is Halo? <laughs> no, I, I seriously, I don't think they realize what they've done. They've, they've like created a massive no. breach in the first season, while the logic that is presented in the second season doesn't even make any sense on its face. Um, it's insane, but, but it's necessary. Without this information, they don't get to Halo. 
which means that the, the basically the final episodes of season two and all of season three, if it ever happens, uh, can't. Like, it, it relies on insane uh, plot holes, just outright plot holes completely to the core. So, correct that... me if, my, if I'm wrong, like, the actual main plan of the Indian lady is not to actually get the halos to use her little spike to it's, so get everybody uh... all grouped together and then, you know, get everybody kind of <sighs> blown up. They don't care about the halo, or she doesn't care about the halo. She just cares about blowing everybody up. It's um, I think the way they're presenting it is, ah, uh, she's she's like using military tactics. She has a contingency plan, and the 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 idea is the winter if contingency. John, if John Halo <laughs> can get to Halo, then that's cool. But if he can't, or anything else goes wrong, that she has a contingency. Which to help people understand when we're talking about Spartan threes. Basically, the plan that Oni has for the Spartan threes, the thing that they were willing to hedge reach. Not well, just allow Reach and all of the Spartans, the original Spartans, to die for. Uh, was that she would just throw Spartan threes at a big Covenant fleet in like World War One wave tactics, throw them on, hope that they can get aboard a Covenant ship, hope that they can fight their way to the bridge of a Covenant ship, and plant a weapon on the bridge that will create like a massive explosion that will wipe out everything within that solar system. Covenant ships are very plan powerful. Was also, to maybe you know, hopefully get to the Halo with John, who was intended to die. And in why would original plan? Because they are, yeah. Because in this show, they are convinced that Halo is a weapon that they could use against yes. the Covenant, they and they think this because nothing. No one. There is nothing uh, to conclude uh, this. There's actually no references. I like there are none. The only references in the video games that we are adapting very unfaithfully. We Halo eventually weapon, discover we that. Find that out. Yeah. yeah. And remember, so they in, don't have any the... reason to believe they can even get to the Halo without the person that they intentionally try to kill. Mm -hmm. They take something from the game that you don't even start knowing that has to be discovered by Cortana. Essentially. How do they discover it in the game? Did Cortana yeah, find it out from Gilchrist? She, 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 she learned it from being in the assault on the control room while John had his flood adventure for two levels. Or, no, no, no. Uh, what what, it, what it intercepted that, um, covenant communications in, talking about in it? Truth, in Truth and Reconciliation, uh, she finds out like through covenant communications that they believe that it's very powerful. It and from that starts like, the great journey, right? And that, that has yeah. to, I think we just assume this has to be bad. We have to stop them. Well, well, what it is is that um, they they do conclude that it's a weapon, but they conclude it's a weapon that can be used against the Covenant, that it can be used, like, discriminately. And then when Cortana gets put into the control room, then it's like, okay, Flood, Flood, you gotta Flood, deal with that right now. Yeah, and then I'll deal they with find you. out that it's a weapon that kills not the Flood, but it, and, and, you know, uh, Master Chief's conclusion that it's a weapon that can help them is fueled by Guilty Spark basically saying... Yeah, we can use we can use Halo to like stop the flood, uh, and it's like okay, cool. And then they find out, oh, kills sentient life. Ah, uh, hmm, okay, that's not good. Um, but but you know, you talk about the nature of like pulling things from adaptations, but like changing everything to make it weird. Bear in mind, what is the twist of Halo? It's like, well, you could point to a few things. Uh, the flood is obviously a pretty big twist, but I think the bigger twist is that Halo is a weapon that you can't use. Um, it's, it's, the mission is called Gun Pointed at the Head of the Universe. It's like, Halo is a weapon, but its use entails your destruction. It means that Halo is really bad as, like, a thing that exists in the world. It's just this, like, continual potential danger, uh, and it's something that continues to be a problem throughout all of the games, and it's, like, a really cool Chekhov's gun that finally in Halo 3 is like the one time that it can actually be used in a way that's going to that's gonna be beneficial. Um, it's really bad, and that's like a cool idea as a twist. But in the show, throughout season one and two, they've built up a lot of like, almost like mystical <laughs> space magic, like fanfare for the idea that Don't it's say a magic for you. We'll have to start talking about fucking magic, <laughs> okay? Uh, the, the magic that's going on screen right now, if we want to space out the stupid, we should mention the blind I am very ready to talk about that, using, yes. <laughs> using the grenade launcher to kill a wraith. Well, uh, just to uh, uh, quickly wrap up this thought before we can talk about blind yeah, man, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the point would be that um, in the show, you would be left to conclude that there's like a grand prophecy that's leading uh, John Halo to go to Halo. And it's like, well, think about it if they actually adapt that Halo is a weapon that kills uh, sentient life. It's like, okay, so we get to conclude that the Forerunners 
deliberately created a set of events that would lead to John Halo coming to Halo 2, use a weapon that would kill himself Halo 2. and everybody doesn't doesn't make sense does it it's like that's doesn't follow that's really weird um that doesn't seem to comport with the established lore at all and well like, this wow, reminds that... me actually of a yeah. patrician uh line um from i believe it was your skyrim part is it part one i think you were talking about the college of winterhold yes and you were saying that um you had a side about a good writing doesn't entail you just claiming that a group or civilization is smart. That's not enough. You have to actually show them doing smart things to convince me that they're a smart faction. Yes. And this show does not do a good job at convincing me that really anyone's smart anywhere in the universe. It's basically like Star Wars, the, the Star Wars we were, galaxy where everyone's a moron. We were rooting for Team Flood in this. Ooh, I was rooting yeah. for Team Flood. <laughs> yes. By the yeah. end of the show, we were unironically Team Flood. Why? I was yeah. Team Halo. Turn it on. Activate it. Wipe the galaxy. Let evolution give us another try. We'll see what happens. At, re-roll the dice on it. At least until they pulled there, the flood is female with Quan in the season flood three. Is female. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about Blind Man and his grenade launcher? Well, yeah. So, like, in the previous There's episode, a... I forget when he's introduced, but it's just a blind guy who, I guess, got injured in some previous... Spartan, yeah. yeah. Spartan program. And, um... Because of the organ. And so he, like, he just helps out in the armory, I think, and, uh... Yeah, we, we, they go, they go and have dinner with him and his <laughs> husband, and... It's it's it's, it's not a that, short well because it's it's had, like with shows was it like... the husband that had the magic healing powers? Yes. Okay, the so they introduced they the, magic. the yeah the super magic chiropractor or whatever. Yeah, he, he he like magically touches her back and she like comes to some realization. It's really funny. It's, I, I don't know how best it, to describe it to make sure everyone understands it, how funny it is. Uh, it is actually sold as if it's mysticism. Yeah, no, there is magic in this show. Like, yeah, well, we oh. see it in season one. There were desert mystics in a uh, in a uh, madrigal who like turned fire into water and and sent Quan on a spirit journey. So there is definitely magic in the Halo world, which is very weird. And it is very the, weird. There's two magic users, and they're in a relationship with each other. And the other one has a, uh, I I guess ultra hearing or something. He can, he can use a gun even though he's blind. Th this he's this like image. I got it on repeat. This is pretty much capturing how fucking... This isn't even the only instance. It's just a good example. He is blind. This is a blind man. <laughs> he can't see. He cannot see. That is a grenade launcher it's... that he's holding. That's and the he funniest is shit, man. And fighting Covenant. He that just, like, so hears them funny. and shoots the grenade you... at them and they blow up. It's the most dangerous weapon you could give a blind person. It is, it's done for the sole <laughs> specific sort of thing of, like, you know what? Everyone's doing their part. And this is courageous. This is... It was good on him. He, they even give him a huge sacrificial death. Doing. Huh? The part he's doing is friendly fire. Well, that's, that's the that's the doing. thing. It is so hilarious because that is the stupidest fucking thing you could ever do in the middle of a war <laughs> is give your blind compatriot a fucking grenade well, launcher. And to emphasize, the way they handled this in the war was that those who failed the uh, augmentation process in the Spartan program were still highly valuable and used as like military commanders and strategic minds. They they weren't just yeah like logistics and all the stuff that wins wars. Well, yeah, because this guy's he's basically just a personal trainer. That's like what he is. Um, yeah, so like even if he was blind, they would still find a use for him in the UNSC. Like, nah, well, someone in chat just, just pointed out. Look at her Disney face. It's like oh my god, true. Look at her. She's like oh, isn't he cute? Yeah. Look at him go, the little blind man. <laughs> With his... You like, what the show, fuck? You Reach, the, uh, Reach is getting God. obliterated. Your <laughs> lolly at your blind friend with the grenade launcher. You gotta, uh, you gotta show. The He's a pretty good shot for a blind guy, isn't he? You, you gotta show him blowing up the three elites. Yeah, it's okay, so that'll be the. Awful. Come on, you gotta. Some great visual effects, as you can see in the fall of Reach. Really good compositing. Really great animation. Uh, it's it's really impressive, actually. Most from a technical standpoint. There's the one shot where they forgot to add uh, muzzle flares on the guns. Oh, so it's the bit, muzzle yeah, it's just yeah, the, the light ups on the barrel. PNG. There are some where it's just like <laughs> a simple PNG image of a muzzle flash. It's unbelievable how bad it looks at times. Um, and I mean, I didn't talk about it before, but th there was a one take at the beginning of this episode where like John Halo does hand to hand with an elite, and there were like some shockingly bad transitions. There's like one shot 
where I think it actually transitions like between visual effects vendors. Sorry to pause you. Because it's like a <laughs> slightly the, different model. Just let yeah, chat appreciate this. The, he is blind. This is insane. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and it's one of the few times where the elites are actually using their guns. That's interesting. Yeah, most of the oh, time this will show them. At... <laughs> imagine, imagine, the uh, learn their lesson. imagine the cover was just a bit higher than he thought, and it just hit the top of it. They all blow up. And he's like, "Oh fuck!" Well, sorry guys, I guess we're all dead. <laughs> well, it's, and the um... shrapnel coming off it, anyways, is coming back at him. So. Yeah. All right, and you got to show what is his demise. So what happens is, yes. his uh, his husband is in the battle with him, and he gets killed. And uh, when he finds out that he's died, um, Blind Man grabs some, like, the grenades off of his belt and just slowly walks towards a wraith and blows it up. It's awful. The wraith doesn't have a, a self-preservation, I guess. No, no, uh, it's kind of uh, like gun. the rest no, of the Covenant. Uh, They're just gunner. dumb zombies. They don't have yeah, the turret no, gunner no, no. to dissuade boarding. And none of the people. But the thing is, you see plasma or reverse gear. If of, imagine if one of those hit him before he got up to it. Look at him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that joy. that wraith is some distance away, and he's just kind of waddling his way just, over there, yeah. like taking his time. This image is so fucking offensive. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's so stupid. It's like, no, haven't you seen stories? This is this is the courage moment. This he is like standing be, up to. You know what like, he uh, should be doing? If if this was a good scene, he would be like their radio operator or something, like something that he could contribute. Yeah. Yeah. No, no yeah, this uh, is the stupid kind yeah, of like radio trying to. Yeah, good because he's used to. Yeah, it's 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 so dumb to give him a grenade launcher. It's so funny because you know the conversations on set were like, isn't that wonderful that you know you can overcome any kind of restriction, any kind of disability that life puts on you, you can overcome it. There's nothing stopping you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, this is the the Doctor Who thing where you gave a person in a wheelchair a rocket launcher. That shit is so fucking funny. What are you doing? <laughs> it's a combat just, wheelchair has stats. Combat wheelchair. Really... Yeah. It has, it's actually really pretty good. Even if you have legs, you should use the combat wheelchair. On, yeah, the combat wheelchair things. is actually overpowered. <laughs> Being disabled, yeah, having a disability is typically like not good. Like it's a depowering. You can use it to but... knock people down pretty easily and like traverse gaps and stuff because it can levitate across gaps. It's oh, really yeah, powerful. Well, you really have the, um, if you read about like it. Oracle or Professor X, just these characters that are universally considered awesome in all these different IPs. And nowadays, it's like, nah, I gotta give anybody without legs a rocket launcher. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. Gonna make it. What the fuck are you doing? I'm the blind guy using Listen, the this. Launcher. The people who made this show, they have a problem getting people who can see to watch this show. All mm -hmm. right. <laughs> uh, dude, look, look at how bad the compositing is in all these shots. It, it mm -hmm. looks so fake. It looks so, so, well. Bad. Talking about like the compositing and how the show looks and everything, we'll just say it again. This show should have been animated. If you are yes. going to make a TV show about Halo, it needs to be animated so that you can have... animate all of the sci-fi alien battle stuff. It needs to be animated. Half the shots make the background look so blurry that it was actually hard to look at. Yeah, it's because we noticed that in, like, the, yeah. in no, Halsey's prison. Yep. But yes. Well, uh... I actually. The Can blind you, uh, gay man is now be, dead. I'm so sorry, everybody. It'll be in the same episode. You want to show the uh, the one take fight at the beginning of the episode sure. in the uh, under under city? It looks so bad. Um, and it's it, by the way, this is the scene that was being talked about earlier, where there's a character called Perez who the actress like is distinctly better than most of the people in the show. She's like actually quite expressive and emotive. Um, yeah, she should have been Master John Chief. Halo, which yeah. is not good for him. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, so she's trying to warn people after her family had just been, like, killed by an explosion that they need to run away, and John Halo's like, nah, we gotta go, don't let him know. And then he just fights, about, which is really good for him as a hero, and he just fights this, look at how bad this looks. Look at how Because they don't frame it like he's making a really tough decision, like, I know you want to tell them, but, like, there's nothing we can do for him, we have to go, we have to get yeah. to the forward operating base we have to get to this whatever location like he like a switch is flicked on and he goes into like battle mode this is what we have to do if we want to have a chance at winning or surviving look at how bad these shots are look at how terrible the transition is look at how fake the elite looks in this fight looks awful i can't believe that well, it's a good point about making it an animated show because like i mean if you're gonna do a halo show right half of it would be animated anyway like to do the whole yeah. alien side of it and then mm -hmm. when whenever you have the spartans in full armor they tend to animate all that anyway, anyway yeah. as well because it's like uh it's like the new spider-man marvel movies where like anytime he's in the full suit 
usually it's like CGI. You can tell it's CGI. It's all a little bit bouncy and stuff. And yeah, um, it is a great deal is lost when you know that you have to spend a lot of money on the alien half of the story, which I mean, let's be frank. Starting in Halo 2, the Arbiter's perspective and the alien side of the story is really big and it's prominent and you can't have like the Halo story without it. The idea yeah. of essentially having that entire segment of the Halo story be super gimped because of time and money constraints is a bizarre limitation that you should just not accept. It is something that well, gives Halo such incredible flavor and uniqueness is that the Covenant side and the Arbiter's journey and story and how he meets with Master Chief. It's like, it's just a central component. It's almost as necessary, I would feel, as Master Chief and Cortana's relationship is the whole Covenant Civil War Arbiter involvement. It is, there, there's a reason why it was such a huge element and a ballsy move, quite frankly, for them to do that in Halo 2. And thank God they did. I would add mm -hmm. on in terms of the benefits of animation is you would completely avoid any of the bullshit about taking his helmet off if it was an animated show. Nobody would right. complain about it. it. There would be no motivation to do it. Everybody would just accept Master Chief being in every scene in his full body yeah. armor. Just and find a voice actor point, yeah. who's like 6'5 and doesn't mind that you don't get to see his face. No, if it was animated, you could just have probably the voice actor. Wait, I was about to say, you like wouldn't even need to have the body and the voice be the same person, right? I I would just like down. to see yeah. yeah like Darth Vader the multiplayer for example. announcer could have a cameo it would be great <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun wouldn't it yeah but uh, so why wouldn't you just make it a movie it, it, yeah I mean as soon as you bring in real actors you have to deal with their like ego because like mm -hmm. you, people take on a role they want to be seen right it's just like yep. well, I, I I don't want to have a helmet on the whole time. I want people to see well, me um, act. You know, a lot of actors are like well, that. Any I don't really blame inner, them to be honest. I was going to say to like, balance that out a little bit. Yeah. They are every decision they make is for their career, for somewhat right. So they like, I'm not going to spend mm -hmm. my time on this unless it can boost my own sort of role in life. Unless, of course, there's someone like Carl but, Urban who was invested in like Dread as a uh, an IP. And at least I assume he was. I haven't actually looked into like him saying exactly why he kept the helmet on for the whole thing, but I assume it's tied to that. Which is wonderful, and the irony of that is, I think that boosted uh, Carl Urban's profile somewhat. At least people in general that I speak to in these sort of circuits have a lot of respect for him for that, as opposed to, if... you know, I saw Stallone mostly throughout his performances. Dread, and by by gum, what a good actor he is! <laughs> because oh boy. of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> why would you Why would you read the script for this show though and want your face attached to it? I don't know. Uh, you well, prefer to wear the helmet uh, the entire time and just collect it. the paycheck. On its face, it's a really good opportunity. Um, I would say, like, oh, you get to be the lead in like a hundred million dollar, like, flagship uh, television series uh, adapting what you know was a popular video game series. Uh, right. And, it's and they're looking at the IP, work. right? It's, yeah. Well, it's like Halo. It's yeah, though, sure. But, Script um, to shit. Whatever. I get to be part of Halo, the Halo TV think, show. Right? Master well, Chief is one of the top out, twenty most iconic video game characters <laughs> of all time. So right, even exactly. the actors know all about him. Pop Pablo Schrader really got sure. to play the seventh most popular character. Do you know Ooh, the uh, number twenty one in that eight, list was sorry. Blind Gay Grenade Launcher? He was in there. He's iconic. Blind Gay Grenade <laughs> he is Launcher. Iconic. Yeah. <laughs> he is iconic. He is certainly <laughs> iconic. Gay Nade Launcher. Sure, uh, <laughs> even I even if he can't say it. I think uh, Pablo Shrivo actually said that he didn't play the games before he got cost. I'm pretty sure mm. he said that. I'm sure I he does that thing of, like, that. I didn't want it to inform my performance. I wanted it to be my own thing. Oh, so they yeah. always end up saying well, that. Well, it's weird, though, because now well, they've had succeeded. to be more of a pivot. Of, there'll be things that fans will like. Fans will like aspects of the lore, yeah. Fans will, fans will enjoy it. Uh, that's funny to me, because it's so not true. <laughs> I don't even oh, know yeah, if you like Halo, about. you will despise this show. The more you love and are familiar with well, Halo, the more this show should tick, you know, tick you off. Some of the topic that can come up, especially now, is uh, something that struck me was how much um, the opposition was so zombie-like. We kind of referenced this a little bit earlier. Yeah. But there's no tactics, there's no uh, yeah, style or warfare. yeah, combat strategy. There's just, I walk toward you and I get shot down. It's like, what the hell? This. Yeah, like the <laughs> yeah. elites are just mindless zombies. When the the idea of the elites in the games is they are the intelligent ones. They are the um, elites. They're the they're the it's smart in the name. battle warrior. They use tactics and strategies. They're like clever. 
Uh, yeah, they're they're from a warrior people. culture. They stand in a way. They have the the way that they are designed is like they're these armored humanoid esque creatures they're that stand cloaks, taller for than sake. the people they command. Some of them are invisible. Reason, they have shields. Work. Sometimes their they don't shields have, don't exist. Uh, and also, you might have noticed in all of these battles, where oh, the grunts there's, there. There's the muzzle the, uh, flares. Well, Frangie, this should be a, this should be an entire segment where we talk about they knew to adapt some things. But dot dot dot. Yes, um, definitely, definitely. But the thing is, is that they forego opportunities that make no sense to me not to do. Why would you not have, uh, in the fall of reach episode? Why is it just elites and jackals? We see one brute. brute. We see we see one brute in we episode five. Yes. But like literally in the entire battle, we see we see many many elites and then some jackals at the end. No hunters. No grunts. No engineers. We, we don't see, see I think, any two grunts. Did we get one shot of grunts? We, one. Yes, episode, I think we got yeah. one. Yeah. There were like two for like shot. a like. How weird! It was that? actually for about a second or two seconds. We yeah. see a couple grunts. They were kind of in the shadows, like mm -hmm. peering around a corner. So weird. Eighty percent of the Covenant army is elites with swords. Like bear in mind, in the in the Fall of Reach, we see one wraith. That's it. We don't see any banshees. We don't see any revenants. We don't see any um, choppers like brute choppers. We don't see. And, lol, no oh, specters, of course. Also, a really fun thing as well. In episode eight, uh, when Kai is with the Spartan Three, she says, Have you ever fired a plasma rifle? You never forget your first. And they pick up a carbine and a needler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. Alo is built just begging to be incorporated into like a um like a, a cinematic movie format because the game gives you this wide array of visually distinct not in terms of the weapons themselves but in the effects that they create when they're fired so you should have this you have this great essentially palette this whole color palette of different alien things that you can have in the game or, or have in your show because they're in the games but basically all of the the plasma effects that you see are just blue. Uh, you have no plasma pistols, uh, which are the most a, common. There's, there's one. Cool there's one, one needler yeah, shot that one. kills a Spartan. A yeah, single was, needle. No, no, no. Needles are the, remember an episode dual wields, yeah. dual wields them. Dual wields them. But dual wields we, have them. Ne we have never seen a fuel rod cannon. Uh, we've never seen. Um, yeah, we've never. Uh, seen did we see a carbine? Rod. I think the first carbine was in episode eight of this season when she picked it up when she said you never forget firing a <laughs> Oh rifle. yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the first time I think we see a covenant carbine. Um I don't think that we see yeah, I don't think we see a plasma pistol this season. Maybe once. I Maybe think there is one. It's when Chief picks up the sword and he's about to um cut think... that alien down or the, the elite that's down right. and somebody hits him with a plasma pistol oh yeah the, <laughs> the so elite shoots him with a oh, plasma right, pistol right elite, to his yeah. chest and he's okay and mr mandibles mr mandibles chops his head off for that he's like no no do we want to should we talk about is that before or after keys uh oh well yeah because uh after he, we, it's after he does this heroic sacrifice and then should we, should we, we should talk, talk about, about that yeah. yeah so um <laughs> after so, keys is in this show you would forget that he doesn't show up much in this season in particular. He's not a ship captain. No, he's an admiral. That's right, he's Admiral Keyes. He's, a, he's an admiral, and that means he gives orders to people on the yeah. ground. And unlike and the means... games, here he's just some boring asshole idiot dummy. Um, he's in the game, has a very distinct personality. He's kind of gung-ho, get it done, leads the charge, I'll do it. He's hands-on. He's very much like an old-school, you know, leading the way kind of uh he's got a bit of a brazen personality and in this he's just kind of he's just a guy he's just some dude he's around he's, he's got a dull personality Lincoln. nothing oh, no. noteworthy about him in any way and they, they kill him Lincoln. and the other black guy in the same episode well, so at, what, what, right at the end of black history Month. <laughs> oh other oh, black he, he guy you mean sergeant johnson no, I mean the, the gay yeah, black well, albino yeah, remember, with the grenade Remember that, right? Sergeant Johnson's not in this show uh, for some oh, reason. Oh my goodness. Oh, I yes, for Martin. some reason. Ignore that the we screen, have... that's not Sergeant Johnson. So many people would assume. It's so funny. They'd be like, obviously, that's, why would they do that? He's like, nope, nope, nope. 
you know, it's not like Sergeant Johnson is arguably like the third most important character in the entire series. Arguably, not, uh, a the support. fan favorite of the game. Oh yeah, every. I mean, he's basically he is like the sort of vessel for the Marine presence. In yeah, the, in the story. he's he the spirit like, of humanity. Of he's the fighting spirit of humanity yeah. as a last, like personified. The last casualty of the Halo trilogy. The, he's he's everybody loves him but for some reason he's not in this show uh i don't understand it's, why yeah it's bizarre and because they race wrong. swapped keys to be a black guy but they didn't have sergeant johnson be it's a prominent character good that I he's guess. not in the show however it's confusing yeah, yeah. it's confusing yeah. why is um that I, it's <laughs> i know that we were talking a bit about like how stupid it was that reaction that riz had when a blind guy was shooting the grenade launcher but like there is a stunning lack of levity in both seasons of the show when the Halo games have plenty of just like fun, sort of campy moments uh, throughout. Yes. Sergeant mean, Johnson is a big part of those fun, campy moments. And I wonder if that it's has Marie, anything it's, to do with but, it. Yeah, like, it's like army like, humor. Like they're above completely changing a character to fit the purpose of their script. Oh, yeah, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> they, true, they would, true, it, it's but... bizarre they don't invoke Sergeant Johnson's name just to get a few likes on Twitter. Like... Exactly. It's easy. It's it just like having a few grunts or a banshee flying around will just get you points. But for some reason, they just leave these on the table when they're just obvious, safe, easy things to get favor from people it's insane they, they, I can't they probably it. just want to have the spot open for like season three or four in case they lose some other prominent cast member maybe and what that maybe. means is that you don't have time to like him even more and develop him and his relationship with chief and other marines and stuff or yeah i mean his relationship with the arbiter yeah but that's that's all gone if we don't oh, we ain't doing remember, that guys the arbiter in this show the reason why i call him mr mandibles is because he's not Arbiter, he's not. he's not like the Arbiter from the show, even by name. Like he's uh, from the game, I mean. He's that, just that an elite. A he's a different guy, different backstory. Obviously a different backstory which, because which he's is the Arbiter a, before Reach. That, that is a thing from the games, but they don't really talk about the fact that the Arbiter is just a title. It's not a person. Oh, sure. It's, it's just for the sake of, I guess, clarity that even though yeah. Arbiter is in this show, he's not Arbiter. He's Mr. Mandibles, okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing with Keys, I guess, we talked before about how when Vanek had the scene with the birds, it's like, oh, he's dead. When uh, Keys gave his big speech about like, you know, we'll fight and we're gonna we're gonna fight him, and they they fucked with the wrong planet. It's like, ah, you're done. Yeah, yeah. You're, it's over for you. We started calling uh, death flags as we saw them. Well, yeah, and that was a clear one when he's given this speech. It's like, ah, you're done. It's over. Which is crazy when you think about the amount of threads that are kind of unresolved. It's something that season two forgets. A big point in season one is all to do with the Spartan program, and much is made of the fact that Keys was a part of it. Uh, but in this season, you'd think that they had no grievances with him at all, that they're best pals, they trust him completely, uh, and that he's a great guy. When, again, at the end of season one, I think I think John Halo actually said there will be like a reckoning, but not today because they were often going on a mission. It's just crazy how they've forgotten that he was <laughs> very culpable for what happened with the Spartans. They're just like, nah, we're good. Now we need to pivot him to just being on good terms with him so that he can have a heroic sacrifice on good terms. Which is crazy when you think that the way to go would be to have it, them be on bad terms, but that he finally, it, like, he comes through when it matters most right at the end as, like, a regular payoff. But instead, they just, nah, they don't do that. Well, and it's all part of a very confused plotline with the them knowing about Reach being abandoned that Ackerman had going on where he killed his dad. Ackerson. And, like, Whatever his name Whatever. is, it doesn't matter that much. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> Ungo, <guy>. Ungo Blab. <laughs> we know it. Ungo Blab. <laughs> but yeah, no, like that, was what, that was the grunt they didn't show. That was little Ungo Blab. Blab. We love him. Ungo Blab's great. He's doing his best. All right. He's willingly participates in the conspiracy, but we're supposed to like care that he's oh, yeah, it's still doing he do heroic sacrifice. We're supposed to care. This is the re review of the Yeah, season. isn't it sad that he has to do that for, with his dad? You're like, I don't know, fuck off. <laughs> I've yeah. got way too much shit to think about um, with him. The, the way that Key's death plays out is, um, it's bizarre. Basically, they're up in a hangar, evacuating civilians in a transport, and then just a bunch of jackals climb up the wall and start attacking everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, And while they're on the ship, uh about to fly away they notice like oh a fuel thing is disconnected and then keys is like all right i'll go do that and he goes outside and he's 
fixing up a thing on a console and he just looks to the left and there's like 30 jackals just gawking at him they're just staring yeah like, they know he's the main if character we could, um if we could draw this somehow uh and then correct me as i go because i might get some of this wrong like logistically it feels like when watching it you've got like the ship there's the big rectangle there then let's just say these are grunts oh so, sorry jackals, jackals. And then it's mm -hmm. like console here, and maybe good guy, good guy soldier. And it's like you've got to press button here. And so <laughs> he's is in here, and he's like, "All right then." And with editing, we seem to watch him do this, right? Press button, yeah. head back, and then like sort of go, "Oh, jackals!" <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how the fuck did this jackals. happen? Like what? All the jackals are just should have been shocked. Because they know, it's they so know that he's weird. Because I don't should have been him. shocked to be like, oh shit, aliens that aren't elites with swords. He should have actually been shocked in universe. It's so weirdly edited. They try to pretend it's... he had no way of knowing jackals were anyone near him until he's pressed the button. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a persistent problem with them being so cheap with the locations that you just can't get a gauge on what's actually happening in any scene. It's like the tactics like, and the strategy, like all of the spatial understanding of what's going on and where. Look at um, like this is the, this is the shot where he's like, "Wait a minute, jackals!" <laughs> it's like, what? How did this happen? What are y'all doing here? What? How did this surprise just, you? They just stare at him instead of just immediately shooting him. They're like, "Let's look at him." Let's just stare at him for a bit. And they stare at him for a minute, by the way. It's about a minute that gives Keys all the time he needs to sabotage the machine, leak gas into the hangar, and then say, got a light, as uh, Perez in the ship lights up the engines on the ship and blows up the hangar, which doesn't blow up the ship some for some reason. But <laughs> yeah, it some... kills yeah, Keys. It's very sturdy. To me, it's very sturdy ship. It's evident that the people who made this, like the, the editors, directors, and actors, it's like, I've seen this in movies before. I've seen This is how you do it. You do the guy says the cool line and then blows up. I think we've nailed it, yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's Keys. That's the end of Keys. He's just gone. He doesn't even get to Halo. He doesn't even get to go to Halo. Keys doesn't yeah, get the... to go to Halo. I repeat, On Keys that, does yeah. not get to Halo in this show. Yeah, he will he not dies. be turned into the grave mind. Or he the gets to go mind. to heaven and get his own Halo. The de oh. death of Everyone Keys in this here show is going was to hell. the death of Keys <laughs> here was disappointing. Not just in execution, but uh, we it's like we now know that we're not going to get that memorable beat from the first game. Like Keys plays a role in one of the games I think most memorable moments where like it's at the point where Chief and Cortana have decided that they want to use the Pillar of Autumn as a bomb. But in order to interact with the Pillar of Autumn, they need the command chip that's in Keys's head. And so they go looking for Keys on that Covenant ship. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, he suffers a terrible fate where he's sort of the flood sort of transforms his body into this gr this grotesque thing. I think he actually might still be alive in agony. He is. And uh, right. And Chief just punches a hole in his head basically to pull the mm -hmm. thing out so he can then go to the Pearl of Autumn and use it. And, and uh, that was such a cool sort of horrific moment and a cool moment for Chief because it's just like, fuck, he definitely doesn't like doing this, but he just, he has yeah. to get that chip you, out. Well, and he, despite having he's his out helmet of his misery. on, despite yeah. having his helmet on, you can see the hesitation. Right. He knows yeah. these. We've we've talked with him and we've met him throughout the game. And, and cool again, he has a out. personality. He is a person. He's a yeah, human right. being who's distinct from other human beings in a number of ways. So having to do this to essentially someone you'd call sort of a friend, certainly a friendly character that you like, it makes it all the more difficult. Instead yeah. of just and some remember, asshole like he is in the show. Realized on Xbox, original Xbox graphics and animation capacity on the original Halo. Like, come on. You know, yeah. One, uh, the reason so now, this repeating, by the way, is just uh, <laughs> in relation yeah. to keys. Like, what you have to think about this scene is they have several shots like this where the jackals are just awkwardly staring at him, and I actually don't know what we're supposed to take away from it. Well, yeah, are they like dinosaurs? They can only see him when he moves. Maybe that's what we're supposed to take away. <laughs> Maybe because he's just Jurassic Park rules. Perspective. 
character. As far as I'm concerned, he's just he's just another like human. Him. Yeah, but is, let him do this. You know how like you can sometimes write it so that maybe he did something so impressive that the enemy team take a second and be like, "Fucking hell, nice." Like, but that Which it can't make be that. sense for maybe elites. Well, I think I think uh, it's but... as simple as um they wanted it to be going out in a blaze of glory rather than being swarmed by a bunch of jackals and like chopped to bits. Well, because what um, should have happened, of course, is he maybe is able to get to the console and press the button, probably not, and then just takes a few shots and then and then falls over and one of them stabs him or something and just like, yep, that was awkward and he's dead now. They should have had him turn on the engines himself, knowing that it'll blow up the hangar or something. Or like he's been shot a bunch of times, but he's just barely able to reach over and pull the lever. Something like that. You could think of a pretty cinematic I mean, shot. He's released well, all that awkward. They've fuel just into the air, version. and then he could pull out a gun and be like, "Hey!" I or he throws his cigar. Up. Yeah. He he's got yeah. the cigar, he's got the a pipe, pipe, and he throws yeah. that lit cigar onto the floor where it ignites everything and blows <laughs> up the hangar. <laughs> that's and the, the lit sorry, cigar sorry. flips yeah. in slow motion <laughs> through the air. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, like in Team America, like when he's <laughs> the cigarette. <laughs> Yeah, they should have done that. Uh, by the way, this isn't the only really awkward, weird death we oh, have yeah. to talk about. We got another one. More this episode. <laughs> this isn't it's the only awkward. Out. Oh yeah, there's a third death. black guy that dies it's, in this it's, episode. Uh, it's, it comes at you <laughs> fast. This one. So, oh, by the way, and it's worth mentioning as well that for some reason, when they close some blast doors, blast doors don't work in the show no. universe. This is the second instance where a blast door does not absorb a blast and, and in fact, blows the people behind the door flying. Look at that. <laughs> what, what kind of blast door is that? Yeah. It's, uh, they don't make them like they used to. No, um, it's wartime. It's made out made of, of straw or something. It, yeah, it's yeah. so funny because like there's so much to talk about in this episode, but like there's other things in other episodes to talk about. So if we just got to hit the. Well, big we could ones. Uh, just hit quickly. Uh, when does Keys' daughter discover and react to the fact that he has died? Uh, episode seven, because <laughs> we did? do not see Miranda until episode six, and it's maybe her fifth right. scene. Where they actually address the fact that Keys died and and, what, and under what circumstances with Halsey, who was her mother, um, that's like the first <laughs> time that they have a conversation. It's after we've gotten a bunch of plot exposition. Really, really weird choice. Weird choice. Not necessary at all, by the way. You could easily cut away to her discovering the information at any point in this scene, uh, series. Mm -hmm. It's like but, Luke. No. They don't need to show the reaction to the death of a loved one because we we know how she'd react we know it, how it, it goes we know how yeah, it yeah. goes vanek is uh he's next very quickly uh, like <laughs> it's just funny to think about like how how much plot armor there is in this entire episode remember the spartans they're very competent super soldiers but like without their armor they're very vulnerable to just like one plasma round um, or a plasma pistol shot to the chest. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Or, in, exactly. In case anyone's misunderstanding, because someone just said, like, episode seven, it's like, yeah, the reason that's insane is because she should have found out almost straight away. Where's my father? I heard about what well, happened to Reach. Where's my Reach. father? Did he make Reach. it out? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Or, like, Halsey she's already accepted Miranda's, that he died. She Miranda's knew that he was going to die there. She's high-ranking. Let's not gloss over that. Information passes through all different places pretty quickly. <laughs> It's uh, typically, I'm not going to say everyone does, but typically you care about family members. I know this show may not yeah. be aware of that, to be fair, but still, that's why you don't Well, expect. especially because in plot, Reach's fall is supposed to be this high-profile thing, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, yeah, and but, Key's dying yeah. would have been, that, that would have gone through everyone. That would have been, like, very public yeah. information. Well, the thing is that she apparently had heard about it, so we don't even get to see her mm -hmm. original reaction. We missed the original reaction and get a more subdued, limited reaction based on a smaller amount of information later on. It's crazy that they would skip over that when it's just easy drama. That's like easy And that's what drama. they want for the show, is they want their stupid human drama, and this is one element where they can really like do that in a way that actually, God forbid, it's makes free. some level of sense, and it they is, don't do it. It is free, and they don't for cash free. it in. When someone dies, cash right. in, all the family members reacting. That's just something you're allowed to do. Mm-hmm. Easy, but instead, which, which, speaking of like not cashing easy checks, Vanek's death is really weird, really, really, really weirdly played out in a way that's like you missed the obvious way to do it. Basically, mm -hmm. like the way that it begins is you can see there's a big battle going on with the remaining Spartans and whoever's left. All of the all of the no name Marines get killed uh, by the time this battle ends. But because there's the, only like know, one name Marine in this fight. show. And it's Ruiz, yeah. right? I don't think oh, there's yeah. basically. Can we, can we just talk quick about this. Like it's well, just it's just well, yeah, yeah, how you do yeah. cinema, right? If, if so, if, for lack of a less pretentious word, like Chief grabbed an energy sword handle, like oh fuck, turns it on. Oh, oh, oh here we go, him and the Arbiter. They've both got their yeah. swords. What's gonna happen? 
It's like, we're all prepped. You know, you could even nitpick and be like, wow, no one else is going to interact on either side of this fight. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that you're like, yeah, mono e mono, we're ready for this. Let's go. What happens? And it's you this. You can justify it easily by the elite's, yeah. like, honor <laughs> warrior culture. Where it's like, oh, there's a 1v1 going shot. down. Let them do their thing. Got by what? Some other elite. <laughs> what was that? I wanted to see the sword fight. <laughs> Like, what? No, but you see, this is because you don't have patience, they're going to have their sword fight for real in episode yeah. eight. They're going to have their so, shitty yeah. fight later. We got to go. To, we got to go to North. We got to go to North Texas for an entire episode. Uh, oh, and people say so. Like, he's dead. No, of course not. He's fine. No, he's fine. Someone okay, else's okay. funny happens. Get, getting the, uh, getting the, uh, shot in the chest with a plasma weapon is not fatal. Okay, that, that's it's just a tickle. Know. Just a, just a little tickle. Mm -hmm. It's not like superheated. You know, plasma. Look at how goofy that is. <laughs> Eli's like, oh, whoops. And then just He's just cutting off. the head off of an elite in the middle of this yeah. fight. It's so funny. <laughs> and that's the Arbiter. That, that, yes. That's a guy who's in trouble yeah. for being a heretic and having to redeem himself. This doesn't make... It's not a good look. Not a great look. No, it's, it's not it's a great look. look. You can just picture it's the I mean, jackals you know, being I, like, I wait, be is honest, he a good I guy? Didn't... I didn't mind this too much. I know because he just so badly wants to get the kill for himself. But it oh, is it's, it's a normal payoff like, in well, loads of stories, but it doesn't work here, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I kind of disagree just because... It's not set up at all. Yeah, they don't set up anything about the Zealots or the Arbiters or why they insist on this honor culture. They just act like zombies. So Yeah, they're well, all zombies. It's us bringing it's our existing knowledge about the series in when, you, if you look at it as just a show, there's well, no Well, the thing is, is that there is explicit to reference to this is something that he needs to do to get redemption. We, we'll talk about that later, but... The more relevant part at this point is that he's lit look at him. He's about to well, chop John Halo's head off. He's about to do it while he's down on the ground. And the only reason that John Halo survives is right before the sword falls on his head. McKee says, "No, nah, don't do it." And it's such no. a it's and such a moment of like, oh, no, she's alive. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's alive. And, she, and this is the well, second they showed time. Been... Yeah, but like, yes, I thought did. they were in visions, or did they explicitly? Show? I guess no. They, they showed her at Sword Base. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. The, the end they of episode to, like, two, I think. Yeah. Don't forget but, um, that scene where the Marines cast... just walk off and get killed in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Well, yeah. that's because everyone's an idiot <laughs> in this yeah. show. This Everyone is incredibly stupid. This is Did anyone I'm remember sorry. batteries for their flashlights? Nope. Okay. Nope. Just Rip. walk into nope. the dark. Anyone remember the batteries oh, for the boy. fucking Marine sword base you. lights? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> How come sword base is so dark and dank and concrete? How come sword base is lit like most... dead space? <laughs> I don't know. How are <laughs> right. the most right, valuable... Now. Well, what's, it, what's being guarded down there is both, it's both Cortana and the... No, um, no, keystone. So, uh, it's keystone in, it? in sword base it's one of the keystones and in in uh the only facility at uh fleet ah, gotcha. comets cortana they've so, already taken mm -hmm. the other keystone off the, the keystone planet. is just behind a door that an elite can just like pull open he just pulls it open with his hands he just pulls it open yeah and it was guarded by four i i like I don't want to call them Marines, but I guess they are in the show, mm -hmm. who are so incredibly stupid that they wander off like person by person into the darkness to get caught right. by an elite. Now, Team 2, advance 10 feet and get murdered. Yeah. Good job, Team 2. No, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm not obeying that order of suicide. <laughs> uh, but alright, Fringy. Uh, Scribe and... Vanek's uh, final stand. Well, so, b b before that, it's just, think about how lucky John Halo is. If, if McKee had showed up, like, a second later, he's dead. It's <laughs> over for him. Um, and then the whole Think about how unlucky we are. There. Yeah. yeah he, no, so, so, okay, so, okay. so, I missed that the first time. So, he shoots Arbiter in the chest with a needle. The Arbiter pulls it out and then stabs him in the chest with a needle. And that kills him. So, and the needle has a so, conveniently yeah, prolonged well, fuse. What uh, happens is, um, yeah, like yeah. while while Arbiter's there, like stunned and everybody's stunned, Vanek grabs a needle and shoots it at uh not uh, at Mr. Mandibles, and uh, it doesn't really work. And then yeah, Mr. Mandibles grabs the needle, jams it. Why does he only chest. shoot one? Vanek only just, one like, actually hits. Sort of... He shoots a few, but they all bounce off. Oh, yeah. okay, that's not then, very characteristic. Wow, the elite though, armor right? works in this scene. That's convenient. Then, uh, yeah, he's the only one who's got working elite armor. Everybody oh, else, they don't get it. And then, <laughs> Even yeah, though like, the Arbiter yeah. armor was like intentionally shitty and like lower tech than what other elites had. He just jams it in there. Look at him. He's just jams it in <laughs> And then Vanek just kind of like watches and leaves it in he there. He gives up he straight away. He's like, well, out. that's it for me. <laughs> yeah, shitty Spartan. And then, uh, and then he blows up and that's it for him. That's, and that's the face of, can you believe this shit? 
<laughs> Look at him. No! Oh, yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> And that's it for him. That's Vatic done. The only he's like he's the one I like the most out of the mod silver team. So this was really lame. I don't. Ironically, like the much, one that I is characterized like the least as well is the most likable. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of funny. Interesting. Um, he likes birds, which is cool. That's birds. Fun. Yeah. You know what I like about Positive, the, yeah. the most about this is low key dramatic music begins playing. <laughs> and by the way, do you remember they did the uh, the typical story thing of you know Master's about to die? Oh my god! Blah, 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 and then it cuts to was it Riz who's like, no, she didn't do anything throughout this whole fucking sequence no. for both of them nearly dying. No, she did nothing. Yeah. She can't do anything. She's just watching them both and going, no. <laughs> Shot. At uh, Mr. Mandibles, and they could have shot at McKee. They could have easily shot at McKee. Oh, and she could have just been be doing. so killed, yeah. and that would have been wonderful. But oh well, mm -hmm. it would have been great. But instead, they all just decide, nah. And and oh, by the way, this is like a weird. There's like a one of the pigeons that he was talking to earlier is like flying above his head, like a, a, a <laughs> one of the pigeons he was talking to. It's like, oh, did you die, bud? Oh, I lived, yeah. bitch. It's, uh, it's, it's like this kind of Blade Runner esque, but terrible, like kind of scene of this pigeon flying above him. Like, look at me, I'm, and I'm going to heaven, just like. Uh, it's it's funny. It's really Listen, funny okay. to me. Someone in a su super chat referenced this fight, so I'm just gonna play it in the background now while we talk more because it's I'm allowed to play it fully without even protection. Yeah, to oh, bear yeah. in mind, in episode four or five, we've skipped a lot of both boring stuff and like super questionable stuff from the first episode. There were a couple scenes, and I think it was three that we actually said were like passable as as far as scenes uh -huh. go, and they all involved Kai. Well, it's 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 um an Arkison. Arkison had it, like if if you asked me what's the best scene, and remember, best doesn't mean it's like amazing or anything. It's probably the scene with his dad. That's probably the best scene in the show. It's like got good performances. It's uh, got subtext. Um, it's building aspects of like character and theme. Not very well, but it does it kind of okay. And that was in episode uh, three. Yeah. And to emphasize with this particular it was fight that we're under seeing, cut though by the fact that he kept like flash cloning his sister and having yeah. her die over and over and over yeah. and over. That's the problem. There's no. I, I thought that, that was a little psychopathic. Thing. That's the problem. That there, there's no scene you can point to where there isn't some aspect of it that's like, yeah, but like the plot or yeah, but this other element kind of seeps in. Yeah. Halo Wars oh, at least I establishes why they're insist on fighting in melee something the halo tv show doesn't really do no they just TV they just show loves getting them in close quarters combat they love it they love close quarters i don't like range yeah there's no the the combined arms element of you have all these different covenant that have different pieces of equipment and tactics that not just they don't just make them visually distinctive on a battlefield so that you can know what to do in you know a very small amount of time but you have like the plasma pistol shoot green, the needlers shoot purple needles that you know fly around a little kind of slowly. You have the plasma rifles; they shoot the blue ones. You got the green streaks for the covenant carbines. You've got the big green ones for the um, the big green ones for the the fuel rod guns. And then you have all the vehicles. You have all this. You have all this stuff, and it goes completely unused, so that you could just turn them into this mindless sword wielding blah we're gonna run at you and stab you like it's a game of infection on a galactic scale <laughs> it's really awkward and it makes them it makes them seem stupid you know and you don't want to make your bad guy seem really stupid and incompetent for a number of reasons obviously halo fans aren't gonna like it but just from a like a storytelling perspective don't you want to actually convince me that humans are at risk of being wiped out by this incredibly capable, intelligent, future, you know, <laughs> alien civilization. Because I don't believe it. I think the only reason the humans don't mop the floor with them is because they're equally as retarded as the Covenant are. <laughs> well, yeah, the UNSC is staggeringly incompetent throughout both seasons. Just, like, so many terrible... I mean, it's it's something, like, the uh, abandoning Reach, like, aside from the, like, unconscionably vile aspects of, like, abandoning an entire planet to just be destroyed doesn't even like make sense tactically to like lose so many uh like unsc personnel and assets and have them be destroyed when they're going to have a subsequent space battle with a massive fleet it's like 
Man, it seems like if you just localize the entire fleet around Reach, you might have actually stood a chance. But instead, they decided to pull the whole fleet away, allow Reach to fall to then have a space battle later, later with uh, fewer people able to participate in it. Because the UNSC and Oni are insane. They are insane. Yeah. It is, it's evil without the intelligence that should go along with it. Oni's just evil. In the games, Oni, they were yeah. like conniving and clever and scheming, but they ultimately wanted humanity to win, right? Um, they were like the the secret, you know, the 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 secret kooky guys who are like working behind the scenes to do stuff. But they were still like the good guys, sort of. <laughs> but uh, in this, yeah, but they're just like again, the evil mustache twirling weirdos. Only are more prevalent as antagonists throughout the season than the Covenant. They're the more Covenant. prevalent in the mind of John Halo. When he at Vanek's funeral, he basically says, "I'm gonna go after Oni. I'm gonna get him." And when he talks to Kai, and she says, well, the Covenant destroyed Reach, he, like, pivots to the idea that Oni is, like, as re or more responsible, which I guess is funny because they are, in this story, very responsible for it. But, like, even from his POV, like, that's, it's weird that, like, so much emphasis is placed on Oni when, in the face of a massive existential war, like, surely everybody should ultimately be on the same side. But it's like, they're not, though. They're, like, very antagonistic to what, like, they're more prominent as antagonists. It's really weird choice on the part of the writers to well, make that happen. In the game, we were able to get the humans and the elites to work together against the Covenant. And in this, we yeah, can't get the humans to cooperate I mean, with each other yeah. to stop the Covenant. Um, yeah. John, John Halo uh, grievously wounds many humans in Season 2. He fights a lot of oh, humans. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he should be a total he, section. He probably there kills more humans. on Master Chief's insanity. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking well, about characters like a greater capacity. Give a bit of like an addition to why I just played that scene from Halo Wars. I actually quite like it. I don't think it's great, but I think I, it's fun in terms of it was all right, but it was neat. How a battle has a back and forth, like the counters to each other's moves, is kind of mm -hmm. the main thing I would go for. We haven't gotten the ultimate uh, Master Cheeks versus good old Mister Mandibles <laughs> just yet. We'll talk about right, that at the end right, of the yeah. season. But this as a sort of first round where he just got shot. It's so fucking crap. <laughs> like, it's, uh, mm. yep. And I, I'm so fond See, of the screenshot that I've He's vulnerable without his armor, and that teaches him that teaches him that he is a different person than the Master Chief. That's right, and that's what we learn over the course of many, many episodes. It's very beautiful, and you guys just don't get it. You know, you're right. I, I don't say. fucking get it. Someone explain <laughs> to me this madness because I actually don't understand. I, I will say it is pretty funny to think about how much we can talk about all of this when in the first half of the season a good amount of time is dedicated to the ripoff expanse subplot oh my god it is <laughs> it is you some of you might be and we apologize it wasn't our intention some of you might be misled by some of the footage we've been playing where there's action and shooting and blind people blowing up rays and you might be thinking <laughs> oh what an action what an action packed what an what an adventurous yeah we've we've fun, gone through about 40% of the action so that's base, show. yeah. Unironically, yeah. this is about half of the action in the uh, in the whole season. The vast majority of the crap in this terrible TV show is awful human expanse drama. So, sorry, well, just want to. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's prominent in the first three episodes. There is, I want to say, like at least thirty percent of the time is dedicated to Soren and his wife and like Quan and their oh. storyline. That is completely disconnected from the main plot of the show. Completely disconnected. It's it's dealing with like the squabbles of people on a space station called the Rubble that we saw in season one. That actually like has no connection to what's going on in the broader Human Covenant War, and it's mainly cringe. You gotta you gotta show the scene of the woman with the it's top. It's mainly hat, uh, cringe. You, you That's gotta true, get though. it. Which which you scene gotta show the woman. In episode one, it's the first scene on the rubble where they introduce, like, the plot of Soren looking for Halsey, and there's, like, a woman with a top hat who, like, punches a dude and then gets on top of him and rides him like he's a donkey or something. Oh, wait, is that oh, season yeah. one? <laughs> that's, yeah, the that's, oh, that's the first episode. That's the first episode. Season two. Yeah, season two. Man, where yeah, was this season? Oh, oh I, I, I'm through. close, I think, yeah. Yeah? You're getting a brain block. It's like the it. slave market on the yeah. asteroid, yeah. That's right, because... Because, um, you know, um, Halo... So that's is, the thing, yeah. This is mm -hmm. something that exists in the setting. It's completely butchered what they're how they're doing it. <laughs> and yeah, there, uh, there it is. So it's just pointless. Like 
But why? why? Are it's that it's that Ryan Reynolds clip from one of the Harold and Goomba yes. movies. But why? But why? Look at that. It's just embarrassing. Welcome to Halo. <laughs> like what? Halo's good, man. Uh, this was one of my favorite. The no, this is no, one of my games. favorite levels. Yeah. It's um. It, it I like really. This level. Like I, because I I don't want to talk about it for too long, but like it seriously is like not a small part of uh this season is this expanse subplot dealing with like mm -hmm. Soren being betrayed by his crew, and then his wife, who is a very bizarre actress, oh, weird She's character, really weird. There's some very weird. Her line sanity is tied she to looks her wig. weird, and she has weird <laughs> expressions, think, um, and you gotta. You gotta. I know. I know. I'm just making you jump around, but there's in episode two. Do you remember the part where she screams? This is Soren's ship at the crew. It's really cringe, and I, I think you yeah. gotta, you got to oh. play it for people to see. You have to help me out. Do you have any idea where that is? I think that's in the. It's in the first half of episode two. It's uh, it's it's an early scene in that episode where uh, it's. I think it's like it's about the same time that we see Quan like <laughs> properly for the first time in her big little conversation where she yells at uh, her big little Soren's conversation. <laughs> well, do you remember? So... It's, it, she she yells at uh. Soren's son, who is clinging to the belief that his dad is okay after going missing, and she just screams he's not coming back, and it's like, wow, you're mean, aren't you? Like, yeah, you're just, a jerk. Like, <laughs> like, it's it's so cringe, like, the whole sequence and everything to do with that subplot, because, do you remember, do you remember like, how they had the old-timey weapons as well? They're not, like, futuristic weapons. They're, like, pump-action or, like, yeah. the, what's the thing with the, where that, like, you, you know, like, in, in a... Everyone like, wants to be Firefly. Everyone yeah, wants to be Firefly. Actually. Oh, this whole chase. You should show the clip where uh, the Quan guy's in just that chase floating outside. Yeah, she takes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even... Oh, this, this thing, I don't remember these parts as well as the others. Like, so I can't remember where everything is. Because nothing I, happens. I, it, I remember, boring she, and this, this whole scene, what I remember of it is that everyone's looking around to capture Quad, and then we, this guy looks outside, and one of them is just in space. <laughs> like, yeah, wait, what? I'm and then pretty sure that's that... just what happens. I don't. They don't show how that happens at all. No, we just no. They rely on not showing it because they have no she, idea either. She did some sick close quarters combat moves and got him out there. And then this guy, warrior the now. Juan is like a Remember, ninja warrior now. This guy who's looking now, he gets stabbed in the head with the thing she ripped out of her ear. Yeah, <laughs> like, she stabs him in the temple with a meat thermometer. Yeah, and, and by like, the way, just boom, the, dead. The only reason that Quan, the only reason Quan and consequently the wife Lyra managed to find out that Soren's been betrayed is because that guy she just stabbed just decided to tell her, "Hey, look, all right, Soren got betrayed, so give it up." Like that's that's Why how she did that. It. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, it's it's really it's really 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 bad. This whole this whole chase scene was weird. That there was a guy with like Assassin's oh, Creed geez, that or steel. <laughs> there was yeah, he went over the railings and everything. He chased yeah. her. And this and is what jumping around. Was that the one that this ended up what, in like space? Forty percent of the show. I think he ended up in space. The guy doing the sick parkour <laughs> moves because the other guys weren't <laughs> as good at parkour. You as say it was. so matter of factly. It's done though. This is it, all mad. Look at this shot, right? And it's like these two guys are looking for it. Then one of them, we just see him looking around until he spots the other ones that ended up in space. It's so funny. And I think they wanted and us to be like, "Oh, she got him." And you're like, "How? What could mm -hmm. possibly have happened?" You didn't this is one of the us, parts I kept. Know either. This is one of the parts <laughs> I kept rewinding because I was just like, "Did I miss something? Did I miss a <laughs> shot where, you know, uh, what's her name, Quan, like shoved him into an airlock or something?" But and then oh, I it. slowly realized, like, "Oh no, it's just shit." Like, <laughs> it's just shit. It's meant to be cool. It's, it's meant to be cool. It's just poorly put screen. together and written. Yeah. Yeah. You just There's went a outside why and they for... didn't show it because they well, you can't you can't show that well, and the have thing it like, make sense. You say that, but they show lots of scenes of Quan throwing people who are obviously on wires because she's a very small lady. Oh yes, they do. That. <laughs> it's like it's very much in this show. Um, what's the the uh, big yeah, uh, the yeah, big ginger Spartan found chick? It, the, her screaming. Uh, you already the other, tell this the, lady. Is... Well, actually, both of them, both of the female Spartans are like you could. They're, they're tall. Ladies. They're pretty they're buff. Ladies. You'd be like, yeah. yeah, I could believe they they could beat the shit out of someone. They're tall. They're strong. They're clearly like they look the part. Quan is this little twig lady, and, and, so and Perez there's as well. Perez is a very yeah, small lady. Perez is very skinny. Um, I I guess because it's on my mind, it it was very distracting throughout the show because we're talking about um women here, and I you know, I don't want to be that guy. Um, 
it's very distracting how uh, female heavy the armed forces is in this uh, show, where it's oh, like half the military is retarded. women. It's John Halo is not going to invite men to his harem. <laughs> yeah, <there laughs> look, look, those yeah. ladies, they like they could do better. All right, and but, there's um, not a single shower scene, Starship Troopers style. So there what's isn't. Going on? Hmm? It's. Mm -hmm. I mean, there. I mean, like, there's got to be. I mean, they've. they've there, there must be shower showers at some men. point. Yeah. There are. There's. There's probably showers for men in the military. I would assume, but it seems like the military is like bizarrely, like half women. And when you see it, you can't unsee it because, like, on half. Reach, when it's like fucking seventy-five percent. When Keys is giving his speech about yeah, or his shitty speech about we're gonna defend Reach, and it shows all like the soldiers, I'm like. This is weird how many short little ladies are in the military. There's like, it's so bizarre when you see it. They could make a point of it if like bit of a the, reach. the uh, recruiting stock is just dried out from them losing so many men in the war. But of course, they're never going to make that point that like at the tail end of the war, it would just be the women left. Right. I mean, it is, uh, um, to me, uh, Quan is like fetch. They keep trying to make her happen, and it's just not it's happening. Just not happening. And it's, it's not they keep enough. trying and to make Quan happen. Like, uh, yeah, we mentioned and, before, but they they killed the plot that she had in season one to pivot it completely in season two to like, ah, uh, this isn't my life. But I guess I'm gonna yeah, be well, embroiled in the Sauron subplot for a bit. In season two, whenever Quan shows up, it's like they want the audience. They expect the audience to be like. Oh shit! It's Quan. They're fucked now. Quan's gonna fuck some Quan's shit up. Back. It's yeah, just like nobody a, really cares. Uh, she's yeah, a ninja I, warrior. What happens is yeah. uh, the resolution of the subplot is basically they try to escape from the space station, but they fail. And then uh, Soren's wife gets captured, and uh, Quan comes back and does like some Assassin's Creed like ninja stuff, and basically kills everybody with a little knife. Uh, it's, it's right? a conspicuously <laughs> small knife. Yeah, episode three. That's episode three. I think three. literally the pocket knife I have on me is bigger than the knife that she uses. It's it's yeah, she, well, it's she very can't strange. fit a bigger knife in her hands. She's too small. It'd be too heavy. Yeah, she needs yeah. a tiny thing for a little <laughs> I like little the part lady. Where they were trying to be inconspicuous, but she's wearing a big blonde wig the whole time that she could have taken mm -hmm. off at any point. That's right. That was great. It is weird. <laughs> she decided to keep wearing it instead of changing her appearance more dramatically. Her Especially weird since... wig matches her weird face. So when she takes off the wig, it's like, well, now you're, now it's almost weirder. <laughs> now you're less <laughs> matching in an odd sort of way. And it's so weird that they have like leather action weapons in this show. It's so weird. Because it's gotta... Firefly Expanse. Firefly. Yeah, it, it, it's just it's whatever Firefly. the fucking the fucking prop master had that day, I guess. Yeah, it's like the I Starfield. I, I, no, it's thing. not even. It's not even fucking Firefly because Firefly did it all on purpose. Yeah, well, that's exactly. what Rex's that point a, is, I think. Well, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. there was a reason for it then, but here then. it's yeah. just like mm, it's just and like really, spacey, whatever. The only reason that this exists is to perpetuate another subplot that allows Soren and his wife to be prominent, which is that their son uh, gets abducted by the UNSC to become a Spartan. Which talk about the what are the odds of that? That a former Spartan who escaped his son then gets captured on a transport and gets recruited to become a Spartan. Uh, think, so that's like a thing that can occupy their time for the rest of the season. Was it ever implied that they picked his son because he would have had the same genes his dad had? I don't. I don't know that we get any I don't explicit remember. reference for uh, yes. that. I think. I think we're to conclude it was just bad luck. <laughs> okay. So can yeah. We, uh, no, right. Quickly talk about this bizarre okay. moment that happens with Quan. Yeah, please. Be more specific, Muller. Yeah, which there's, a, you there's one of those. <laughs> which bizarre moment with Quan? The one on screen, to? Rags. How can I be more specific <laughs> than that? So, just just recognize what's happening here. She's killed a okay. bunch of people to free up Blondie, and she's got a knife she's got, in her right hand. She's got blood on her face. She's she looking unhinged. Like Suddenly, this girl is behind mm -hmm. them. She's one of the kidnappy people. I don't know how she managed to evade Quan in this whole sequence. But Quan immediately goes, oh, I'm going to get you. And some weird movements and happen where she looks, it looks here. It's like, oh, she's putting a knife to the girl's throat as like a threat, I guess. Like, no, Quan has stabbed her. And you're like, huh? No, I can, if someone's stabbed, I can't see the knife. Well, you can see the trickery that they did there. They, they had to do something with the visual effects to make the knife kind of like reorient in a different way. 
because it doesn't line up with the actual action that took place there. But isn't isn't you one of the like, yeah? Weird? But oh yeah, yeah. The visual effects you see it's it like so slide, weird. it clips into her. It's like the mm. games. They added the clipping from the games. Oh, well, this yeah, is a reference. Yeah. <laughs> this is a game reference. It's not even the only time that happens. When John Halo was fighting the elite in that one take, his arm clips <laughs> through the elite's arm. And this <laughs> wait, 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 this wait. was a particularly um, vile character too. One that you're set up to want to watch get brutally murdered. Yes. Yes. The other lady. <laughs> oh, no, the other okay. lady. All right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I should have been more specific. Sorry. I just can't remember <laughs> any of their names. In case you really, talking um, about <laughs> What's it's really so... weird about this knife blunder is that isn't one of like the oldest, most famous movie props in history. The knife that when you press it, the the it's blade goes, one. the fake blade goes into mm -hmm. the handle and it looks like it's going into things. That's so why you, you have such a small buy... knife. You could have just built like a little bitty, you got, got one of those little prop knives holding yeah. a gun, right? Like, this is just uh, unless I'm missing something, mm -hmm. this just feels like a bad take and they need to do it again. She's holding a gun, no. Quan grabs the gun with her hand, the other hand has a knife in it, and they do the motion of, I've stabbed you now, but we can clearly see the knife is not in her. Even the girl is doing the motion of, Oh, I've been stabbed. Oh no, ow. But then it's they, like, they... Uh, uh, and then Quan actually gets her with her knife. Find the. They... They prominently oh, yeah. show her with that gun too. Like every scene that this woman is in, she has that fucking <laughs> lever action right. gun. Yeah, so it's, and... it's just like this is what what happened here, and it's like they filmed it, and everyone agreed. Like we're good. We're this and fine. They, <laughs> yeah, they they'll fix it in the dungeon. The effects. They're mm -hmm. like, wait, we're not good. Oh shit! All right, well, you see how like when Quan's arm moves up, the blade disappears, so that it can be reoriented in a way that actually makes the shot work. Yeah, then it's up really to the bad. actors. Just sell it. Just, just, just go. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, people uh, like it. and by the way, you might be thinking, wait, so why is this plot happening? It's like, well, the, the thing is, is Soren's crew sold him out because they cut a deal with some lady on the rubble to like make more money, and then she can be in charge. And that's like the plot. And it's like, huh, what's that got to do with the fucking aliens? Uh, what's that got to do with? Uh, why do they care about who's in charge? Humanity? Who yeah, like it, rubble if everybody's does that ever get come up like again? Humanity, oh. where, but there's you know, there's never any of that aspect of everyone pooling together to unite to fight for the survival of the human race. It's all like like I want to be in charge of this shitty asteroid. Like no, I want to be in charge, and I'm like I don't care. The aliens are coming, guys. Yeah. This is like the Game <laughs> of Thrones thing. You could look down and answer a text message and look back up and be in a completely different show in this season. It's just yeah, it's, so it's, all it's, over the place. It's weird, isn't it? Like, to go from that to John Halo stalking Corporal Perez to her house to confront yeah. her about the lies. And going to Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, the, the cyber the, And then going to the, the strip Blade club. club. <laughs> yeah, to we oh, need to talk. Gotta, we got to get gotta into show, that. Yeah. Oh. We got to show it. We got to show John Halo going to the escort, the hologram he, escort lady who looks like Cortana. He doesn't just... He doesn't just do that. He's a regular of the strip club. He He's done it before. He has That's a right. favorite really a John. Club. Master Gossie Chief, John 117. That she followed him to the elevator because she knew that's where he was going to talk to fake Cortana about his feelings. That's episode one, right? Yes. To talk that's about his feelings. One. I, guess that's, one. I guess it's an accurate depiction of a soldier to show them going to their favorite strip club. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like he goes there to talk to a hologram Cortana, fake Cortana like I miss you Cortana I don't know what it is but I'm sad that you're gone it's like what no, are we doing no wrong what strip club no it's funny I was stuck on yeah. AB repeat I kept trying to drag it I was like why is it taking me back to the fucking writing <laughs> I completely forgot how some VLC works <laughs> um, but yes this part was particularly fucking strange going to a strip club to see Cortana I don't know that they understand their fan base whatsoever. Isn't that what you isn't that what you were thinking about when you were running through the library? Is I wonder what, what Master Chief's favorite <laughs> wonder what he jerks off to. <laughs> like, yeah. I think, I don't what's his favorite answer. what's his oh, fetish? Probably is this. <laughs> well, good oh, thing they adapted oh. that. Internet. This is the detail that we always wanted to see as Halo fans. Exactly. I, if this so isn't crazy. in the next game. I am going to write an email to someone. Mm -hmm. I I uh I figure that if there's one before we like just dive into a big exhaustive discussion about the characters and motivations and everything, the the last like big subplot that seems like worth delving into is uh the flood because it is crazy. 
Oh, it wait, is actually wanna... crazy. Can, can we just play the scene? Well, can you can you just highlight how much we'll be skipping over in terms of raw timeline now? Because we were just talking uh, mainly about three. Now we're gonna go in from four, four to five to six to seven, kind of over to like so seven, eight, right? Episode episode five is basically right after the fall of Reach. They just go hang out on like this barren oh, sort so of bad. like mining planet, planet North Texas. So fucking feelings, bad. But, yeah, talk about their feelings for an hour, and then Riz retires. She's like, "I'm done. Yeah, hold I'm up. out. I'm, hold up. I'm done. Hold up. I don't want to be." A Re anymore. Remember the Patrician. funeral scene? Hold up. No, 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 no. We're we're okay. Patrician. We got it. We got to talk about this. <laughs> you described North Texas as both being Halo. And the crazy flat planet that they go to where nothing happens. No, I've just You've described, I've described most of these the, as North Texas. No, I described the, the, the bottle episode as being planet North Texas. You just you I think you've described Halo as North Texas too. You did it. No, it, it, it doesn't look like it. Um, it's more like South well, Dakota. The, the, the point the point being though, it's a waste. <laughs> it's it's the longest yeah. episode of the season, and it's the biggest <laughs> waste of time. Um, there are like important things for like character. Well, I say important. They're important for us to talk about. They're not that useful to the show. They're actually actively detrimental to it. Um, there's like character and theme stuff they want to do there, but it's basically a complete waste of time. That it's it's, well, it's that worse. Like, I would say that it's, reach. Yeah, I would say it's village? worse than a waste of time because of what they do with Riz. And uh, like the messaging yeah, yeah. that they kind of use with her, we can uh we can jump back into that when we uh like I got you, yeah. individual characters uh because sure, yeah, yeah like it, it seems like the flood would be they're like kind of the last remaining thing. But by the way, we're skipping all the way to the end of episode seven into episode eight to get to that. There is a big time waste with the Onyx like Oni uh Spartan three setup, which again Spartan threes and this aren't Spartans. They're basically like they're worse than ODSTs because they've got less training. Um, like, ODSTs have more training than the Spartan 3s. They're just, like, Marines that they pulled off of Reach and just put in <laughs> these suits that don't have any, um, shielding and aren't super strong, and they just throw on them in these crazy missions that they're training in simulations for, like, maybe a week tops is how much training and they they're, um, Spartan 3s. And they're, they're set to lose no matter what, right? Yes, that, it's, mm. it's meant to be a suicide mission that they're not being told is a suicide mission. It, it's very clearly signposting something that happened in the book Ghost of Onyx with none of the emotion well, do you remember that's the, tied um, to the... Do you remember the advice they give them of, like, uh, we're training you with gunshots that come from nowhere because you'll never know um, what's going to happen when you're actually out there? Yeah, it's, like, so it's an impossible to win simulation where it's just the gunshots are random. How was it helpful that the gunshots so come insanely from nowhere stupid. rather than... The guns of an elite or a jackal or a grunt wouldn't that make a lot more sense yeah um that 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 shit was like annoying to watch but uh i will say i was probably one of the, the few who was kind of on board with bringing in the flood because it's slightly more exciting than the pure boredom of the badness i think i rather it's something funny new. bad <laughs> yeah. than boring bad and i knew that like the flood coming in would be that and um something that struck me pretty quickly and uh it wasn't something i hadn't heard but i also definitely saw it and anyone else here would have totally recognize it feels very inspired by the last of us tv show zombies the uh the zombies yeah, in this. That, uh, it's mm -hmm. weird because uh remember like the flood in the games obviously not only was there a bit of variety in terms of what they look like because they consumed a lot like, of variety yeah. and alike you had different forms and you had flood that would use weapons the Flood were intelligent enough to have, like, coordinated strategies and use weapons against you. Whereas here, they're just, like, people running at people and biting them. Uh, it's really weird. Really, they're just really... zombies. It's, they're just it's an, weird zombies. It's an awkward thing because at this level, at this low level of infection, this is actually how intelligent the Flood are. It, they don't really the have is, a centralized intelligence uh, yet, but they do, though, because, it is boring. Um, the old lady... It's oh, right, fuck, so yes. She can talk to Quan. We meet an old lady in, in episode one oh, who's yeah. like a shaman lady who walks into the Covenant glassing the planet and tells John Halo he's going to die soon uh, and talks about whether he has a soul and everything. And then she talks to Quan a couple of times throughout the season. And then she's like, thanks, you released us. We're the Flood. Hi. Um, it's really, 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 <laughs> never, really weird. Never mind, I recant my statements, even though That's in right. the games, That's yes, right. they would just be zombies at that point, but... Wait, but clearly the show be knows the better oh sure it's just uh, that the, the they don't feel very um flood they feel like i said especially with the um the mouth opens and like flora type shit comes out it looks very mm -hmm. uh well there's no and infection yes, ER, they... forms or carrier forms they don't develop into those they don't we don't see the spores sort of become the little things that 
Oh, and should we progressively bigger and bigger? We should probably say how it spreads, right? So we it yeah, starts. That's what we're gonna do. So, yeah. Okay. Well, it, we, gotta, we gotta go way. Yes. Gotta go a little bit further back. So like, basically through a bunch of bullshit, Quan manages to open a door to a library on Onyx. Um, like when I talk about the kind of bullshit, I mean she like grabs some constellations and just haphazardly moves them around a big star map. And then it opens a door that lets it's them like go. It's like the Obi Wan Kenobi on star map, where <laughs> it's it's like yeah. when in the Jedi Temple when Obi Wan Kenobi is looking for a planet, and here, it's it just... all around them, and it spins yeah. around, and she and she really does like grab some of the little glowing dots that are and supposed to represent around. planets or what the fuck. And the reason stars. why she knows where they are is because there's a cave on the rubble where I don't know if she had drawn them or if she had <laughs> found the cave. Hearing you recount this is it's it's madness. <laughs> It's I know like, it is. someone needs to grab you by the shoulders and shake you and say, Fringy, wake up! Wake Wasn't up, Fringy, it's all a bad dream. I think there's slightly more to it in that she's, like, being... She's connected to, like, the Forerunners? Yes. In some yes. way? The, yeah, that's the idea. Um, but, but it's weird because it feels like they've retconned the history because in episode... In season one, you see one of her ancestors talking to a monitor, uh, and she's called a protector... And it seems right. like there's something that's meant to be more positive, but in this, it's like, oh no, she's a protector because she released the flood or something. I was uh, like, oh. So I don't was get what right. protector. Yeah, protector released oh, the flood. Here's uh, the problem. Here's the big problem at this did they point. Change that, minds? Based on the finale of season two, I genuinely don't know how much of the new three four three shit is now fudged into the stuff that they're doing. I think they might be setting up that faction they teased in Halo Infinite called the Endless. I think that might actually be the direction that they're going in. And so there's mm. yet more shit that's going to be really hard for us to predict because I don't know shit about any of that. Like, I... as, a, as an idea. Well, no, neither does 343. They scene. set up the Endless, but we have no sort of visual depiction of them or an, I, even mm. an idea of what the fuck it is exactly. Like, like said, it's just it's supposed to be worse than the Flood. It's like, well, uh, wasn't how? it that lady we don't that's know. in Halo Infinite? Um, that, like, alien lady? Yeah, I, that's right. Yeah. I don't, yeah, something like that. The reason why is because I'm, um, oh, yeah, 343 Guilty Spark shows up at the end of the season finale, by the way. <laughs> and this is the clearest indication that they were desperate. They're like, Let's get let's get Guilty Spark alluding to things that happen in season three with John Halo's cracked helmet that shows his eye because he's been through some shit. And like and he's gonna tease that there's something down there waiting for him. And it's like, well, it'd be weird for Guilty Spark to say that about the flood. That'd be weird if he's like yeah. eager to introduce John Halo to the grave mine. That would be like fucking retarded. But if that it's makes like no sense. It actually him, makes no sense. And he I says wanted... it's in the dark as well, so it's like, I don't see that it would be forerunners either, because you think he'd speak about them more positively. It feels like it's in a place where it's like, hmm, what the hell is he talking about? I wanted to ask of the scene, wasn't it the point that they needed Cortana to decipher these star maps because, like, it was just too complicated for people to do? But Quan just, like, moves some yeah, constellations around and figures it out. Chosen one yeah, so she's, so that she's as smart wizard. as Cortana. It's not she's about that, is it? The writers would be like, yeah, she has something in her gut that tells her exactly where to place the stars, okay? It works. Shut the fuck is, up. Is, does that, <laughs> is that, like, hereditary? It's supposed to genes? Yes, it is like, hereditary. It's it from contagious? her family. Her ancestors. Yeah. She got her, her ancestors are part so, of an like, ancient protector lineage that will that, allow them to... Given that it's so many generations back, shouldn't there be, like, millions of people with the gene at this point that lets them no, move stars no, around no. in a constellation? Nope. Because like, the Forerunners planned for the Forerunners that. Planned. Yeah, wrong. They, they planned for Quan. Right. Yes. So everything, every bullshit thing that happens in the show, it was faded. It's prophecy, so it worked. Quan, well, Quan why, do, why do I care? John no, Halo's immune to damage because he flipped a quarter oh, 500 yes. times we'll, and got hey, heads right? every time. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Let's wrap up the Flood as a subplot because basically the way that they get released is she messes around with a star map, opens the door to a library, they go inside, and there's a Forerunner lady just like there on the ground holding a little, like it's a little rectangular shaped object. Um, and Miranda grabs it, and then there's a big earthquake that like destroys the lab, and they escape. And she brings it into the base, like the only base on Onyx. Does the earthquake like, have just... a reason? No. Mm -mm. Oh, all right, carry on. It just happens. Um, <laughs> okay, she... well, it's so, unfortunate. So she's just studying. Oh, look, all right, you have to understand. So she's in there and she's messing around and she's studying like a spore that she gets from inside the container. And then another scientist lady is like, oh, yeah, hey, how you doing? And then Miranda's like, you didn't touch that, did you? And she's like, nope, I didn't touch it. She did. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she's Why been flotified. Oh, yeah. They're just like, did you she's touch been... it? No, the narrator, she did indeed touch yeah. it. <laughs> she did touch. She did touch she... the creepy bacteria. With her bad creepy hand, bacteria virus. I guess. With her hand? Yeah. This is like, the, this is the humanity it. we're supposed to root for. She is patient zero of the flood infestation that is about to destroy this Onyx facility. Like, it's, uh, it's crazy. It was at this point that becoming part of Team Flood was starting to look appealing. Yeah. I, I was rooting was for the single cell organism over human civilization <laughs> at this I, point. I really do wish I was joking, but like, she just touched it. Just touched yeah. it with her hand. I she guess. just touched yeah. it and decided to like deep kiss everybody in the facility. Women scientists. The mm. woman who oh, they were proud of themselves in a virology that. lab. They they show her like handshake someone as she's leaving somewhere, and then they're like the, the camera hangs on it. Like you see, this is how simple it is to spread. It's like shut the fuck up. There's a there's a movie that famously did that, right? Contagion. It's like called Contagion. Yeah. So I think good. they're just they just want yeah, to reference that. Movie. Movie. Yes. Um, in in uh, you remember in World War Z, it was like the chief vaccinologist or something <laughs> accidentally pricked well, so, his finger and got zombie in him, and then turned everybody into zombies. It's a Kind of a cool ending. I, I really want to watch the of the apes uh, new movies, the new set again, especially with the new oh, one on sure. the way. But the first one ends with the virus on like a pilot, and it shows him get into the the plane, and then it like zooms out into the city, zooms out into the earth, and it just shows really quickly how fast it all spreads with like really yeah, kind of like... sort of spooky music, and then it hits credits, basically letting you know it's like everyone just died. Whereas here, they play, like, this weird music while, like, this woman is getting progressively more unhinged and nobody seems to care. Like, she's sweating <laughs> and got black veins on her neck this and shit, everybody yeah. doesn't, nobody cares. I think it gets and, cartoony and it's with this. It's, it's like, that well, time I'm, of the well, it's like, oh, are you okay, Sheila? <laughs> what are you doing over there? Yeah. Hey, Sheila, who works in the virology lab, you look a little sick there. And claps him on the, yeah. back, on the back of the shoulder. You feeling okay? You want Should some chicken get you a glass soup, of water? Sheila? <laughs> Do you want me to lick your face? <laughs> I could lick it right now. Like, yeah, that's, Have some uh, of my coffee. Yeah. That's and then and then she stabs a guy and then she gets locked up, but it's already <laughs> too late. The flood is spreading. Um and then she gets like put in a she gets put like downstairs in a little uh prison that they've actually got like Soren's family. And uh Ackerson as well, who we have, he's a new character. He's actually really like prominent in the plot, but we'll talk about him later. <laughs> Because it's too hard. It's too hard to cover everything all at once. Um, and they're they're in that, prison. Oh yeah. They they just they just put her in a jail cell. It's not even it's like so an airtight weird. chamber. You know, like yeah. there's so <laughs> many fucking problems. She's with obviously this. sick. Like, what, but uh... why why wasn't the container dealt with in like an, a little airtight chamber with like you yeah, know they have a like quarantine a, they're dealing with an sure. isotope or something? Yeah. yeah. This it's goes to the, the um... bars, like the big red metal bars, like an old timey jail. <laughs> Yeah. This in particular speaks to what we've kind of been alluding to, which is that everyone in this universe is stupid. Mm -hmm. Humanity is too yeah. stupid to live. Well, and so this, like, sad. really, this sold that idea to us. Like, Sadly, it's the real world packaged. example of them doing this. Looking at her, you're not supposed to go, understood. wow, you murdered that other scientist for reasons of, you know, like, anger or jealousy or something typical that we can try in a court. You're clearly not... D infected with look something insane. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Look at her. You work in a virology That's... lab. They just brought in this ancient bacteria from like a, an alien cave, and one of you's going nuts. And like, we know what zombies are. All right, we're human. We know what so zombies annoying, are. Yeah, You're like... doing the thing. You're a zombie. I've seen the movies. I've watched the films. You're a zombie. She's, um, listen, zombies are dehumanizing. Please use the term infected person. Hmm. Person of way, infection. Like, yes, thank the you. The nature of like the You're way that it manifests as well. There's a part where Soren enters into this facility with Quan, and they just encounter a bunch of frozen people, like mm -hmm. frozen doing innocuous tasks as well. They're Not still, like yeah. It's like that uh, board it's like scene. Pompeii, he doesn't you know, like mean people, people from frozen. the hit movie Frozen. He means people who are <laughs> no. frozen, okay? Like, sure let it grow, it. let it grow. And they just kind of, they're very chill about it when it's like, this is insane, guys. Like, when have you ever seen a bunch of people just standing still, like in weird if, poses in a military base? If I walk into a place and everyone's doing that, I'm probably just going to leave. Yeah. Because some leave. weird shit's going on. Well, and it makes you wonder. It's like, shouldn't it, shouldn't Sauron and Quan be getting infected by flood spores? But they're yeah. not, they're fine. They're just breathing in, but they're fine. You know for a fact that infected. the riots will be like, no, we're not doing that. The next season they're like, we're doing that. Yeah. Yeah, they probably will, because I'll forget. 
Um, well, the, the, the spread of this thing and the effect it has on people seems so ill thought out. Like it's just a mishmash of surface elements from a bunch of different like zombie properties. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're, they're frozen still. Is it spores? Is it airborne? Is it skin contact? Like they, they apparently they burrow into the skin through like visible wounds, like, or, yeah. Uh, like, you, you, there's no clarity as to how it works, so, like, a lot of the tension is gone there. Well, I think if you ask someone who didn't know anything about Helen, and you're like, uh, they spread through spores, it's like, spores? That's, do they? Looks like they spread right. through bites, or, like, the little parasites that leak out of one of them and then go into other people, but not spores. It has to, yeah, there, because actually someone just messaged me and uh, it reminded me of something from one of the books, in the book The Flood, there is a part where Master Chief has an infection form like jump on him and it like cuts through his suit to like in like cuts into him um but it isn't able to infect him so it's not just it's not just that it's more than it's more than just they touch you they have to like actually infect you with something yeah well the, the or we can the but infection about forms have is, these little tendrils right yeah it's a the apparent uh, he says the canon explanation is getting a flood supercell in the bloodstream so only certain flood cells are able to infect you most of them are probably just the cells that keep the flood alive um and there are particular cells that will um infect you they're not which interested is, in any of listen, but yeah all of this they're, is they're totally excited insane. to get to do zombies they don't really give a shit if it's accurate to the games well, well yeah and for me it's like woohoo funny things so yeah, yeah it's desperate because of the flood is a uh, it's a huge reveal for halo but it happens so quickly in the show it just happens to the well, point where I, we were I, almost I, like like what are we doing the flood just like that we just found them and now where it's just flood time i suppose it's funny you say that because they'd be like well what do you mean we've been teasing it throughout all of season two and all the way into season one with kwan and we had it with the lady going like release us from our prison you gotta you gotta let me go when she speaks her in a spirit vision but it's like you think about the actual cause and effect of how it plays out it's really really strange and it feels like it comes out of nowhere when i think the writers would be like no it didn't we've been setting it up all season but they did it so poorly that it actually does feel like it comes out of nowhere. Well, because who um, gives a shit about Quan? Yeah, exactly. Like it's most really of the audience is probably Quan, fucking yeah. asleep during her sleep. When scenes, you tie so. it to Quan's storyline, it makes it, it. It's just that the cause and effect of how it relates to the actual human covenant war, compared compared to in Halo One, where it's like the Covenant are on Halo and they've gone exploring and they found something deep in Halo. It's like, oh, well, that's yeah, it's straightforward. It's simple, but it's straightforward. Compared it to, makes sense logically. Those, that's what well, so the what Covenant is, would do. Think about the cause and effect for the, the Flood in this show, all the way back to season one. Bear with me here, all right? The, the cause and effect is Quan is miraculously saved from death when a bunch of Covenant soldiers attack her outpost by Master Chief, John Halo, who also has super duper forerunner connections. She goes on a big journey to save Madrigal that then leads her to find going on a spirit quest where she sees her ancestors talking to a forerunner monitor in a, in a well to then tell her, you are a protector and that means something. To then have uh, to go fight for the uh, independence of her planet, it gets destroyed by the Covenant, and then she gets embroiled in the like inner turmoil of a space station, which then thrusts her on a collision course with John Halo again, where she then finds herself going to Onyx, and she goes down into another well that happens to be there, and then grabs a star map thing, opens up a Forerunner facility, goes in there. And then someone else picks up a flood spore and starts researching it, and then the flood gets out. That's retarded. Well, you know, it is accurate to the games if you think about the Halo 4 plotline of the Master Chief being predestined to go to the librarian. Which all itself starts with just the cosmic coincidence of the Prophet of Regret stumbling over Earth. There is an... I would say that the the books do a really good job at it as well, but there is a really cool, creepy element of the flood reveal in the Halo games regarding, you know, Cortana and her, you know, what she says, mm -hmm. her expressions and things. And then there's, of course, going into the swamp, finding them yourself. Well, it's a really, that really lengthy, cool that lengthy uh, helmet cam recording cutscene. Yeah. Yeah, Halo yeah. show forgets helmet oh, cams yeah, exist. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, um, that payoff is totally fucked now. I mean, they've done, yeah. they've, it's like they've, they've spoiled the flood. Well, we, they've, I don't know. Spoils the right no. word. They've done the flood reveal in the place where they shouldn't have. Like it well, should rushed, be. They? The, the 
the flood should be appear in like when chief is in the belly of halo like That's it's a, cool in the game because yeah, it's just trapped. like ooh, the ring it's just a cool mysterious thing let's get into the heart of it and then it's like oh shit the flood the most well, worst grossest thing halo. ever you're already right. stuck on Halo. You can't leave Halo. In this show, you could leave Halo whenever you want. You can call you someone can to pick you up, yeah. and you can you leave. leave on you can just leave are. Halo. You can go. So being mm -hmm. stuck on Halo, you're already fighting this grim battle against the you know, this alien force. Then you're like, oh shit, there are space zombies here too. Well, fuck. You know, and, and the situation goes from bad to worse. With them. You know, you think Halo is going to be it, and then it's like, oh, and now on top of it, we can't even use Halo, and now I've got the monitor after me. I've got Guilty Spark and this, the scent, like the monitors are, are coming to get me now. It's like, wow, this is a disaster. It's like a really cool high tent, a high stakes thing, whereas here it's all over the place because I've got all of these disparate subplots that they wanted to do that don't have very strong connections to each other or like a clear sort of central plot line. I think it's a yeah. really good point that they revealed revealing the flood early kind of takes away from the um, reveals that Halo has, because what can season three do now that it's been revealed that like the I flood said, exists and that there's it might like, be some new shit. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they whatever... have to invent something. Mm. Right. Now that the flood the has sales. been revealed, it's like, what is the big scary thing at the heart of Halo that 343 is getting at at the end of the it was show humanity. now? And oh. whatever it is, yeah, like whatever it is, I don't really care now because you've already shown the flood. The flood was meant to be the worst thing ever, you know, because like that's yeah, the whole the one flood. of the major angles of Halo is the Pandora's box story. It's just like, you know, it's oh, Halo, what's this? You go, you explore Halo and it's like, oh, this terrible thing is inside it. We got to get out of here yeah, and there's... destroy it. There's relatively very little setup for the flood in the game, but it's done well because anything that gets Cortana to panic and says you like you need to go like Cort the, the Covenant found something those the idiot those Covenant fools what have they done you need to go right now and do this thing and then she leaves in a hurry like you're like oh shit what's happening like what's going on here what, it alludes to some greater mystery but that's really kind of all you get and then you and discover him yourself. Think about the nature yeah. of how it recontextualizes the central conflict and then compare to the setups that they have here. Like, I would draw your attention when John Halo is on Halo and he looks up and sees humanity coming to Halo, he describes that as a bad thing. He thinks that is bad. So that means that there will definitely continue to be more like UNSC subplots of them being an antagonistic force in the show, which means that even with the introduction of like the flood, I don't think it's going to massively recontextualize the conflict it's just going to be oh that's like another subplot that will just sort of be running in the background uh while we have our other shit going on which by the way i want to draw more attention to that isn't that crazy that like they've written the story to where john halo seeing humanity reach halo before the covenant make like it makes him unhappy uh especially when at this point he doesn't understand the true nature of what halo does and honestly they might they might change what halo does they might. I'm mean, surprised. That's the, the thing. Like, it's it's such yeah. a massive like break from the games, but we're there. We've already they done that. Is, they have to reveal it's, it's not a weapon. <laughs> well, it's really awkward because um, you know, the, the fact that they've turned when Halo was the very first. I mean, I, I, aside from the Pillar of Autumn, Halo is the first thing you see in Combat Evolved. In, instead, turning Halo into a big two season long mystery. And we got to find it. And, we are, and, and it's weird that it's a mystery of how to find it, yet they're so resolute on what it actually is when they don't know anything about it. They just conclude it's a weapon. And, it, and it's from up. a variety of different sources. Like, the reason why they think it's a weapon is because Halsey just kind of thought it was um, with no evidence at all. The fact that they even know it exists is because they were doing a translation where they saw a sacred ring in the translation. And that's how they even know it exists in the first place. And then you've got, like, McKee who used to believe that it was the vehicle for the Great Journey, she now believes it's a weapon that can be discriminately used, and so does John Halo. And she so wants like, to kill wants both to the, the Covenant and the humanity yeah, with it. She's, she's done with everybody for some reason. Yeah. Now she just wants to wipe. <laughs> she's in her edgy like, teenage phase. Well, I, I don't think anybody yeah. would be like, how the fuck is she even considering making that decision? Who even is this person? You're like, I know, I know. She's a crazy person who <laughs> believes that she has the right to do all of these things, and it's like, that's and that's where we find ourselves at the end of season two. She's on the loose in Halo, and John Halo is like on her tail, but not really actively doing much to stop her. Meanwhile, the flood has been released, and is like, oh, and and it's and Halsey 
got uh, flooded, but she's in like a cryopod that just so happened to be in the in the place that Miranda was working, where she's trapped, and now she's got to find a way to cure the flood. Which I bet you they'll figure out a way to just cure it uh, instead of it being like a problem that sort of exists in a general sense and has to be confronted in a very specific way. She'll just find like a pathogen or something that stops the flood. That's probably what's going to happen. Well, yeah, they absolutely have to do that to bring Halsey back. Yep, exactly. Which they will want to. The fact that they put her in cryo instead of killing yeah. her off the flood, <laughs> which doesn't that seem like there's something there that she gets consumed by the thing that she was obsessed with? I don't know, mm-hmm. but instead, nah, it's all good. They'll be fine. And that's like, what a mess of of, of subplots, you know? Like, what a tangled web of insanity that that is. And like, weaved into that is a whole bunch of these characters that um. <laughs> And I have a question. Oh, yeah. It just uh, the reason that it's a narrative mess is just so that they can rush to reference everything so that people on yeah. Twitter can go, oh, my God, it's Onyx. Oh, my God, it's the flood. Oh, my God, it's fucking Halo. On freeze. Oh, my God. It's yeah. the Arbiter. They're, but why would done everything out of order? So different. Yeah. Yeah. Purely for but, that reason. Yeah, they took and the because Halo they don't know if they're going to get it. enough seasons to to naturally reach those points and earn it. So. They're just I mean, throwing shit like, at the wall, hoping that to keep the ball rolling. Yeah. John Halo's conversation with uh, Guilty Spark really felt like, can we please have a season three? Please give us a season three, please. You want a season Ooh, three? Ooh, there's a mystery. What's, what's going to happen? Ooh, that's right. Think of it. Yeah. That, I think oh, that's I hate his voice. Me. You know what's funny to me? Is like, they butchered shit. it. If you don't know anything about the games, those scenes are just weird, man. Like, um, I know enough from vague references from you guys to be able to put some things together, but if I'm being genuinely honest here, it's like, John is sitting in a dark room, and there's a floating ball talking to him. It's like, the fuck am I supposed to make about this? Like, do you understand how weird that is for someone who hasn't played any games at all? It's like, what what is happening? Why is he talking to a ball with a light on it? Why is this clearly framed in a way that's meant to make me go, oh, when I'm just sitting going, what the fuck? Look at how I, also, I, I really yeah. don't like that his visor is shattered. That feels like a huge uh-huh, problem. So cringe. You gotta show it. Show the visor. But... That's it's so cringe. Like, yeah. is so that, cringe it's like how's it. how's he gonna get back off the ring without his helmet being airtight? But then he gonna, you know, he's... next season they're gonna pull something out of their ass where it's just like point a little laser beam at the helmet and then boom, it's fixed. Uh, no, you know, oh, yeah, it'll be four no, nanobots or something. Four you know, yeah. nanobots will How are we gonna it, see his yeah. face? Well, it, it, it is funny the if they're ground. like, Yeah, we're keeping his helmet on the whole season. You're like, really? And they have that attitude face of like why didn't they just make the visor capable of becoming more translucent like the odst visors yeah, yeah like you it can uh, become yeah. a bit more trans you could like press a button or a function and it just sort of it it ungolds no uh, it, 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 it de-orifies it would be too so expensive to form. make that prop Dude, and... this image man it's so gross it's like they've shoved an imposter in there you know like mm-hmm. they've jammed him in there and look at him staring through this corpse that he's yet another skinwalker how dare you yeah. sit where he didn't sit? Uh, well, <laughs> you remember, remember. You guys remember the brilliant line that he said in this scene? The oh, wonderful no. line. You gotta play it, Molly. You gotta play it for everybody to see. You're talking about when he says, <laughs> I am Halo, or uh, is this when no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I am all the covenant. No, John, you they, are the they, flood. Uh, the line where he says, they took my image and bent it to their own purposes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, damn oh yeah uh, i did share that they on wouldn't twitter say that out loud it's yeah. too good not everybody uses twitter you gotta, all right. you gotta show everybody here very so poetic can... all right video essay people that's how you start your video i mean it's, it's just funny how he says that and it's like yeah that's the show <laughs> like that's the show, well so it's he. and you know master chief famously cared about his image he was an instagram yeah. influencer as a type of character mm-hmm. Yeah, he was Which really, you know, clued into the propaganda and the posters and stuff, you know. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> I actually have to pee. <laughs> well, um It's almost I an indictment a... of the games itself because he's basically saying that like the master chief of the games is the image that he doesn't like. Right. That's yeah. that's not the real John one one seven. I'm the real John Halo. Well, it's, it is weird, right? It's almost like they're trying to create like a a, a new storyline that supplants 
And I got to say, it's really awkward to think about. You think about a lot of the things that uh, 343 was saying about, like, Master Chief in Halo 4, and, like, the way that they talk about the character in, in this show and the Spartans, it's, it's a little uncanny. It's a little bit weird. It's it's almost like um, this is the way that they would have wanted it to be from the very beginning, but unfortunately, Halo already exists and has a storyline yeah. and characters that is difficult well, to get away from. But if you could recreate it in an alternate timeline then you can create it where it's like ah yeah we're exploring who's the man behind the mask and you know he's he's discovering his humanity and all that shit that they were talking about in halo 4 i i think the writers really engaged with the child soldier plot line of the books and mm -hmm. they kind of wanted to explore that but they also knew that they had to include a bunch of references to things from the games well, it's it's something we've talked about is that they knew to have banshees. Well, it's funny that in this season it feels like there was actually a lot less of just that recognizable iconography. Yeah. Even though this was meant to be the pivot towards being more faithful, but they knew to have like they knew to have the Spartans in armor that generally looks pretty good. They knew to have like the props for the like assault rifle and the battle rifle and like the gravity hammer. And they knew to have elites and grunts and jackals and banshees and, and warthogs and stuff. They knew to have all of those things because it's good for marketing. You can put that in the trailer and people will be excited and happy to see that. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's all to um, essentially cover for like the story that they actually want to tell. Oh, talk about yeah, it's, it's all meaningless fluff if the story isn't working and the characters aren't interesting. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. final boss it's, fight, by the way. It's it's oh, watching like yeah. somebody play with your action figures and they like <laughs> have just a really perverted idea of the story that you've been telling with them it's and they're like getting the else... names wrong it's like yeah. they're playing with transformers but they're using like gi joe names or something yeah, it's like that's this, not this, it that's this is jan this is jan 118 this is my action figure. You're like reenacting the throne room scene and they have Palpatine pick up Vader and toss him down the hole and you're like, what? Yeah. why did you do that? They're like, yay, Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to show uh, the, the, the final fight between uh, John Halo and Mr. Mandibles? It's the got intense really great, final battle. Really great the, visual effects here. We've really talked about the Arbiter up till now, so Look, I right? think it's oh, yeah, satisfying to... Uh, to see yeah, the resolution of this character's arc. Look at him go. Look at that great... Look at that great animation there. This looks real. Are, you, uh... <laughs> they look, are they fighting on a hockey rink? Like, why, why did he have no friction there? Look at how real this looks. The Halo 2 anniversary blur cutscenes came out a decade ago, by the way. The fucking Halo 4 Spartan Ops cutscenes look better than this. Yeah, that's like a decade ago as well. Look at this. Look at that. Look um, at this animation. To be honest, this is the only time I was like halfway interested in what was happening. It doesn't look good. But. Well, I yeah, mean, I take yeah. stuff like this. It's over... like watching a video game cutscene. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. it. It's, it's a conflict between two people that are best described with the title Murder Man. <laughs> <laughs> Because you've got Arbiter who killed a bunch of elites, and you've got John Halo who's killed a bunch of humans. And I don't know why they're fighting. They seem to be on the same side. Well, it's basically the the main reason is because well, it's it's funny because um up until a point it was like the Mister Mandibles he could be redeemed if he killed John Halo, but like he's moved past that as a thing. So I think it's just for his own satisfaction at this point of just like yeah, I'm gonna fight him. He's here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna chop him up with my sword. I like how he get like John Halo gets a second win, but it's like for no reason at all. He just decides like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm gonna win now. Does this look do. better or worse than Red versus Blue? What the like Red the, their, well, the their Red animated Blue, stuff? Like, uh, the fight scenes like those yeah. early ones had cooler like cho uh, choreography. They had cooler things happening in them that were like really fun and well animated. I think um, yeah, just way, I'm uh... you know you say murder badge reminded me. I think Rich Evans described. Batman vs. Superman, the Zack Snyder film as Murder Man vs. Captain Hypocrite and then Mike said, yeah. which one's which? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that describes this too. <laughs> yeah. Like, this I, is was, um, I was thinking how uh, one thing that continued to frustrate me immensely throughout all of the show is how many times an elite will be right in front of someone with the sword and they'll swing and they'll miss. 
Well, there was one time in episode one where an elite grabs John Halo from behind and just throws him and then ignites his energy sword. He could have stabbed him. <laughs> yeah, could have gotten him. Yeah. But instead, he just throws him. Um, I have a love-hate no relationship context, with... If you, if you have no context, this is like you're watching them fight over the girl. Like, <laughs> like this is the end of a rom-com or something. Just because he blocks all of the pistol shots with his sword. <laughs> like, is she... It's, I have oh, a love tape relationship with uh, one shots, especially if it's like CGI characters in it, where it's just like, I don't care. I'm not impressed that okay, it's so all I, I dumb a, people are in, I dumb people are impressed by you. Now. I like it. I have a big old question now. Have you seen the one take uh, in the, the bad guys, the uh, DreamWorks movie? I have no. not. Mm -hmm. I still need to see that movie. Um, do you? Okay, well, it's would you say that it doesn't matter what it looks like it would necessarily not be impressive because it's like computer animated uh i mean there's exceptions usually like i'm only in favor of oneers if it's all practical and it's used very sparingly like maybe once in like a you know a whole movie or like in um, an episode usually i prefer like traditional cuts do and you, shots do you, you like know? Uh, all right, well, you said in one episode, I was like, asking about Mr. Robot, because that's, like, for the whole... Well, what about, like, 1917, then, for instance? Is that... Because that's, like, the whole movie. Is that, Well, there's uh... so much done there that's practical. Like, I, I, I do respect that. Even if it's, like, stitched together with some VFX, like, that, I yeah, think that's this is, fine. This but if it's, like, two, two entirely CGI-modeled characters fighting, and the, the camera is just, like, moving around them as if... Like, I mean, at least the environment, it's like shot, it looks like it's shot on location in a real so sort of grassy place. I think place, them but... shooting it in real was a big mistake because that's what contributes to it looking really bad. I think they would have been better off if they actually just did the whole thing computer generated, including the background, instead of doing this weird thing that they've done that they've talked about in post-production where they shot practically, but they painted over everything with CG and kept some of the elements in the background anyway to where it starts to look really weird. Where, like, yeah. it's clearly not tracking correctly. But on the thing of, like, if you have, like, a one take that's animation, it's not like, like, that's that still requires an immense amount of coordination between, like, different animators. Because it's not like you're going to have one guy who's going to be doing every single animation in the shot. You'd have, like, multiple teams of animators that have to stitch their work together in a way that's sure. like seamless. Um, it, I, it can I, work, I, yeah. I would say that it's my not always bad. Is... I'm going to think they uh, uh, get fucked over by, by the obsession with trying to make it a wanna is that uh the choreography suffers because the interest is to keep it all unbroken but there's so many times where people are having to like screw up their sort of i mean the last jedi is one of the best examples of this in the throne room right that they do it all and then they'll and it gets cut up anyway which is the really funny part but that um like you know the part where, where mass chief's got his uh it's it's like you've got you you now don't have the energy sword versus an arbiter with one. It's like what are you gonna do? And then he's like, I'm gonna use my grapple, which uh, makes no fucking sense yeah. at all. No, you want to get him closer. If he's it, got a sword, you want to make like sure It's like one of the closer. stupidest <laughs> things ever. All uh, arbiter doesn't even have to swing. He just needed to fall onto chief, and he'd be dead. No, he'd miss yeah. arbiter. He. He just swings every time. See, he misses. He just can't hit him with that sword. But it's you like know? the it... interest in keeping it in a one, or it's like it's so hard to explain how Chief's even alive. And it's like, yeah, but it's all in one shot. It's like, well, Ugh. see, he flipped a quarter five hundred times, and it landed on heads every time. Oh, it's like <laughs> a gig, it's like a gigantic pile of shit is more impressive than a small pile of shit, you know. But like, it's not, you know, it's not True. very meaningful. And I think that, um, as well, when it comes to the sword stuff and their fascination with the swords in this show, um, I do not fucking have any clue how the Master Chief is able to have a sword fight with an elite. Mm. Elites are, like, trained to use the swords. That's, like, mm. part of their culture and, and their warrior element. How, do, how can he just pick up a sword and know how to sword fight? And it's not even, like, a human sword. It's, well, like, a fucked-up alien sword. And remember, this isn't supposed to be an adaptation of Halo 1. The game where you couldn't use the energy sword. Yeah, only the elites had them yeah. in the first game. Yeah. Yeah, they would they would disappear when dropped, or they would like blow up. The first up. time he picks them up, it, he knows how to turn it on, and he just turns it on like he's done it a hundred <laughs> times. Which maybe he has shot. because they're so they're so common that mm -hmm. every elite's got a sword. So maybe everyone knows. It's like yeah, he's, he's this here's the on button. It's the most understood piece of covenant technology on account of how why many wouldn't they master have. chief fight with his assault rifle you know the 
iconic weapon that he's usually uses and like they show they show well because he comes in with his pistol but he doesn't seem to be smart enough to move the aim to a place where the energy sword isn't defending and you know because that's how they they do it right and then he's like fuck it i'll just sword fight you and it's just like okay lose all your advantages it would be more (laughs) interesting if chief was able to like pick up a sword almost as if in a panic and then use it like, oh, there's a sword next to me. I can use that to block this sword coming at me. And he's able to block like a blow or something to the, to almost like, um, like not clumsily, but he's clearly not trained in swordsmanship because of course he's not trained in swordsmanship. Or, or they give him a mini boss. It. Like, it, and during the fall of Reach, he fights a lower ranking elite with a sword and he's kind of clumsy with it, but he learns the basics. Well, isn't isn't the obvious thing that he fights Arbiter in uh, episode four or three or whatever and loses but doesn't die in a sword fight and then it encourages him to be like, you know, next time this happens, I want to be able to actually know what I'm doing with this fucking thing. And, it's, and then you just have like one or two scenes where he's just practicing it while you have characters talk about shit. Easy. I just feel like it's... I feel like it's just, I don't think Master Chief should be sword fighting. Yeah, he, he doesn't give a bizarre. shit about honor. He wants to win. Like yeah, He's well, going to use his guns that he's trained with. He had to, I guess. The funny thing remember is, there's a part when, where uh, just fucking Master... wrecking him by punching him over and over again, but then stops. Remember he's when like... Master Chief and Arbiter met in Halo 3, and Master Chief just put his gun up in, in his mandibles and almost killed the Arbiter with a gun? Yeah. Good times. <laughs> I mean, that's Apologies what Ford tried the in that little battle no, no, that we. Uh, good to think about the good times. The battle we played, Force tried to shoot mm-hmm. him with the rifle and then lost it, and then he used his pistol. Then he lost that, and then he used his knife. Which, to me, like I said, I'm yeah, not it, saying it's, it's some amazing battle, but it's way more satisfying to watch someone who's clearly trained in all of these weapons to use them all in order of how lethal they are, at least for him. Yeah, to make the it clear that he's trying to win and not just fulfill his fantasy of honor yeah it's it's weird um it also this, this fight also shows how how shit the elite armor looks compared to the games it yes. looks really neat in games because you could see like the undersuit and even I... like, the, like elite skin um in this it just looks like man i don't know why they abandoned the cool sort of designs that they had in the in the games I really couldn't tell this was supposed to be the Arbiter's armor until like episode six when he was in a brightly lit room. Because <laughs> it looks it just... virtually the same as all the others. All the elites yeah. pretty much have the same kind of design. And they don't really have the elite, especially when, you know, in later Halo games, when you had all the different varieties of elite ranks, they were very visually distinguishable, not just by the design of the armor, but by the color. So. Again, it's one of those things from the games that you you gotta you you have to animate them anyway. Maybe animate them in the way that's more like lore accurate and world building accurate, so that so that they, they don't all just blend together. You have some who are in the front with this armor. They have the ones in the back that kind of look you know they're lower rank, so they kind of look the same. Um, some look particularly special, but you don't get that. It's one of the it's on that mountain of lost opportunities. It's just like why we never see any plasma pistols or carbines or needlers. It's just all blue things flying through the air and all a bunch of elite clones with swords. Yeah, I agree. They all look the same. I mean, there should be some variety. Uh-huh. And the, the Arbiter's armor is supposed to be visually distinct and relatively sort of old-fashioned, mm-hmm. like for, for them within their sort of culture. And, uh, you know, the Arbiter is obviously like a title, right? It gets passed around from one elite to another, and whoever is the Arbiter gets that set of armor. They and killed I a guess different just Arbiter. done away. I apologize. Right. I have Dumbling. a habit of answering No, 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 it's chat. fine. Um, so I, I, it seems like they've just thrown out the idea of ha- like the Arbiter having that distinct armor. And now if if they do reintroduce like the Arbiter from like Halo 2, he's just going to look like everybody yeah, this... else. Mm-hmm. For anyone seeing the clip, he he does get killed, but this is some Randy Arbiter. This is not an important one. This is just not some, yeah, Randy it's just Arbiter. some guy. It's just some guy. Well, uh, so I have a question. Um, we're gonna go, you know, what, let's go right to left on this one. Uh, I'm gonna go last though. Uh, I <laughs> my question is, 
Who is your who is the best character in the show? And explain you, why. Fringy. Easy. Fuck <laughs> and, and no Actual memes. Madman. I'm prepared. No memes. Now, b- bear in mind, you can explain who the best character is while encompassing and including any of the caveats or the flaws that they have or the stupidity uh... of the writing. That's totally mm-hmm. fine. I'm not asking you to talk about a character who you really like yeah, yeah, right, necessarily. Just, uh, just who you think the best character any, is. Any rule on not allowed so, to choose the one that's been previously said? Um, <laughs> no, you can, you, if, if you agree with that choice, uh, oh, well, I'd be, the thing is, I'm tempted to get somebody, if one's taken, to try and go for another character and explain why, but the thing is, is that I'm not changing, because I have an answer. Uh, <laughs> so you know what, you can, there can be overlap. You know what? Overlap is allowed. If someone else takes yours, that's okay. If you can also provide some rationale for them too. But, so, Rag, you, you're you, first. You obviously know that this is an incredibly difficult question. Um, <laughs> the best character... Does it matter how minor they are? Or... No. Well, minor, they need to be, like, they need to be a speaking character who has some amount of scenes, like, they don't need to be Fuck. a POV character necessarily. They don't need to be like a super duper main character, but they can't so just be like. One, 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 I can't one choose the flood. Shaman. No, you can. The flo- well, you can <laughs> well, they're a the hive mind, lady. so you can choose the shaman lady. Shaman oh, lady. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not fucking doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah, ragged. <laughs> Why don't you? Um, if I'm if I'm put on the spot to pick the best character <laughs> from right. Halo season two. Yeah. Uh, one that comes to mind is maybe the 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 purple robe delete. Um, oh, that that's allowed. You can you can pick him. I yeah. I think because he ultimately is very distrustful of Mackie, even though he shouldn't really be trusted of her at all but she has some sway in their hierarchy bizarrely but if we give that to him then the fact that she's here telling him to do weird stuff and they're not clued into everything the fact she's a human the fact he kind of discovers that they've been like communicating with something um from his perspective i guess it makes sense to him that he would want to kill her uh and just stop it so that they can get back to business. I think uh, I think I'm starting to realize that you're lucky because uh, I think he only has like maybe three or four scenes. Um, he is he does not have I'm, many scenes. That's why I asked if I could get him. I, uh, I'm starting to wonder if I think I've changed my mind on having him be allowed. Uh, I think okay. I want. Oh, no. I think I want. I think I want somebody who is plays a more prominent like i said they don't have to be a main they don't have to be like on the equivalent of john halo in terms of the amount of screen time but i think i want somebody who you could like reasonably say was main cast or like recurring Aww. like major but i recurring. can't choose black boy <laughs> no black boy Fuck. is also i want i want i want some real answers is what i want i want some like i want you to try really hard to explain because the, why they, because they the because I'm looking at this from the perspective of I need to find a character who, like, at least their perspective is in logically informs a decision that they make, and so I'm already like, oh shit, fuck, like that. Like that's said, how low like the I bar said, is. You, like I said, I think it would be safe to say that it is very, 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 very difficult to think of a character for which you can't point out a, a, a number of flaws. It's just that. I think it's pretty obvious that when you've got someone like John Halo, who's kind of like about as bad as it can get, him and like McKee, that if you think about it on a scale, there are certain characters who can actually, if you'll find it too hard, I can like move it to someone else so that you can think about it. Like, uh, oh, do I not get to keep my elite priest answer? I don't think I want to let you keep that one. <laughs> Damn. I, don't not, uh, I don't think that's in the scope of what I'm looking for here. Fair enough. Um, maybe you could say something about Perez, because when. She has some um, she has some trauma based off of what happens to her in the first episode and she decides after that to become a Spartan 3 after her family dies on reach which i guess is a, which is a logical thing for her to do if she has lost her family and wants to commit to being able to do something for humanity which is 
oddly enough, a kind of a rare trait in this show. Um, so we could do, we that's could go fair. with that. If your answer is Perez, I think that's a fair choice. I think Perez is one of the, if you remember, when I say better characters, you got to take it in the context this of this is, show. Okay? Oh yeah. On the Halo <laughs> season two curve. I yeah. think she's one of the better ones because because we're just getting to the level of she is kind of like like I could believe a human doing the things that she does for the most part, so that mm. automatically elevates her. To like I don't think I don't think she's a madman, you know. No, which helps. Um, oh, and and I guess uh, I that'll be your answer then. I guess that's that's. Uh, I think that's so. Cool. I'll just go with there because I, I don't want to sit here and think about it for two hours. <laughs> I know that nobody is going to uh, necessarily do it too much, but like season one storyline and any contradictions or like praise as as a thing can be incorporated into your uh, into your answer. So wow, I, Patrician, uh, who would you pick? And you can pick Perez as well if you want to. I'm going to pick Spartan Kai. I think okay. that she's actually a decent character. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if you gave Spartan Kai and all of her relevant scenes to the Master Chief actor, that he would actually come off as being a faithful recreation of the Master Chief. Hmm. So Spartan Kai throughout this show, she's on Silver Team. She's one of the Spartans that I presume loses her pellet, right? Yes. So she's going through the same emotional roller coaster that the other three on silver team are but she's not a wisecracker like the like vanik and she's not she doesn't have super ptsd like riz and she's not a fucking psychopath like the master chief or sorry john halo is in this show right she no. stays emotionally centered she stays loyal to the master chief even though he's being a bit of a psycho and like tries to not rat him out to Ackerson. Yeah, I could believe a human yeah uh, having some loyalty. To she wears friend. her armor quite a bit and uh, she stays loyal she to the UNSC even after the reach. I I will say your your answer is interesting because uh when you include season 1 characteristics, I think it makes things a lot more uh hard. I think the events yeah. of reach fuck with her character completely. Yeah, like, I, I, I they they pitch it as she didn't know about the finer points of what was going on, and I think that's the strictest part. But I could also see it working in that she's trying to mentor the next generation of Spartans, and she's actually like decent as a mentor figure. She's a bit retarded with the lasers coming from every, nowhere bit, but I assume she was just following Ackerson's lead on that. But this scene of Kai just beating the fuck out of John Halo was very cathartic for me because it felt like the Master Chief was killing Murder Man. It felt like the Halo show was actually going to turn into the Halo show. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. Uh, so now we got Perez and Kai as uh, candidates. Mubes, who would you pick? I mean, I, I find the question funny. So I'm like trying yeah, to find a funny. sneaky way out, want... you know? Uh, I, I tried I, that. I, it doesn't work, Mahler. It doesn't I, work. I think I've got a character that's more significant, but still very safe for me to choose from being like too contradictory, at least in season two. That's going to be oh, Keys. Good. He's pretty okay. straightforward leader man who gives a speech about how we should definitely fight guys. <laughs> and then <laughs> later on, he's like, oh gosh, we got to get the people out. And there he does. And, and he's like, oh. Gosh, this is such a bad situation. I hope we can make it out. And then he does a sacrifice with a little light, and he's like, "Bye, I'm out." Like that's pretty straightforward. I don't think there's much there that's. I I can't see myself finding him to be like this giant contradiction. Obviously, not at all. Right, rough... talking about like faithfulness of the character, just him in this show. It, it's the funny, roughest... though, because... Yeah, the roughest part would be that Keys is a collaborator in the conspiracy behind yes. Reach. Uh well right. he he didn't do uh, he didn't do as much to stop it as he could have semi ignorant but it's weird because he's an admiral which means he's like one of the highest ranked people in the UNSC he's actually a higher station than he is in in Halo One but uh, the so his UNSC is not entirely in control of this whole like that's what yeah but that's what engineer. makes it all really confusing I I would I yeah you know keys that's an answer uh that's an answer <laughs> I, I'm not, well, the thing is, I'm not <laughs> yeah. My my goal here is not to like any pass any judgment. It's more so I'm I'm curious to see how somebody would try to explain a choice in a show that's this flawed. Uh so John, if you had to pick someone, and remember, any of the answers have already been given, you can you just need to provide an explanation, that's all. Yep. No, I got a unique one. Uh with a big old asterisk, uh Catherine Halsey. Okay. Um 
because I mean, obviously the writing is fucked and it doesn't tap into the <laughs> potential of that character and it can't make up the show can't make up its mind whether she's well, there there is supposed to be an ambiguity to that character. What I like about the character, in addition to like the actress that plays her, I think she's quite good. Um again, the writing's fucked, but I do <laughs> like the idea of a character that's genuinely torn between being a mother figure to these kids and somebody who is willing to do commit war crimes to to save to save humanity, you know. Um I wish uh I wish the writing was sophisticated enough to depict that tornness, you know, between one side and the other, but it isn't. It's just it, the character is very clumsily handled. I do, mm. I I want to like that character and I really like the actress. It's a shame. All right, so we got Perez, we got uh we got uh Kai. Uh, yeah, Kai, that's right. Kai. We got <laughs> E's and we got uh Halsey, ER. Who would you pick? I guess I'm going to go, uh, I guess, a little bit against the grain. Uh, I'm going with Mr. John Halo. Oh, my um, God. Because even though he was acting psychotic for most of the show, um, he was 100% right <laughs> about everything that was happening. And everybody just did not believe him. Everyone in power yeah. gaslit him to, like, left and right. But he was 100% right about what happened, everything that he said that was going to happen, happened. The Captain think Marvel it, strategy. Interesting. He came, to a, he came to a faulty conclusion, though, on a stretch, which was that he assumed that, like, they're using energy swords on whatever planet because they're practicing to invade Reach. Would, that was a bit of a stretch. Uh, well, yeah, remember, uh, it's, it's okay for stretches to be... Look, I was right. going to say a lot <laughs> of his assumptions. Oh, we're stretching. Say. We're in stretch right. realm. That, yeah, he's absolutely he's proven right. That's not but what not... that was not what they normally did. Um, that was his point. They would just glass it. Why were they down there? Why were they trying to take out the com link or whatever the hell it was with the relay link? Right. That was abnormal, and that's what he was questioning. And and, and nobody wanted to like uh, uh, just pull know, the footage it. they took. Yeah, well, and that's it, another it is, thing. Um, don't they have footage on the helmets? Apparently they, they don't were, anymore. They if they it, did, it then the whole plot like, would just, like, break. If you want yeah. a character to come across as more intuitive or intelligent than others, you like, one way you could make them really smart, or the other make everyone else really stupid. Uh, that's, we love yeah, doing that's that. The thing. Everyone <laughs> else just became a humongous retard, and... Uh... Okay. <laughs> Never uh, thought anyone uh, would so be picking got... Mr. Riggs. I, I, I'm so, I'm well, I was, okay. He's, he's, I'm, he's uh... consistently <laughs> psychopathic, I guess. I'm I'm psycho, <laughs> but he's a correct <laughs> psycho. The thing is, we're having a, a lot of fun here. Psycho. Can I change my vote real quick to the to the dead forerunner? Please. I look all right. We're having fun, but we'll get to John fucking Halo. All right. I got you. We've got. I'm just curious about the answers. So we got yeah. So we got Perez. We got Kai. We got Keys. We got Halsey, and we got John Halo. And I'm glad you all picked ones that weren't the one that I'm gonna pick. Damn. Oh, do we get to confer made. to have a second chance? Can we can we, can we guess what you're gonna pick? Yes, I, I think ahead. there's a big clue as to who he's gonna pick. I could be wrong. Blind grenade man. No, but it's not. the The clue would be that he seemed prompted to bring this up right after we were talking about a certain character that none of us have mentioned yet. Are we talking about oh Soren's wife? No. no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's He's a master chief. <laughs> Fuck off. Okay. Okay. Um, okay if, right. it a, if it's a real answer, it's going to be Soren, but it's probably Quan. No, it's not Quan. And I'm actually surprised that nobody said Soren. I think Soren's got problems that were introduced in season two. If you asked me in season one, I would have probably said Soren's the best character. And I'm surprised nobody said Vanek either, because like I consider him to. It's it's hard to pin down what exactly you would point to as being like the insane choices that he made. Um, but the problem is, it's like he's not. It's he's not a bit much of a. To him. There's yeah. not much to be yeah. said for him. So, Soren, I, I, so I was going to say that Soren would be my number two after I think Soren probably would be my number my answer, two if I had to pick someone. My answer yeah. is not Soren, and it's not really. Fly. I think I think Fringy's choice would be my number two, but I decided that Keys is much harder to uh, criticize for inconsistencies. I think compared <laughs> to who 
The thing is, the reason why yeah. I can't pick who I think you picked is because I don't know enough about Halo to say whether or not there's more. <laughs> That's okay. Be... You don't need to know anything We're to done. judge this show. Okay. No, it's, it's not even that. It's going. like there's, <laughs> there's information about this show that I'm not going to have remembered fully about the nature of... I'm going to say the Covenant. That probably guides us into <laughs> where I think Freeze Choice is going. Okay, but, hey, go ahead. So, the, I think that the character with the strongest writing... In Halo Season 2 is Arbiter, Mr. Mandibles, which is what I'm going to keep calling him Dang. from going on. I, 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 I think I can uh, see it. The clue was right there. He brought it up when we were talking about the boss fight. Yeah. What, what, I'm, what I find fascinating as well about not uh, Mr. Mandibles, I, I used to call him not Arbiter. I'm trying to mix it. So, because that just makes it confusing. So it's Mr. Mandibles. What I find yeah. interesting about Mr. Mandibles is I don't know if the writers know what kind of character they've created with him. Because no. what they've created is what they wanted uh, Maki to be, but that they have consistently failed to do, which is create somebody who is uh, something of a tragic villain. He is absolutely a villain, obviously and clearly. Uh, there are elements to his storyline, though, that are kind of fascinating to think about in terms of how it all lines up, because it almost makes a point that the show doesn't, I don't think the show quite recognizes. Think about who Mr. Mandibles is as a character. It's like, what we know about him is he was part of the Covenant. He grew up in the Covenant and thus would have been indoctrinated by the Covenant to believe in all of their belief systems. Went all the way through the ranks, was in the military, um, must have failed somewhere at some point, and now he has a new mission that he's been tasked with as a Arbiter, which is that he needs to kill John Halo. Uh, he needs to retrieve the keystones. Those are like the main things that he is involved in, as well as being involved in the invasion of Reach. Um, there's plenty to be said from a world building perspective that's weird that you would have an Arbiter be in charge of an invasion of a planet. But if you understand, it's like, okay, so we, we have that baseline of the motivations. He believes in the Covenant and he needs to kill John Halo uh, and retrieve the Keystones. Unfortunately, Maki e serves as a consistent roadblock to him achieving his absolution. She repeatedly and consistently stops him from achieving the redemption that he needs to rebuild a life for himself. And she's doing it under false pretenses at this point. The reason why she keeps stopping him from killing him is because she is concealing from the Covenant and from him that, uh, that she cannot interact with the Forerunner artifacts anymore. That's not something she can do. So she is willing to essentially allow uh, Mr. Mandibles to continue to be denied a pathway to redemption in his own worldview uh, because she needs to serve her own goals. She then, when he starts to get particularly frustrated with her, realizing, like, you're denying me, like, the possibility to redeem myself, that uh, she begins to employ more duplicitous means of manipulating him. Uh, she says, like, the prophets are false, and you gotta believe in me. And with the help of Cortana, who for some reason decides to help her, she begins essentially having the carrot of, like, here's a redemption for you that you can have. You can go to Halo. I can use your belief in your religion to essentially get you to serve my ends. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Mandibles, this works on him. She, uh, Maki, event basically supplants a false prophet in the form of the Prophets of the Covenant with herself. Um, she keeps manipulating this character uh, to essentially work against his own interests, but he can't see it because he's too, um, he's just too fanatical. He's too fixated on his religion. Um, and so it's like we see that basically for the rest of the season, you have uh, not Arbiter having been completely manipulated by Maki e into serving her goals to the detriment of his own. And he follows her all the way until he is on the doorstep of the central figure of his like religion, the Halo ring. And it's here that he gets beaten to death by John Halo <laughs> and then gets stabbed in the gut. Right at the, right at the, like, having been denied any capacity for redemption in his own worldview. And it's like, huh, that's weird. You've, like, kind of created something of a character here. Again, he's obviously Modoc. a villain. Like, very quintessentially a villainous character, obviously. I mean, he was, he was a big, like, he, he fits into that role. He was involved in the invasion of Reach. He's on the Covenant side. He's in the war against humanity. Obviously a villain. Unlike Mackey, they've actually managed to introduce elements that make it like, hmm, it's like, huh, there's, there's, a, there's a level of sadness to his story that I think they believe that they have with Mackey when she's actually a clown. Meanwhile, it's like, man, there's something that's tragic there a little bit about uh, Mr. Yeah, Mandibles there is kinda... constantly betrayed 
and manipulated by these forces that have absolutely no interest in helping him or helping him find any meaning in his life or yeah. achieve any kind of absolution. All Especially that happened... considering that he had to like fight off all the other elites on the ship to get yeah. to this point he too. Like everything. he had to make a really big decision. It's actually like a really when you delve into it and what it must have meant for him. That that's actually a really big decision to commit to that. Well, yeah, it's 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 um Mackie cries crocodile tears at his death. Uh, <laughs> she did this to him. She got him killed. Um, there were many instances where yeah, because she is a reptile. Her, yeah, she lost her. Noxious, she lost her pet. The noxious taint of Mackie, like Mister Mandibles, would have achieved the redemption. Like, like the ultimately, all that's happened is like both of the both of the redemptions he was offered were false. They were both false. It was false in in the sense of the the redemption that was being offered by the uh, the covenant, because uh, obviously the religion there's got all of its problems and and all of the schemes of the prophets. But what Mackie offered him is clearly not something that he would actually want. But the thing is, is that she's concealing her motives from him. He doesn't know that he's about to help her destroy the Covenant. He doesn't know that that's what her plan is. But she's a duplicitous snake um, who just manipulates him into his own death. And so I was like, huh, okay. So yeah, my answer uh, is Mr. Mandibles. Thank that's you, fair. Uh, uh, interesting. I would cool. like to see a POV scene of what exactly his crime was or his dishonor to made him the arbiter for me to really kind of agree with that. What were you we about don't... to say? You sound like you are. Uh, you had some discontent. Well, no, I was gonna, I was gonna praise it and say that uh, in case anyone is lost, uh, um, for example, ER might have not have followed that. He's very much like the Zuko of this show, wouldn't you say? That's that's, that's uh, a well Wait, I, I don't know. So what did chat said it? I thought that would be too. fucking triggering. <laughs> <laughs> if we had got rid of Mackie and you had uh, Mr. Mandibles here instead, and he carried through setting him up of him discovering maybe what Halo really did and what he might do as a result of that, because we've shown that he's willing to, you know, he's willing to kill the elites that were trying to stop him earlier. This idea of what, you know, what would he do if he bumped into Guilty Spark or whatever, and he was finally the one who could, who could do it, and, like, he could finally redeem himself, he could do the Halo stuff, but then he's like, oh, shit, it does what? Like, oh man. I know oh, that's fuck. that's the interesting thing with Mr. Mandibles, is though I think that there's something to be said about his story ending with him dying uh under false having been manipulated at the doorstep of the central element of his religion, there is a story you could continue with of him realizing that he's been the subject of Mackie's deception as well, and realizing that, you know, kind of being sent on a similar trajectory to original Arbiter of realizing that everything that he'd done, all the horrible things he'd done, was all for a lie. And like what Having him torture that? and murder her would be very satisfying. Mm. At the end, well, that would have been like, a very nice thing. I don't like the boss fight a lot because of the fact that he kind of wins it and then allows round two to happen. Second wind, yeah. you know. I uh, actually I win, even though you beat the shit out of me for all of that stuff. Now I get to win because you can't hit someone in front of you well, with a sword. Yeah, somehow. that's the thing. It is round two. He's not allowed to attack on Halo. It sucks. It's like I lose now. Yeah, they could, basically they, he loses. Yeah. They could do what season two did in season three and just have Arbiter be back from the no, dead. That's no way yeah. because the show <laughs> the, you might have noticed that there was a particular amount of contempt for Mackey seeping through. I hate that character immensely. She's the worst character mm -hmm. in the show. Yeah. Uh, and there are new elements of what annoys me about her in season two, which is that even in the face of all of the horrible things that she did in season one, even with the fact that she is singularly the most responsible person for the fall of Reach. It seems like the show still wants to do elements of like, yeah, but I mean, look, you got to feel bad for her. Like, she had a difficult life, and, you know, she's confused nope. and everything. It's insane. I cannot believe that they're trying to create... One of the... Because, again, one of the things that works in the favor of Mr. Mandibles is he is in way less of a position to know better than she does because she went... I mean, first of all, she's a human. Um, She went to Reach... She knows more about the forerunner stuff than he does. Like she has a greater capacity. She might have the. She has a massively elevated capacity to understand the nature of this this situation, and yet she still decided that she wants to kill absolutely everything. Um, she's a monster. She's an absolute monster. Me, it, like it's it's crazy that they're still, and yet they still have scenes of like, ah, oh, but she feels sad. You know, she misses John Halo. She just wants, you know, maybe she just wants to build a better world. It's like this isn't this is so cringe. 
why did you this was a terrible <laughs> idea she was the worst she might be the worst thing about the whole show in totality even taking into account the destruction of john halo God, well you were sorry. you started uh along you know uh, how long ago was it hours ago by asking what was the thing you remember most from season one and <laughs> i was gonna say like i can't get mackie out of my head she is like this <laughs> this horrific taint that's smeared all over the, the show and I can't, yeah, like, she is a, a tumor that's just, un, you just, you can't detach it from this but show. Can, she is the, the thing is, they could have detached her from season two by saying she was dead. <laughs> they she, had the yeah, damn She died dead. like the shit villain she is, but they didn't. They insisted she comes back. She's just that much of a crowd fucking favorite. We had to have Mackie. She is, she, she is like, she's radioactive to this show. The only yeah, thing that will heal is just like distance and maybe time if you're lucky, but it's possible the damage has been done. She's been too close for too long and it it's, seeps into everything. It's interesting because I don't have the bias of the first seasons. To me, she just comes off as a plot device. I'm like, yeah, she's a bit of a manipulator, but I don't think that makes her a, a bad character per se. So. Uh, the, the, okay, so the thing is, is like in season one, the, the way you need to understand scene. her her backstory yeah i mean watch that for if you if you dare um yeah. is that the, the <laughs> that she put you off. Is when she was a kid she kind of had a difficult life and then she got zapped by an evil man and then the covenant abducted her right after that and then she was like all right i'm gonna kill all humans now i'm gonna actively participate i'm gonna take join it i'm gonna watch as i have all these people get killed on the ship and i stab this guy in the face and i'm doing all this evil stuff and then she goes to earth and she's like huh you know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe humans ain't so bad. Humans have feelings. And then she gets zapped by the smartest character. The best character in season one was the random military police officer guy who was constantly doubting her. Yeah. And, um, who and knew she was up her. no good. Yeah. And, and, and like he zaps her and they do a, a cut to like, oh, look in her childhood. She got zapped. You know, humans, they got some evil in them or something. And then she kills that guy, activates the device escapes after killing many more Marines and then flies away from Halo to continue to betray humanity and try to kill everybody. And it's like, yeah, she's unhinged. Like, she is in she's insane and inconsistently characterized as well. She's a terribly written character. I, I agree way, that Pring, her, you probably know her, the answer to this a bit better, just real quick. Why was his rifle damaged before he fought the officer? Uh, I have Because no he crash-landed, didn't he? He crash-landed. Seems... Yeah. Yeah, you, they show a scene where it's, like, split. Half. Like it's so, it just feels so arbitrary in terms of a writing choice. Yeah, there was an energy yeah. shield, uh, an energy sword right next to him that he could use. That's good. I that's feel like good. That's 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 handy. Not to just rip off the the Halo cutscene, but it feels like a better setup is that he sees Maki on her own. He knows the officer is around here somewhere, right? And he's got the the mm -hmm. cloak. It mm -hmm. feels like he should have his rifle, and the officer should have his cloaking shit, and that should be the fight. Use all of their resources and have them counter each other. Yeah, so motion being like, tracker, God forbid. Yeah, something. It's from so the games. boring when it's just like. Oh, uh, whoops, you haven't got all the signature things you need. And instead, they pull out a fucking grapple. Like, well, I mean, can you imagine if it was like, imagine, because imagine if you had an episode that was like you had, you know, real Master Chief and, I don't know, a super duper elite, like a ship master, like, or, or you know, an arbiter in like a forest and they have, it's kind of like a predator situation where it's like a back and forth of them trying to hunt each other down and, and kill the other while using all of the strategies at their uh, disposal, whether it's like active camera or equipment or things like that, and it's constantly going back and forth. That could be cool. As like a because they tried that in the first season, and we didn't get this in this season because he was in the armor for six minutes. But at least in the first season, they did a terrible job at it, but they, like, they recognized that they knew to do it. They just did a really bad job at doing it. And in this, they didn't even try. Um, I do ag agree yeah. that um, McKee's presence is consistently destructive to the show because it's always undermining the threat that the Covenant poses because it's so stupid that they would put her in any position human of power. In even if, um, yeah, even if she is a quote-unquote blessed one, whatever the fuck that means, she has John's special DNA, forerunner DNA, I guess. Like, oh, she got John's DNA, all right. <laughs> got plenty of it yeah <laughs> well, I think she, to it me, fundamentally a... breaks the setting because the covenant's whole motivation is that humanity's connection to forerunner technology undermines their religion so them openly acknowledging it just 
completely changes the Covenanters' exactly. faction. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. To, to me, she's a constant reminder that this is not Halo. Uh, yep. Right. Pretty much. Always stands um, out as dramatically. As well as, as well as other things, like you can't relate to an alien. Got to throw a lame human in there. Uh, mm. Otherwise, it wouldn't. How would you know what she's happening. feeling? And it's just funny to think that people connected with Arbiter using, again, original Xbox 2004 graphics and animation on Xbox. And like, <laughs> that's writing and voice acting. way more impactful yeah. and meaningful than everything that they could achieve here with all of their money. That would be a conversation I'd love to have with well. some of the key writers for this. To be, Do they know, or do they care, or do they think of it all as just like, well, those were the games. You know, like, what does that mean? Well, yeah, but it's just crazy because it's like, how could you look at something? I just can't not see them viewing it with a level of contempt, but it's like, how can you do that when you just had a bunch of video game developers with like an idea that they had no idea whether or not anybody would like, but just working really hard? They created something awesome that allowed you to even have this job in the first place, and yet you still like seemingly scoff at it and look down on it when it's better than the thing you've created and will have more of an enduring legacy than the thing you've created. Yeah. Like, god damn. How is that? Like, I just... It, it's yeah, like... I mean, we mentioned, by the way, the Flood just they, kill everyone in command. Yes, they. that's right. They they kill everybody. They kill Paran Gosky, who's in charge. They kill everybody. That's just like the UNSC and, command. Well, like supposedly that. they kill her. They don't show her dying, which that's means... That's true, they don't. Yeah. And fiction. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, that's the thing. It's, um, she it's probably fist fought, it, fought them away. She, she's she's going to be like in a gray mine you know, or some shit. We, we didn't talk about this, but there was a final battle, like a space battle that involved the Spartan 3. So what Kai did in that battle was she piloted a uh, Covenant Corvette and flew it into a supercarrier and blew it up. She will survive this. Uh, no way. Oh, they show dead. her alive, yeah. The armor the armor's yeah. weirdly durable because Master Chief well, takes like a glassing beam it's dead funny on you say and that, survives. Because, um, yes, the armor is... We, this is the third instance of uh, Spartan surviving being in the epicenter of an explosion. A massive explosion. Good armor, in season man. one, John Halo flew a Banshee into a Phantom and blew it up in, with him in the middle of it. Uh, in episode nine, Kai was on an ex uh, a, a, a ship that crashed on a reach and exploded, and she was fine. And uh, here you have her well, flying, doing what Well, if it makes them fighting. invulnerable, yes. why do they ever take yes. it off? Well, here's a question. Cobalt team, uh, the line is that they got killed before they even knew what was happening. It's like, well, they were in armor. So you're telling me that Cobalt team got killed by just some Covenant with some plasma rounds instantly without them be with them being caught off guard, but Kai can survive being at the epicenter of the explosion of a Covenant supercarrier? That's insane. It's worth keeping in mind as well, that not only the armor are good, but like, you know, Chief got shot with a... Uh, a uh, it, it, like, the, the skin of the humans in this is pretty strong as well. Except when it's both not and the armor's not. There are instances well, yeah. where they just casually get killed. Because I was going to say, even Vanek, right? He got one one stab through the chest, and he was Gonzo. Yeah, yeah. one needle. Interesting, right? How is it that you can get blasted in the gut with a uh, with a with like a plasma round, and that'll just knock you down? But if you get stabbed, it's like maybe you can't even be stabbed by a needle with uh, uh, elite strength if if they've shown this way. I don't know. It gets really yeah. weird when you're watching this the needle show. Might not, yeah, I'm starting to think enough, they have people enough. get damaged based on whatever they want to happen in the story instead of it being... What? Oh, that's what? You're what? saying they have plot hmm. armor? They have plot armor. That's a bit weird. Hmm. They do have plot armor. Like, John Halo has... Oh, well, well that... No, he has literal right. in-universe plot armor. That's right. We have to talk <laughs> about that in talking about the nature of John Halo's destruction as a character. Um, So... Jo so, you guys might remember, at the beginning of Halo 3, Cortana says that the reason why she picked uh, Master Chief is because she felt that he was lucky. Which is like, ain't that fun? And that's just like a fun little thing to have, that like, that's what he's viewed as being. He's just the lucky Spartan. Um, that's cool. Uh, 343 decided that they wanted to make a much worse science fiction world. So like, they made Master Chief a chosen one. Like set in I stone, love chosen thousands, ones. thousands and thousands of years yes. ahead of time, and clearly that obsession on three four three's part. Who I think people should be aware that there is a greater degree of responsibility, I guess, for like the way that this show looks in three four three. Um, because in this show they've taken it to like a whole new level of chosen one. We talked about how instead of all humans being able to interact with forerunner artifacts because humans are forerunners. Sorry, guys. Uh, well, actually, I hope most people agree with that at this point. <laughs> but like, I mean, um, 
I don't know. Can, and it's like it's the litmus it? test for whether um, or not we could be friends. So three four three, <laughs> like three four three guilty spark literally calls him a forerunner. Everything that he said, like, yeah, all right, look, I know the terminals, but if you have to square away that contradiction, all right, I feel like it pretty clearly leans in one direction. But um instead of all humans being able to use it, John Halo can because he's got special super DNA traits that let him do it. Uh, now that's what it was before, and there was a lot that was made of like the idea of prophecy and like ah, uh, you're being guided to Halo and everything like that. Um, it's gotten worse now. Um, we, there's a conversation during the fall of Reach where he's talking with Perez, and he talks about how you know I I, I when I met Halsey, I flipped a coin and it fell heads eleven times in a row. Uh, and she says, oh, lucky. And he says, no, I knew. And then he says, every time I go into battle, I know I could lose somebody, but I know it's not going to be me. He knows with absolute uh, confidence that he will never die, which is funny considering he I did. I fucking hate it. I fucking he hate died. that. He so died. Much. read the script. Yeah. He died. Even, even he with he was him, gonna come back. With him dying, not dying, even that totally removed from it. I fucking yep. hate the character implications of him saying that. And also, calling a, calling a coin flip correct 11 times in a row... That doesn't happen. So well, no, but here's that. the thing. I've here's the it. thing, Rags. Here's okay. the thing, Rags. I think. Look, all right. And this is gonna sound insane, and you gotta bear with me, okay? There's but we're a there, man. That John Halo has with Perez later, where she says, "Did you just get lucky, or did you make it like heads? Did you make it full on heads?" <laughs> when you hear that, you're like, huh. "What do they mean? Okay. What are they trying then, to say?" And then there's a scene in episode eight where he's basically he's confronted with the choice of do I go to Halo to stop McKee or do I go to the battle between this human fleet and the Covenant fleet to save uh, Kai and the Spartan threes. And he flips a coin and we get a big dramatic slow mo shot and we don't see what happens. And I'm genuinely not sure if it's that the slow motion starts going slower or if he discovers he has telekinetic powers. I'm not joking. <laughs> I just really do not understand if he actually has telekinetic powers. And one of well, the big reasons. Am I'm I the only sure. one that didn't mind that? I, I thought, I mean, he's like a yes, super enhanced you are. human. You are he the didn't... only person who didn't mind that. It's possible. It's in the lore, but what? they don't show do it. Sorry. But in the story Wait, what, so what the, are we sorry. aiming not not tell not telepathy <laughs> but like, this, like moving faster like she fucking deflects a missile with it, like his hand like he had cortana to do it but they did but do I like some cortana, absurd shit that they don't, don't, don't show don't in the game this addresses the idea that john halo can pause a coin flip in midair I don't Which think that's what I'm... they were trying to imply. There's just it's just a I'm saying, bit dramatic, like, but, oh, okay, was they gonna land on hands or okay. of course it's gonna be hit. Here's, here's, here's a question for you, AR. When John Halo goes onto the Covenant ship and punches the dashboard and absorbs Cortana back into his brain, what do you think that means? Uh I thought that means bad writing, but I mean <laughs> I thought that meant superpowers because he said, you don't know what I can do or something, or you don't know everything. And then he did it. I think that I genuinely think they might actually be setting up that John Halo has like superpowers. And I don't mean being a super soldier, but like, I don't superpowers. think that's what they were trying to imply. It's just that you don't know everything. Your calculations then, aren't everything. Then, I can't survive this if I, if I, you know, if I try. Your calculations on everything. I'm going to punch you into my brain. Now, I don't know how that happened. That See, Cortana, you don't understand how much of a psychopath I am. I you will literally have calculated into my brain. Don't underestimate well, well, so me. So let, let's put it this way. When Perez says, did you make it call heads, and the show obviously believes that's true, what do you think we're meant to conclude from that? That he has like super enhanced reaction time and shit. But, no, but what does, that, what does that have to do with another person flipping a it's, coin and always calls heads every time? It, it feels like a really bad. It feels like they um, read Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and didn't understand why the coin kept flipping. I think it was heads every time they flipped it, which was that those characters were destined to die as part of the play, and that's why it kept flipping it. They just figured like, oh, he can flip at the same time every time because he's got predeterminism on his side. That's that's. So here's the thing. I think that there's an interpretation you could run with. Uh, like, the normal way to read the scene, like the healthy functioning brain, I guess, when you're not like me and have gone insane thinking about this show, is when he flips the coin, it's like, we don't need to see what the answer is because we know he's going to go back and save his friends because that's what he believes in. He doesn't need to be told to do anything by pure random chance. But the problem is, like, I think the show's more retarded than that. I think that they're actually trying to set up that he like might have cosmic superpowers. No, I, no. Just kind of... I, th I think this is incredibly simple what they were trying to say. 
That's why we're discussing. Like, I think real people can do this. Real do people can call do. a coin they can eleven call... times. It's not just that they call. You just have to trickery. flip it. Yeah, you, you can flip it a certain mm. amount. If I mean, no, 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 no. no. But the thing is, you, is you, you can do this. I know you no, can but, do this. But why are you Flipping saying coin, you want like a weighted coin or? But why you, it has but why to be trickery. That, but why do you keep uh, saying that he flipped it? Halsey flipped the coin. How did he make her make it full heads 11 times in a row? How could he possibly do that? He made like, Halsey this flip is, the coin? Halsey flipped the coin. And I thought he flipped forward. the coin. I, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Halsey... I, wasn't, I remember Halsey episode, wasn't with Chief. Yeah, in the... So, it, okay. All right. So, in, in this show, it was with Halsey that they did the, the coin flip. We see it in season one. Uh, I think it was like episode four. Okay. She's the one flipping the coin and asking him to call it, and he keeps calling it heads every time. Um, so like it's not that he has some like special I remember this was when he was a child, like before he was a Spartan, not when he had like super duper reflexes. Um, this was him as a kid doing the coin flip, and it fell a heads eleven times, and Perez said, You made it full heads, maybe you made it full heads, and the show clearly thinks that's the case. Like, I do think that. I don't, I don't think that there's, like, that you can interpret it in a way it's just like, well, yeah, it's just luck. I think it is meant to be, like, cosmic prophecy. I think, I think it's Yeah, I would agree with that, because that, that's be. three for three's approach with the whole librarian plot point, is that, like, everything that had happened in the series up to that point was leading to Chief being on Requiem. So, like, I get, if they're leaning I, I, into sorry, that, then I'm, it, I'm getting, I'm getting really lost. Why are people not focusing on the fact that it fell heads 11 times in a row and he called it heads 11 times in a row? Like, if you were saying, well, he had an enhanced perception, that's how he could tell what it would fall on. It's like, yeah, but it kept falling on heads. Just, you, just, you, have, you have to call it before it's flipped, too. You can't call yeah, it while right. it's in midair. He's not exactly. seeing it in midair. So that's a, that's a one in so, one, yeah. uh, 1024 he, chance to flip it 10 in a row on heads. Eleven, uh, eleven times uh, zero heads. I mean, it's and, not impossible. And, 11, but... and, and bear in mind as well that he said every time I go into battle, I know I'm going to lose somebody, and I know it's not going to be me. It's like, what do we? When you take all of these references in totality, and you think about all the crazy prophecy stuff that they've already alluded to frequently throughout season one and two, the idea that John Halo has a unique cosmic connection to the forerunners. I think when you tie all of that in together, I think it's safe to say that there has to be some cosmic bullshit going on there. Especially when he punches Cortana back into his brain. Okay, like, maybe, like the, yeah, maybe so people just... realize you can do this. You can flip yeah, the... a coin so that it lands the same way. Every time. It just why like do you practice. One, for eleven just, for eleven yeah, times? But, but why that do you, is one why in two thousand and forty eight? But why do you keep saying you're not that? listening? <laughs> no, there's a way you can move your arm to make it land the same every time. So we're meant to conclude you that Halsey that. deliberately flipped the coin to land on heads eleven times in a row to see whether I don't John think Halsey flipped, flipped it eleven times. I think John I, flipped it eleven times. She flipped it. Um, he called it. That's what he said. Uh, yeah. okay, then, uh, then she could practice it. It's a it's a skill that you could do. What I. Are you, are you like you can practice you, this shit. Just, just to be, try are you, are you and get like the same amount of rotations um, are you, so that are you it will land the way you want. Like I think a, I think we're mixing like things up. So there's there's a coin flipping scene in season one. You said there's also a coin flipping scene in season two when he's on the pelican by himself and he no, keeps no, no. flipping it over well, and over. I, I, okay, so let's let's clarify. Okay, when he was a kid in season one, we see a scene where he's with Halsey and she's flipping a coin and asking him to call it and he keeps calling it heads. And then in season two, he speaks about how when he was a kid, Halsey flipped the coin and he called it heads 11 times in a row. And then the show, and then Perez says, did you, maybe you made it full heads every time. Let's watch this scene. I don't remember him saying nothing about Halsey. Uh, so, all right. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Give it Give me a, give me a minute here, all right? To, I'm I maybe I'm in season to, one that's what happened because I don't remember legitimately shit bizarre. about like I'm, I'm season actually one, but like okay, like I'm really hey look, all right, just give me give me like a minute here to get <laughs> all, all right. Let the, me use the loo real quick. Is is is, is the it's point that the writers are dumb because I agree the writers are dumb. I think I think I mean, it's just I, everyone's trying to agree on where they are dumb. Where does the dumb happen? Yeah. Well, like uh, I said, I get I I well, certainly get the impression that they're trying to imply some like cosmic prophecy I, of some kind. I can see John Halo being such a narcissist that he interprets his success rate as being like divine in some way, and that's just his interpretation. And maybe he misremembered, but I'm not gonna. I'm not yeah, actually gonna said, believe he that. He said she flipped a coin. Sorry, okay. sorry, uh, she flipped the coin. <laughs> he didn't do it. He didn't practice how to flip it in exactly the same way to make it call heads eleven times because he was just a memester. 
it's definitely some cosmic prophecy bullshit. I think the right? mix up is that there is a scene where he's flipping the coin and that that can be confusing. No, but, but yeah, I, I get I what you're think, saying. No, but I'm saying that that's the scene where like I genuinely don't know if they're actually implying that he made it like stop in midair and fall heads because he's got superpowers. <laughs> I like I to describe it in a more flowery way that I imagine the writers would try well, is that he has an understand or a connection with the universe that allows him to have a unique yeah, insight exactly. into yeah, the way if, things unfold. I've, there's that Deadpool yeah. character, Domino, where like she's super I lucky and I don't think like, it's that. makes reality warp around her. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it's that. It's that I think I He's think like is right. In tune with the be, universe like, to a degree that's almost subconscious, yourself, but he can access if you it. Believe if you in just, yourself, yeah, that's right. You can you you will know everything and that the, happened because because again, it's it's meant to be that there is like a luck in relation to this forerunner prophecy that is like cosmic and divine in its and and that he has some capacity to tap into it. Well, I know one thing. They definitely should not have had the characters acknowledge it. Uh, yeah, but the problem is that the show is all about it. That's like the big problem is that whereas in, in the Bungie games, it was just like a fun little thing that you notice. It's now become like a huge defining aspect of the character, um, which is really annoying. I find it super well, the, Yeah, this goes all the way back really to lame. just they make him cosmically important, which is, uh, which is it's kind of a... That's something they do in a lot of stuff. People who take over IPs, they go with like the hero worship from the fandom of a character that in the actual original stuff is not as special as they come across when you're a newcomer. Like, say, for example, you get into Halo at Halo 4. You already know about Master Chief being this fucking legendary guy. You have no idea exactly why. You just know that people like think he's fucking amazing. And then if you were told to make another story or another adaptation... You could just so easily slip into being like, yeah, I'm going to make him super important and the fans will love it because he's so, you know, important to them. And then, you know, oh, like that uh, easy fuck up where you're like, no, that's not why everyone loves him. Well, you think about um, a, a way to compare, like, for instance, in, in Combat Evolved, Guilty Spark links up with, like, uh, Master Chief to get him to do everything. But, like, that's just happenstance. That's not... That's not because Master Chief is uniquely important in the sense of allowing him to do his plans. I mean, he even says, I'll just find, like, another person to do it. Um, he, he is in the right place. Well, I guess you could say he's either in the right or the wrong place at the right or wrong time to be in this situation. Um, he's really important in the sense of humanity because he's, like, a super major player. But the, the events and, like, the story that he gets thrust on is a matter of, like, happenstance. You know, he was on the Pillar of Autumn. The Pillar of Autumn went to Halo, and then he, you know, everything everything went as it went from there. It wasn't like, well, because whenever you start to do the predeterminism thing, it's like, all right, well, now you're starting to get into a territory of, like, what is the nature of people's agency in this world? Um, obviously, there's a big question of what is the nature of John Halo's agency if everything was predetermined to the point that Guilty Spark said, I knew you would be here. Um, what What is his capacity to make choices? But, like, furthermore... How do the forerunners deal with everybody else's capacity to make choices when they have no connection to this cosmic force? Like, what was, um, did the forerunners make the old lady in the antique shop not shoot Master, like, John Halo in the face when he walked through the door? Uh, did they make it so that, um, you know, Mr. Mandibles missed every swing? Did they make it so that when, uh, they dropped that bomb on Reach that it didn't fall on the building that, uh, John Halo was in? or that when they started glassing Sanctuary that the guy maybe missed and then hit him, or any number of the times that somebody could have shot him and killed him, or any either number you of have times to... when a character could have made a different choice. Like, what happened if John Halo's family didn't settle on the planet that made him come into contact with the first Keystone when he was a kid? What if Halsey never went to the planet and recruited him into the Spartan program? Like, it's just, you keep going on that list. It's like, this is insane. Well, yeah, uh, you have to all... choose between they are able to do all of those things or they lose to the flood. You can't have both of those things. A society or a civilization that can engineer things to that kind of a degree, it's basically mm -hmm. omnipotence. I don't see how you could possibly lose to the flood if you can, like, predetermine and arrange all of these elements of the exactly. Halo story. Or if you can lose to the flood if you're super duper advanced, but you just the enemy is too overwhelming and then you have a last ditch effort to stop them you know like that's it's more believable that the forerunners lost to the flood if they don't have the power to predict the future to this degree because this is like tens of thousands of years of going into the future and being like this will happen this will happen like you're you're basically like organizing electrons at this point and it's it's just it's at, it's basically 
magic. There's no way you can do that. It just, maybe, I just don't believe it. I don't believe it. Maybe there should have just been somebody in that scene who turned to Perez and said, that sounds fucking stupid. What do you <laughs> mean he made the coin? He changed the coin he made split. made the coin full heads 11 yeah. times and called accurately heads 11 times. I think it's designed yeah. to well, make the average just, viewer I mean, go, ooh, oh, wow. Okay. It used to be that Master Chief was just really good at his job. You yeah, know, yeah. That's like he was really <laughs> good at being a well, soldier. What, here's what it was. Cortana had to pick a Spartan and she chose Chief because Chief was as good as all the other Spartans, but he was just a little bit better. And she attributed that little bit better he was to luck. That was it. it luck it, was exactly. just luck was just a little modifier that was on top of his already existing skill and choices that he would make. Not that he was defined as being cosmically lucky, chosen one by the forerunners hundreds of thousands of years ago after, in the aftermath of, what was it, the human forerunner war, and then they created the Prometheans and everything from there. Dude, 343, three, man. <laughs> like, this, this feels so downstream from all of those decisions, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like, they've made some wild evolution. decisions. We're, we're just living with the consequences. Pretty much, and this you know, feels it, like kind of criminal mass been running the clips and you know when she's like i didn't touch it's like why wouldn't there just be a camera she could check mm -hmm. why yeah there should be like a sensor that says yeah. somebody reached in here and touched this thing so stupid and it like crap. auto logs it i, I do it. hate that regarding the coin i do hate the suggestion in the writing that by the end of the show they're gonna turn chief into some like neo like figure where he can <laughs> yeah. just bend reality to his will you know and then yeah. it's like um I really hope that they don't do that. I, think I, I safe hate the say, idea of Chief. Yeah. Sorry, safe, go ahead. safe to say that I'll be in the Chief is a more faithful adaptation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I I hear that a lot. And it's just like, <laughs> man, my characters are like polar opposite to Halo. But like, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess like it, in the opposition, there is an implied understanding of like what Halo is and what the fans like about it. I guess that's what people well, are getting. You at. know what it is, is, uh, Murder Man in the Halo TV show will never be able to learn that what he's doing is wrong. Master Chief mm. and RB and the Chief, at least on occasion, can learn that he's been like doing wrong things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you exactly. you always try to yeah. find a way to uh, funnel his deep flaws into positive outcomes here and there. Like you can, right? You can move and change him, but this show, like, it's just funny to talk about that in a serious way. Like your character writing in that is much stronger <laughs> than this shit, which is meant to be. It's, there's no reason why this should suffer so much as it has, but yeah, it's just another one to add on to the pile. And a I funny mean, one to add yeah. on, because uh, most people didn't even fucking watch season two, let's be honest. No, they didn't. No. Mm. They did not. I, I guess it, it's just funny that this is the idea, that, that like there are actually some people who think that this was a course correction. Look, all right, maybe this will be the time where we can bitch about when we watched the Fuller Reach episode, people were saying it was the best episode. People were saying it was mm. good. I think it's actually rated at like a nine on IMDb. It's rated yeah. very favorably. <laughs> that shit's got to stop. If you if you want if you want an actual good adaptation of your favorite video game franchises, you can't be giving them like a nine out of ten for a, a, like a two out of ten episode of television. Okay. Yeah. I, I can already hear the Halo fan in like ten years going. I don't know why they never continued the Halo show. The Fall of Reach episode was so well received. Yeah, it's got an eight point like nine on Metacritic. What the they're heck? complete uh, not Metacritic on uh, IMDb. Sorry, modern Halo fans are like completely fucking clueless on like how oh, like, their no. rating of stuff affects the quality of it, and so they're just like, I don't know why they never continued Spartan Ops. That was my favorite part of Halo Four. I think um I think it's that um we we've talked before about how <laughs> about how uh, TLJ you know the the biggest thing that TLJ did was it uh permanently fractured the Star Wars fan base. Um, Halo's in a similar place, it's just that you can't quite point to a very specific thing that, uh, identifies the fracture, but, like, the fracture in, in the Halo's case is that Halo used to have a lot of people who were really into the games, but, like, they, they weren't, like, super into, like, the lore and everything, they, they, they liked the campaign, they liked the characters, they enjoyed the multiplayer, they were just casual fans. I don't know, like, what a Halo fan looks like now. But at this point, like, if you still would call yourself a Halo fan, it's like, well, I guess you must be, like, really, really, really into the whole thing, including a whole bunch of 343 stuff, which at this point has eclipsed Bungie in terms of the total contributions. Um, if you were to take, like, the totality of the content and the, the, yeah. the year. Yeah, like Halo, a similar I mean, story to Star Wars, isn't it? 
Yeah, there's yeah, more like there's more Star bad Wars Star Wars movies, movies than good ones. A lot yeah. more. Yeah. I guess what's interesting is that there's more there's more good Halo games than bad ones, I think, if you were to just break it down by numbers, because you got one, two, three, ODST, Reach, uh, like Halo don't forget, Wars. Don't forget Spartan Assault. <laughs> <laughs> that's true if you include i guess the spin-off like mobile games then it starts to get a little bit more competitive but like i i guess i i don't know what it looks like to be a halo fan right now and like what exactly I, you would want because it's gotten so muddled with all of 343's contributions that i it's think like, at this hmm. point they're just lumped in with the general like xbox fans and those guys are just psychos in general so <laughs> apologies to all the xbox fans in the chat <laughs> several like, of those, you guys uh, need to sort some stuff out some of those red well, face let... emojis gonna come up now the youtube ones the angry looking guy what? <laughs> i love halo it's... 5 what? i i guess uh i guess the point being that like you know what what should like a halo show look like as an adaptation what should it be looking towards it feels like it, it we should always be pointing to the original games because those are the ones that have like the universal legacy whereas uh 343 stuff That's is stories. much more divisive yeah i mean if you were going to adapt something but... why would you make it hard on yourself by adapting uh... the parts that people generally really don't like in that have That's ruined the problem, series though. quite frankly well i you know, what like... i've wondered this entire time is why don't they just do the Halo games, and then if that works out, do a Better Call Saul style prequel that covers your stupid not expanse storyline that you want to do now that you've earned it. But they don't want to earn it. They just want to do their thing. Something that ends up happening with a lot of these adaptations is uh, you'll get people rolling out the defense of like, you don't want the same thing. You want to let them experiment. You want to oh. let them move around. And uh, it's like, you wouldn't want that. And I've seen the response before and I have the same one. It's like, can we do that one time? I just want to do it one time, <laughs> and once it's yeah, done, yeah. and it's bad, because that's what everyone assumes it will be, like, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. fine, we'll reference that as the time we did it, and it was bad, but I just, I don't think I buy it anymore, the, like, oh, if you did it once, you know, like, if Bioshock gets adapted, it's probably going to be, like, once it's finished or whatever, it, it, it's, it's like, there's so much to work with, the blueprint is so ready to go, but they're probably going to fuck with it to... God knows how mm -hmm. much ends, and they have they have to I'm modernize so it so that the political messaging doesn't get confused. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I I watched I watched all the Halo declassifieds for this. Um, like to they're, the they're like the behind commentary the commentary. Uh, and beside, okay, they, yeah, they throw them up on YouTube as like the behind the scenes talking about that week, and they'll usually have an interview with one of the cast members. Um, so there was uh there was an interview with Kiki Wolfkill. For those of you who don't know, she's like one of the big people responsible for Halo's destruction. Uh, she was like big executive producer at like 343. I don't think she's there anymore. I think she now like works at Microsoft in like trans media. So like all of the adaptations and anything that they want to do with like Xbox stuff. And so she's an executive producer on the, uh, on the show. And right. when, you know, asked essentially like, what is that to look forward to in season two? Um, she said, we've taken some risks in the past and continue to do so in our storytelling but we do it from a place where we hope the fans will enjoy being able to see these characters come to life in different ways and telling these rich character stories with them in situations that they experience differently from the games. So first of all, you might notice that that's word salad, but the sentiment is like, look, all right, there are things that you recognize, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that's new. And 343's been saying this for a decade. <laughs> like they they yeah. will say this kind of thing frequently. There was um there was a quote from uh in the Halo 4 behind the scenes. This one's particularly funny because of how arrogant it is. Um oh damn let me see if I can oh uh I think he said basically it was I don't think people want just another Halo game. They may think they want that but what they really mm. want is something that speaks to the things they love but provides them with something new. That's uh you, th you think you do <laughs> but you don't Yes, pretty much. Like, you may think that you want that, but you don't. Um, I'm almost and, certain and that every like... element of the show has is filled with artists who think that they're going to be giving something. They're going to be like, you're going to love this, trust me. And then they're going to be like, what? Yeah. Look at the ratings. How did this happen? Oh, and, and uh, I guess for the, for the fun of it, so bear in mind that this is from like a decade ago. So these were the kind of things that were being said in behind the scenes for Halo 4 of like talking about the motivations with Halo 4. So here's just like a, a bunch of quotes, all right? Master Chief is human. He's not a machine. He's not a, a set of armor with a big weapon. 
is a human with resilience and courage. And then the narrative director said, what happens when that soldier starts to discover his humanity? Hmm, doesn't that feel like incredibly reminiscent of like the general, you know, idea with like season one and two of this show? Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. the soldier discovering his humanity. Well, um, soldiers aren't that human. Was some, that was some <laughs> bullshit I heard about this season was that this was supposed to be an exploration of Master Chief and versus and the John persona Halo. and yeah. John Halo. And the I just I just I was... didn't believe it because they really didn't delve into it like. John Halo looks wistfully at a poster of him in his armor and then like just decides to go on a murder spree at an Oni base. Ugh. Yeah. It's it's crazy, isn't Ugh. it? Um I, I, oh, I like this one as well. In a lot of ways, this is about Halo 4. In a lot of ways, the story we're telling with Halo 4 is about putting Chief in circumstances where he's forced to change. He's forced <laughs> to talk in himself. It's all these kinds of things. Oh, I like this one. The art director said Chief and Cortana are the same person, but she has always been the reflection of his humanity. They're not the same person. What? They're no, what? what? They are. <laughs> like, like I get that you have you know nothing about Halo. <laughs> like, just tell me you don't know any. They're they're two different people. I guess I guess what I'm getting at. So is how that, did they um, get separated? Was that like split personality? Like, <laughs> I, I guess he I'm lost the feminine side. Oh. What I'm like getting at is this, uh, <laughs> it's like really what you look at with like this show, in a sense, it's kind of like inconceivable that it could manifest, but in, in a similar way, it's like, yeah, but given the direction that Halo has taken with like changes in the narrative and the kind of approach that's been taken with the 343 games, on the one hand, you can also see how this is kind of like where it starts to lead towards because what Halo looks like, you know, who Master Chief is, kind of like the purpose of the series, what the central conflict is about, has started to shift over time towards what I guess is funny now is that whereas, you know, you could say that maybe like 15 years ago, a character like Master Chief was very um archetypical and not abnormal as like a character, especially in the realm of video games, right? Of like the stoic man a few words or doesn't say anything at all, kind of like protagonist who just like goes in, saves the day and is a cool hero. But, like, at this point, with all of these attempts at, like, deconstructing Master Chief, like, it's it's it would be downright refreshing to have a show where, like, Master Chief was uh, adapted faithfully as being who he is. Uh, like, the stoic, generally um, static, ever, you know, hero who saves the day and is brave and doesn't afraid of anything. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of I, different permutations of being able to get these sorts of ideas across that are very faithful and respectful to the source material. Um, and it's a shame that they just, they clearly just had another agenda. Um, it's, it's very obvious. This will, this show's legacy will be one that's just used as an example of what not to do, of how to show like spite and hatred towards the thing that you're adapting. I'm so glad well, because the opportunities that. are there. And of course, for mm -hmm. the record, if Halo didn't exist other than this show, it would still be fucking terrible. Yes, it is a terrible show beyond... Like, think about everything that we've laid out in terms of the actual cause and effect of these events. It's insanity. It's it's insane. It's like... Yeah. I, I don't know that there's anything that you can point to that is actually, like, just rock solid that there isn't, like, you know, massive asterisks for, and most of the time it's just completely broken to the core. Um, something I thought about when the scene where John Halo gets beaten is, um, you can tell they kind of wrote it like the typical, here's the main character and he's getting beaten by a girl. Doesn't that upset you fanboys? But it's like it, no, because John Halo is so unrecognizable that it, there, I'm on there's her no side. impact. Yeah. I'm yeah. on Kai's side here. Beat up that psycho for the safety of humanity. Yeah. The sad part was that he lived. Yeah. So in <laughs> a lot of ways. Right. She was the like Halo sort of show. acting and has kind of a character, and he's the a Halo show is so you know, divorced from the series. She was that... wrong. She got Reach. <laughs> Reach killed. Does everyone remember that? She betrayed Reach. She's got well, her own fine, issues. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she's got issues. She's better than Master Chief as a character. <laughs> she got a planet wrecked. Well, no, she didn't get anything. Like that no, was going to happen no matter what. That was Ackerson. Yeah. That was like Ackerson. Because no was... one tried to do it. She, she didn't ask any fled. questions. She fled with the people. That's 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 true. Um, but I mean, it, like, this is this involved. is what's actually going to bring us to something that I think is like an interesting uh, uh topic that's like tangential to this, which is um. If you were to think about what do you think the main theme of this season of Halo was? Like, what do you think it would be if you could point to something? Uh, Friendship is magic. Uh, a singular theme? Uh, I would probably. 
I would say that maybe the central theme is uh, it is something along the lines of not trusting authority. Uh, I think that you're mm. getting close to it, but I would put it under a subcategory of the unifying question, which is what does it mean to be a soldier? Seems to be like the big question that they, they keep asking over and over again in season two. You might yeah. recall that there have been a lot of really like weird lines throughout the season, like you know, wh you know, why why do you fight? Is what Parangoski asked. Like uh, John Halo gives a lot of normal answers, like to preserve humanity, protect people, and she says, "No, you you fight because I tell you to. You're a soldier. Be a soldier. Stuff like that." And they keep there's a lot of the conversation about like following orders. You're meant to follow orders. Soldier meant to follow orders. Yeah, but I don't know if I want to follow orders because that makes me a machine. There's like a whole bunch of that in there, and um, a lot of that is tied up in John Halo and Kai, and I think that it gets very murky because. You know, what, like, the idea that Kai was just following orders, it's like, well, she was just following John Halo's orders, but he was doing things that, he was lying to them. He, like, he, he recruited them on an unsanctioned mission because he had a hunch that he believed was correct, and sure, he was, but, like, he went outside the chain, he lied to them when they might not have agreed to it if he had done it, and that got them in trouble. And it's like, well, surely that makes things more complicated if the idea is that, like, John Halo is in the right for the whole idea of, like, yeah, Kai, you followed orders like a machine. Is that all you are, a machine? And it gets particularly awkward when Kai uh, disobeyed orders and was very questioning in season one. Um, like, in season one, she literally has a line that says, do you ever wonder why you never wonder why? It's weird to make Kai the vas like the vessel of just follow orders, this is what you get, is Kai. It's like, what do you mean? That's not, that's not even really who she is. And, like, you're faulting her for essentially using her own faculties, which is, John Halo's coming across, like, unhinged. He's got no evidence for the claims that he keeps making, which, whether or not that's, like, some crazy shit that's going on, he doesn't well, have any evidence. she was covering so... for John for a while. Yeah, she was, she covered Bunch for him. A bunch of people she... just went fucking dead, and they don't have an explanation for it, and then Cobalt Team fucking disappears. No, I mean, I don't... no don't ask questions. Like... Don't just let the planet no, yeah, get exploded. I... <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I, I guess I find it strange it would be the idea that, like, Kai is the most culpable for that when, like, it was definitely Parangoski and Akerson and Oni and the UNSC Well, command. my issue with her is that if she drilled down at all, it would get very suspicious. So just asking any Pretty questions much. would have led her yeah. to being like, oh, I can't trust my superiors. Like, yeah. asking one or two questions for sure. Like, she she goes along with it. For, like, the big thing should be, we left right before Reach fell. Man, that's fucking lucky. And all the UNSC, mm -hmm. like, Kai commander here... That's crazy. Yeah, but I like I don't know why why we're we leaning in the direction that like this somehow absolves and saves John Halo, like in any way, shape, or form. That's because what I'm confused he about. was right. Uh, Can you talk well, like a normal right, person right, for the rest of us for right. a bit? He was so right. Everybody who everybody <laughs> did not believe him when so he was right. Let, let, okay, people so let, in power let, were all conspiring against him. He tried to okay. tell everyone, but he was right. Well, let, let's let's run through like the the cause and effect though of thinking about the nature of it. Let let's think of the the genesis of him being right about what happened on Reach was they went to Sanctuary to evacuate civilians. He went mm. to a comms relay that went down, and then the mm -hmm. Covenant attacked, and then they began glassing the planet. The conclusion he drew from that is the Covenant preparing to invade a planet, and then he eventually concludes that it's Reach. Where, where's the through line there? Where, where is the where's the logic in that connection? Through line was that they don't do that. That's what that's how he's good. That that's not their normal MO. No one well, explains so, where the hell all these bodies went. I I, how I know about all these that. people but, were killed. That, that's later. That's after he already concluded that the covenant was on reach. That was that was later on that they discovered the empty base and everything. So like it's a hunch. That's what a, that's the thing that's that's to be noted. It is a hunch based on a pretty limited set of information. Um, I think you would have to accept that. that that's a very small amount of information to conclude that the Covenant's going to invade Reach. Not only that, that they're on Reach. That they're already on Reach and are going to be invading very soon. I suppose, but why else would they, they be why else would they be doing um, these training exercises? Here's, here's a bit of a... Do it against a other, war, like, there's a war going useless on. colonies? Well, well, no, sorry, all obviously they're killed. working yeah, for the, something bigger. No, all humans that's have it. to be killed. Even yeah, that's the issue of world building is we don't and... really know how, how big human space is, so like from the vibe of the show, it feels like human space is Earth, Reach, and then like a bunch of random basically uninhabited planets. 
They said it, something it, in along the lines of how, like, they sort of casually mentioned how, like, what was it, six or so planets got, like, destroyed or whatever? Yeah. So, we, well, we, so we actually have it, no it's clue. It's something that kind of throws a wrench into things. Um, so they're changing think, the whole MO. Th- think okay. And doing all well, these training exercises for useless Because there's a war. Well, we're, well, well, the thing is, he concludes the it's a training exercise. The war is the win. He concludes it's a training exercise when here's, here's, here's an explanation for what could have happened on Sanctuary. The Covenant had been on the planet. They were exploring the planet. They found out that humans were there and they were doing some excavation like they did in season one when they were on Madrigal before they destroyed the planet looking for Forerunner artifacts. It could just happen to be that they were in an area where there was a comms relay oh, and they took it down. So there's another one work. of those uh, artifacts that they want. Oh, well, reach. I... I, but what is that? I'm, I'm just saying that like there's reasons why they could be doing what they're doing that don't indicate that this is simply a training exercise for an invasion. They could be on Sanctuary because I got like a reason to be looking around. John Halo doesn't know. Like he, he, he just doesn't have that much information to make this conclusion. That's all I'm saying. Well, and he, he had well, also he becomes, died he was suspicious and been suspicious when by everybody AI. in power starts to deny that well, anything ever well, fucking happened. But, but that's all insane plot shit. Like that's the kind of thing. It where, is. Like, how the hell- I guess what I'm saying is like, how the hell is Kai supposed to, how the hell is she supposed to sort through the fact that apparently the UNSC is like actively working in opposition to John Halo to get him killed to create the Spartan 3 program and that that would be the rationale for the decisions when on its face, it just looks like John Halo is unhinged. And it's not like that's past him. He is unhinged. He did some unhinged shit. His, in pers- in yeah. one. His personal He's, behavior yeah. is off the rails. He a- he right. does a really good job at acting like a crazy person. It's kind of amazing. He's Which, still um, in active duty, to be honest. Considering yeah. Yeah. It's one of our, com- it's, it's one of our complaints that, uh, for the show is that there's no way that they should just let him walk around and do stuff with how he's been he said, Especially because uh, he died and his corpse was puppeted <laughs> by an AI. Yeah, when he... When he cause yeah, it's funny. It's funny that Ackerson is presented as basically saying, like, that he's the bad guy in the things that he's saying. But, like, when he says, you, so you interacted with Mackie, and that's putting it lightly. You had Cortana in your brain. You, you are not presenting me with any evidence for your claims, even though he should have the evidence. But, again, that feels like more of a plot problem than it. Unless it's a character he's problem claiming that John to see her. has a camera. Like, from Ackerson's perspective, he's just presenting things like, would, he says, if you were in my shoes, would you trust you? And it's like, that's a good fucking point. Because, no, he is not trustworthy. He's unreliable. Like, need I remind you that in season one, he he tried to melt Halsey. He, like, <laughs> locked her in a detonation room to radio, you know, and bomb her with radioactiveness so that she would melt. It's like, he's crazy. He is a crazy guy. Um, He constantly breaks the chain of command. He goes, like, he, he goes on unsanctioned missions. Um, He, he never, like, he steals brings, equipment. Like, yeah. He yeah, recruits exactly. Spartans into doing shit. He constantly bullies Riz and his, I his like, black changes. I you would go against all the people that are trying to blow up Reach. Yeah, but, but that's, that's insane. Did you know what our point is? Well, Did, were you listening the to the points that we were well, raising there? Well, well, the thing, he's the thing be, acting like a crazy person. Yes, he's acting like a crazy person. Because everyone else is ten times crazier. From Kai's, per- no, from Kai's perspective, perspective, he is acting like a really crazy oh, person, which will I'm inform her decision. Sure, whatever about Kai... Well, I'm just no, but, he's right. We're, That's no, what this no, 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 conversation no, 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 But we were talking about we were talking about like uh, what she has reason to believe, and it's like so from Kai's perspective in season three, uh, in episode three, which is basically when she decides to work with our Ackerson, It's like, well, what information do we have? We have that John Halo lied to the entire team to bring them on an unsanctioned mission. That yeah, sure, everything about it is strange, but it's like you lied. That's already not good for us. We had a training exercise earlier where Riz, despite being very injured, John Halo like irrationally pushed her to the point that she nearly died in the training exercise. True. And then of course you you included that she said he said I saw McKean. It's like well I shot her. Like so I know you that's insane. Dead it's like, you add all that. You add all that together, and the fact that Kai has absolutely no reason to believe that the UNSC and Oni would concoct such an insane plan, from her perspective, it's like, sure, there are more questions for her to ask, but, like, John Halo is unhinged. Yeah, he he could have done a way better job of achieving his goals if he truly believes what's happening is that, instead of becoming a crazy zombie. I think this massively muddies the themes of Just Follow Orders, because Kai was not just following orders in going against uh, John Halo. John Halo is her superior, 
giving her orders that she didn't believe in. She used her own brain with the information that she had available to form a conclusion. She was wrong, and she admits that she was wrong, but, like, she wasn't just following orders. It would have been just following orders to follow John Halo to the end when his rationale wasn't making sense to her. Like, this is what I mean when I say it's, like, it's it's really, like, muddy on the thematic side. And yeah. then... She's like Carl Urban in Doom. To add further yes. uh, problems to the mix, <laughs> when, you, when you think about uh, the nature of the expectation, of the expectation of the Covenant invading Reach, um, it should have been a foregone conclusion that we're going to invade Reach because in Season 1, Mackie escaped from Reach on a Covenant Phantom. So she would have, they would assume, they would have to have assumed that she told uh, the Prophets where Reach was and that it was inevitable that they would be coming there. Not that it was inevitable that they had found Reach and were doing crazy stuff and it meant that the Covenant fleet was going to be coming, but that it was inevitable they were just going to be on their way and soon. Um, and so that just creates new plot problems of like, well, the world isn't reacting and responding to this information, but that's not like a Kai problem. She's in a very unique position where there's only so much that she can do as one individual in a broader, you know, uh, machine. Like, Kai's got problems for sure, but like, I find it weird to create a dichotomy where like, she's doomed and John Halo is fine. Like, I don't, I just don't see that working at all. Okay, um... Sure. I'll, I'll give you that one. Kai had reason to believe, I guess, that the person she grew up with was insane. But... Well, well it sounds like he you had... <laughs> like, well, I mean, he had... Just he just had, had so much... They... He had so much hard evidence, I just don't... I mean, well, oh, go to all the events we just referenced, kidding? right? Like, I would be worried about him, <laughs> um, to say yeah. the least. <laughs> And yeah, the like coming up with the, these these ideas as to to explain a bunch of things that are just outside of her even reasonable worldview. Uh, yeah, he could have done a way better job of getting his certainly um, his certainly. goals. I mean, don't you think it's because interesting? Because otherwise, there wouldn't be like this retarded retarded storyline. But well, it's it's all the bodies go no. in the <laughs> It's their retarded storyline. Yeah. Okay. There. Uh, yeah. They everything's retarded. I agree. I mean, it that. makes sense. The, the, the only thing it's odd that Ackerson no basically tells her that Master Chief's what happens crazy, to right? Cobalt? And she's like, yeah. No explanation. No, I, I, I agree, but that's like a, but like, surely you would accept that that, like, why, why do you, why, why is it not of massive consequence that one, John Halo now sees dead people, which is really fucking bizarre. Um, two, that he lied to his entire team instead of telling them the truth so that they could go on a mission. Like, that's a big breach of trust that's obviously going to have an impact. Uh, and that when he he can't present any evidence, he doesn't present his camera, which I would see as more of a plot problem. But maybe it's a character problem if he's forgotten that he has a helmet camera that records things. When he shows the flight plan, and he screams, "They changed this!" Like, well, I mean, I'm look. How, no, they do. In season one, we see a helmet cam in episode one where he went to Madrigal and like retrieved the Forerunner mm -hmm. artifact, the Keystone. We see a camera. They got cameras. So in as far season as season two, camera, it's like a big, but he yeah, uninstalled one. Them. In season one, season one they, yeah, yeah, they show that they have a helmet camera. Yep. So but he was uh, gonna, he was going to go help go? the Mexican girls. So he where did they go? Is it the writers? Cam. The writers forgot the writers about forgot it. Forgot about them. Allow them to make so the I'm plot happen. Saying there aren't any cameras <laughs> because if the writers forgot them, then no, I'm saying that's yeah. a plot hole. That's a plot yeah. hole. Yeah. Um, that he has cameras, and that's evidence that he should be aware of, and that only and uh, the UNSC should be aware of and exists, and they just pretend it doesn't exist because otherwise their story wouldn't happen. That's just a plot hole. Yeah. Good old plot holes plot in hole. Halo? Yeah, no, that's crazy, isn't Which it? means they don't <laughs> exist in Season 2 because they what are do you, plot holes. I don't understand what you mean when you say, like, it doesn't exist. In, what, do you, what do you mean? A plot hole isn't a solution to the problem. It is a problem. It is a problem. The problem is, but it doesn't erase the fact that they don't exist. Well, no, but I, because they're I, I gone don't, because of the plot understand. hole. Well, what I mean is, well, the way that I would look at it is, you establish <laughs> that they have the cameras, and then you forgot about them. Not that they disappeared from the. They suits. don't do that. I, they did forget so, about what, them. What, what, what do you they mean? They did forget about them. It's a but they don't hole. ever, in any point, reference them. No, I yes, know they that's don't. What that's, what that, that's what I'm saying. That's what forgetting. I'm saying that's what the the hole is. Is that the cameras? I'm not, I'm not saying they made up. I'm so confused. <laughs> getting these things. They, it's just, I know because gone. it's a plot hole. I understand yeah. that. <laughs> all if right? it wasn't a plot hole, they would have done all those things. 
but they the writers but they, forgot but they forgot so they just don't exist in the season you, you follow them now you're um, saying they don't wait, exist I got they wait, don't wait, exist wait. because the writers forgot to put them in i understand it's just semantics like they could they could guess, come back into existing in season the three the point that, is of the distinction well so what what would the conclusion be from that then from yeah therefore from like the that you would analyze the story like what's the conclusion from a writing standpoint there that uh they were trying to create even more con or more of a reason to make john look like he's you know insane i i guess what i would say is the conclusion there is you gotta you gotta pick a poison of some kind which is either the the John Halo forgot that he had a camera for which he could present well, I mean, this evidence. Just out of curiosity, uh, I'm, all, I'm all interested in the theory at this point. So would that not apply episode to episode and scene to scene? As in, even moment to moment? As in, like, if they established they were working in episode one, but they weren't around and all referenced in episode two, couldn't I just say, yeah, that they're, they're not in episode two? Uh, mm, I no, that would well. I mean, if they don't address them at all, that would be very, 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 very strange. After episode one, but if they don't show up at all, well, I just mean kind of use the same logic you are, as in they're, they're not in episode two, but they're in episode one and three. Well, okay. like the reason why the reason why uh, Kai mistrusts John Halo is because of stuff that happened between season two and three that put her in a position where that's how she felt as a character. Because that's what we see happen, you know. That's the event that takes place. So we have to move forward from there. Okay. Yeah, you know, like because right, if. if if, if like a Jedi needs to get through a, a door that's tough and we're like why didn't he use his lightsaber and it's like they just did, they forgot he had it in that scene that still makes it a problem for that character that they didn't decide to use it you wouldn't say yeah but he doesn't have it because the writers forgot it you're like no he does have it it's there he didn't use it that's what that is now thanks to the writers fucking up and in the case of this it would be the cameras I were there just, um, I think we're just kind of viewing this um entirely differently like you're you guys are approaching it from this is the universe this is where these things exist these things do exist in this universe they should exist in this universe i'm looking at it from the perspective that if the writer doesn't put it in there well they did in season one they did in the first they season. did but if they don't in the second season yeah but like i said not. so if we go scene by scene can we make the same argument it's the same continuity how do you mean well, I mean, yeah. you if, kind of make the same argument. You, 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 if you look at it from a perspective of you can't assume that any piece of equipment exists because it's implied that it should exist. We're not even saying it should in the sense of any other thing than they told us it does. It's it's kind of like um, writing for the writers, I guess. You know, you shouldn't Im imply that something exists, or, or I mean, work I, off of I, the audience. If I. If I can throw something in here, I wonder if ER, what you're getting at is like in, with the production of season two and new showrunners, the showrunners might have decided, you know what, we're not going to do video cameras and the helmets for this one. Well, then, then you and need that to be acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a change. A change in canon or a change in continuity needs to be addressed. Yeah. Right. Because that's a huge, that's a pretty big change that would that like that's a plot affecting change that needs Listen, to be addressed M mr chief just right but i'm just wondering if of them i'm just i'm just wondering if that's a way of clarifying what er is thinking about this matter uh, well i guess that, that brings it back to this question of like well couldn't you go scene by scene then new scene uh or new episode new, you new know, director new writer yeah. for that episode, new director so i mean you could can... i think so uh, but I mean, well, I, I think I, an episode yeah. director is different than a series showrunner, right? I mean, the latter is a much more radical. I think well, I mean, I mean, is, to be uh, clear, the split between season one I mean, and two is a meta I'm, one. It isn't. I'm down like with this. I'm down split. with this. Right. You can't assume that any thing is in a scene unless it's explicitly said to be in that scene. So, like, you can't assume that Master Chief has an energy sword unless he's shown picking up the energy sword. Well, there's I'm there's I limits that. to that. Well, well, there's but, but there's, but there's we, limits to that, right? Because they, they don't have the time to explain everything that's in the scene. Can I just make the argument? I was shown that he had a camera in his suit that looks the same as the suit that he well, had in season one. Therefore, he has but a camera. I, I feel like the show understands what we're talking about only sometimes. Just like Ryan Johnson. For example, if he had come to fight Arbiter without showing us his gun had been damaged, we'd be like, where the fuck was his gun? And they knew that. Yeah, that's why I mean, they showed it damaged. Yeah, they knew to account for yeah. that. 
and then you can go even broader than that. Like they felt compelled to tell us that Madrigal got destroyed because if they didn't tell us, we would be lost. Just like, yeah. wait, why is Quine what happened? That there's an, there's a degree to which the writers understand. Well, you got to show people. I mean, it's the same as just like general filmmaking continuity, right? You need to show mm -hmm. if you're going to show a character moving in a certain direction so that a character can understand like where they're going. Or um, it feels like we're getting tied up in the same kind of conversation where someone says. We don't need to see them drive to a location, you know, to know that yeah. they got to that location. It feels the same here of like, well, if you show me a camera once in a in a suit and that's the same suit and it's the same yeah, continuity, wanna... regardless of what season it is. To be able to benefit from the continuity of season one, which this season does, they have to also take everything from season one. They can't pick and choose. Exactly. And 99% like, of the things there's... that are implied to exist logically, we would agree on. There is a there's a actually a very, very thick line of agreement that we can all, you know, accept to the point where we Definitely. don't even think about it or talk about it. Whether it's internal organs, pants, underwear, you know, adjacent rooms, ceilings, you know, pieces of furniture, well, I, like all that stuff is implied to be there and there's no there's never even any discussion about it because it's accepted so easily and logically. Well, and I think this is especially criticizable because it would have been brought in as a thing to help them achieve something else at the time, and now it's being ignored yes. to they, prevent plot yeah, relevance. I, I agree that it's a problem. It They should have had just had a line that said that Oni destroyed the evidence at some point. Uh... I mean, yeah, well, I Oni disabled the cameras on the well, on the I suits. Guess that's the yeah, thing, is that that, that's that one way to handle create, it. Yeah. I, the thing is, so, I'd say that creates new problems for them because then John would be like, "Why do I not have my camera here, Kai? Well, we, I don't have my camera here." That, yeah, but they can, they can, they can, they can, you write, can write that off. Yeah, right. you say, say John, you forgot yeah, to turn yeah, your camera on. You can do that. I, I, you you can say that the camera systems have to be. It's a solvable problem, but obviously they didn't like the software is fucked on the cameras or something. You can make something up, right? You can come up with something that's more. I guess what I'm saying is that you will create changes because I imagine that would be a piece of information where Kai would go, "Hmm, that's weird." And that is that a hum. Well, yeah. so that, I actually think that would be good in terms of giving her reason to start to investigate, you know? That's a little suspicious. Yeah. That's a little strange. Yeah. And you could have made it way stronger. Not having stronger. a pothole, remove yeah. cameras. And then, you know, I, and then she, well, when he's trying to convince her, if he was well written, he could be like, you really think all of our cameras just happen to have software glitches? Is that what you think? Yeah, exactly. It's, um, th th there are definitely ways to get it, to fix it, but... This is kind of what I mean, is like the show, the way that it is right now, it's like, well, that's just a big problem. And like, in the absence of solving a lot of these problems, you end up making it so that your theme gets very confused. Because like, I just don't see how Kai being the just follow orders person, like it doesn't really work well when she has reasons that she came to conclude using her own brain to uh, make the decisions that she did. To be well, like, you're the one who just follows orders, not like me who demands that you follow me no matter what, because we grew up together. Like, that's not- She didn't just like follow orders people. though. She was ordered to- say something about the chief and she knowingly lied about it to cover for his insanity exactly that's why i think it i, I think it doesn't work to be like yeah you're the just follow orders lady not like me who demands your loyalty <laughs> to me yeah uh, right, unquestionably yeah. like john halo it's it's weird as well because john halo seems to recognize that he kind of did that with riz by just pushing her to beyond her limits that he was just making her follow orders as well but at the same time he doesn't seem to recognize how he's done that in other ways because John Halo is a dumb person. Like, John Halo is a dumb dumb. The fact that he got it right is not a consequence of, like, some really intelligent, thoughtful yeah. decision-making. Like, You was... shouldn't justify insanity just because the person is right. It's, yeah, like, it's... Well, yeah, it's, that's, it's just, a, that's like, a post hoc sort of thing. Like, like we're getting John Halo would have also been right if he grabbed a gun and just started shooting everybody that, that was in Oni to try to solve the problem. But that wouldn't have been a justified decision yeah, if, on his part. If you reach if you reach the correct conclusion through shoddy, you know, reasoning, you can't be like, well, see, I was right all along. You know, that's I think um, not quite how it works. Something I would want to say about John Halo, because I think it is the most frustrating aspect about him from a writing standpoint, is um my my big problem with John Halo is essentially they've made him insane because it means that they can do whatever they want. Any crazy decision he makes anything that creates new drama because he goes over the top and does something stupid or yells at someone, uh, puts puts across his argument in the most stupid way possible, you can always appeal to, yeah, but he's an unhinged lunatic discovering his emotions. So, you know, it's just like an easy shortcut to any drama that they want and any plot point that they want because he's so unpredictable in a sense. Um, it's, yeah. it's boring, it's lazy. Uh, we, we were, I, we were I talking about during the viewing that a lot of the decisions seem to just hinge on how can we get the next scene to happen? Uh, yeah, pretty much. And you can see it with a lot of other things as well, because, like, we've not spoken much about Atkinson, but, like, I, I, 
Atkinson's a bit of a dum dum, um, not just because of his reach plan being insane, uh, but like it's even down to things like um, why would Atkinson be antagonistic to John Halo in his first conversation when it's actively against his interest to have John Halo opposed to him dramatically? That doesn't help him. Yeah, it doesn't get like, him anywhere. It may well be that John Halo actually did discover things that would fuck him over by getting him so aggressive. But like, why would you say in your first scene, you know, like, oh, well, you know, you, you, like, would you trust you? You're a bit of a crazy guy. And it's like, well, that's stupid. And it's the same with Parangoski. Why did she confront John Halo about just follow orders, you idiot? It's like, why do you think this would work? Why would you do this other than to prompt him to become uh, opposed to you so that he can kick off his new plot line of not trusting you? When you start to view it through the lens of, yeah, well, where do you want to get us? Which is very transparent in this show. Kind of, it's it's just like, fuck, it becomes so obvious why any character makes any decision in any scene or says something stupid uh, or acts in a way that's contrary to their interests. It's like, well, that advances the plot. I really didn't like that Ackerson was supposed to be this, like, sympathetic villain towards the end, too, where it's like, actually, he was being fucked over one tier up, so, but... Because when you introduce that logic, then it goes, okay, so who's fucking with Parangoski then? No, she's just, she's the bad guy. That's, okay, so that's, she that's, that's, that's where the line stops? The, the buck ends her. there? Yeah. Well, yes, she's I at think. the top of the hierarchy, I think, right? I mean, I don't that's what sure I say. anybody. Brilliant Atkinson military and... commander, of course. Well, it's, it's but weird. We had... on, the one, on the one hand, they acknowledge that Ackerson is not actually her subordinate, but they do basically heavily imply that he basically followed her. Like, he did what she told him to do. That, that the reach thing was ultimately her plan. Yeah, so I just, I don't understand what the kind of, what, what they're trying to extract from that. Like, why is Ackerson joining Team Halo at the end of this season? Um, because he- Drama? Was, it was basically because Parangoski was like, let's use World War One wave tactics with the Spartan Threes. That's what throws him off. <laughs> he doesn't want the Spartan Threes to die in World War One era, just throw <laughs> them at the enemy with no strategy or coordination at and all. And it's almost like I mean, why not? They throwing. made him, they made the Spartan- they made the Spartan threes in like a week. Why not use them like that? They did that? make them in a week. That's true. But he was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's where the, to emphasize the nature of the wave tactics, guys, what happens is they get the Spartan threes to go towards the big covenant fleet. And as soon as they like get there, they blow them up. And then she's like, all right, deploy wave two. It was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they literally didn't even get onto any ships. All right. And then she's just like, yeah, wave two. It's, it's literally like a no man's land. Yeah, all right, wave two, off you go. It's insane. Which is weird it's because, fun. like, we talk about this. I, I think we talked about this on an EFAP or something, but there is an element that a lot of, um, like, military fiction is very weird with and odd with. But you can sort of look at the real world and you can see these very clear patterns throughout history of investing time and effort and equipment and uh, like effort into the well-being of your soldiers just gets you better results it should be clarified for the chatters that i'm talking about how the spartan threes are made in a week in the show yes you wouldn't oh, want yeah. to throw in them the show, away the in up. the lore but in the show it's literally the people that escaped reach are turned into spartan threes which was ODSTs. like days yeah, ago Ruiz is uh mm -hmm. is just like a spartan three now and i'm thinking like yeah, what? so basically the logic mean? of Spartan 4s applied to the Spartan 3s. Yeah, we don't even see like much of any of like the experience she must have gone through to become one. She just is one. You're like, well, okay. She just is one. She's got the armor now. They did about a week of training because it is about a week between uh, the Fall of Reach and uh, when we get to Onyx. It's about a week. Like, if that. It, it, yeah, it might even be less than that. And it's like, and remember, these are like weird simulations that don't even comport with reality that well. Uh, like a plasma it's, ramp it's not even physical it. training it's the vr it's, yeah it's, it's like simulation it's like yeah. getting all your soldiers to play call of duty to like train them it's like okay you're ready well, to see, actually fight see, a war now a, guys bye they did that in the 343 halo where they said all the spartan fours were training in vr simulations and that was the multiplayer Again, i think it does, but it's oh, just right, dumb. Yeah. Awkward, like that it is just more of like man that feels like a bit of a parallel to I oh, damn, I think it might have been did you once say, Patricia, that you thought that it might be that 343 hates ODSTs? Like yes, say, I, I I've <laughs> I've thought that for a long time. I think that 343 is somewhat envious of the game ODST being more popular than <laughs> most of theirs. Well yeah, there's we've not supposed seen to be the single, cool ones. Yeah. We've not seen a single orbital drop shock trooper in uh both seasons of the show. That we have never seen an ODST, and like I said, the spawn threes are basically they're worse ODSTs. They don't have any augmentations. 
they have regular armor that doesn't have shielding because it has to be light enough for them to wear it. And they have less training than an ODST because ODSTs are special forces. Um, the Spartan 3s are like just worse ODSTs. They just play uh, video games and then get thrown at ships. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> like it's... Which doesn't again... Like, I know we we could talk about it like... And we talked about it ages in the last... Uh, when we did season one, but like... There's there's so many easy ideas for a show of just... You could have a show that's just about a squad of orbital drop shock troopers. And then like Master Chief occasionally comes in and out of their story. Or it could be that ODSTs are like a POV character... Uh, you have, like, a POV ODST character in a squad as, like, a subplot. And it's just like, yeah, that's some variety. It'll be fun. Nobody will be unhappy. Everybody will be happy who's watching the show to see ODSTs. But they just, like, forego all of these opportunities that are just basically really easy I, to, to get I points I think for. they're out of touch. They overestimate how much players like Spartans and underestimate how much players like ODSTs. Because I, I feel so. like... Spartans are too complicated a concept for people to mentally insert into. Now, whereas now. ODSTs are like, yeah, if I was in this setting, I could be an ODST. You well, can't yeah, necessarily be a Spartan. Yeah. Well, right. it's, it's, so, you think about ODST and the banter between the squad, it's like, ah, yeah, it's like a, it's a group of friends, you know, in, a, in yeah. the middle of a war, like working together against all odds. Yeah, there's this camaraderie that comes with, you know, the Marines and the ODSTs and um, and, and it just it doesn't exist in this show. It's just not present at all. It is this weird reliance on no, no, no. Spartans are the cool ones, guys. See, we made even more of them. Look, someone uh, there's even more. Someone in chat mentioned uh, the ODST trailer that they did, the live action one. We don't even need to begin to talk about how Remember Reach or the We yeah. Are ODST like trailers that are a minute long. Uh, more impactful and riveting and interesting than 17 episodes of television all right we don't need to yeah. we don't need to delve into that okay it's it's very self-evident but also kind of fascinating isn't it oh yeah the believe stuff from halo 3 the yeah. there was a lot of halo's made a lot show. of really good commercials <laughs> and ads and promotional material um it's just your commercials are better than the television show they have better stories like, down to the fact that the uh, ODST captain would bring a flag with him, an ODST flag, and stuff it under his armor, because that was the best way that he could, you know, honor the dead while in the middle of a war zone. It's like, that's, that's like, more subtle and more interesting character writing than basically anything we've seen in these two seasons. There'd be, there's a whole series of commercials for Halo 3 that was set up to be years and years after that they'd be talking to like middle and old aged men um and it was set up to be that they were marines fighting in the events of what would be halo 3 and these like interviews and they would be talking about like the master chief not explicitly but you know they were talking about master chief and that would just be the commercial it was just like a interviewing an old marine you know tell us about what happened and that would be the commercial the for the events of what halo 3 would be and it was just good. It was subtle. It was, you know, it was just, it was just good. And this is just very insistent that no, this Halo story is the good one. Spartans are very cool. Master John Halo, man, he is amazing. What's the obsession with turning them into superheroes and and, and also creating their own cringe? Because no, does anybody like the Spartan Fours? Is anybody a fan of them and how, and like Spartan Ops and their personalities? I've seen people say they like them, but I generally don't believe them. One of the oh. most cathartic moments of Halo Infinite is when you find dead Spartan 4s, or like they kill them off screen. It's Damn. a grimly dark sort of thing of like, I oh, yeah, put a smile on my face. <laughs> well, the Spartan 4s were just tacitly a mistake. That was like one of the first mistakes 343 made with the setting, was they wanted a new wave of Spartans. You know, I will say as well, something that uh, I think is a big mistake that I almost feel like is kind of glossed over. Do you remember in the Spartan Ops cutscene how, like, there's a Covenant, uh, like, uh, Corvette carrier, like, that's that's fighting in space, and then uh, Infinity comes out of slip space and just flies through it and blows it up? I feel like that's, like, really indicative of, of like, a, a big problem that started to happen. It's like, that's kind of crap, though, isn't it? that the way that it started was that the Covenant were so oppressive as an enemy force that um, they were very, very scary and difficult to beat to like, well, four years later, the humanities build a ship so big that it can just plow through a Covenant carrier like it's nothing. And that just kind of ruined the stakes a bit. 
like for, for yeah school, which meant that they work. had to they had to implement new like extremely esoteric threats like the didact in order to yeah. try right. to keep the same like uh oh, threat like, what level was the name? The warden eternal in halo 5 yeah. god oh yeah i want to fight him seven times that's real fun Dude, Halo 5 existed. The t one of the TLJs before TLJ chat. All right. Like it it's, was. it's the one I haven't played. Damn, Actually, I, I like never Boris finished it because it was so I, boring. Yeah. It's I, funny. I don't, I don't like the Prometheans long. as an enemy. <laughs> no, the Prometheans were awful. Yeah, never played it. Well, yeah, I never the Prometheans were a, a bad idea. The fact that, like, I, it, like, uh, we don't need to be, look, all right. <laughs> we don't need to be. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the, the, the whole thing of it is. There didn't need to be a new Halo trilogy, just like there really didn't need to be a Halo TV show. It's something that just people like wanted. New Star Wars tril a new sequel trilogy. Yeah. Just like there didn't need mm. to be uh, Terminator Dark Fate, just like there didn't need to be Star Trek Discovery, or just like there didn't need to be. These like, stories were concluded, and in the process of unconcluding a story, you're just going to fuck things up. Oh, it, yeah. It Definitely. is, we know now, it is rare that you have success. Because I would actually stand by saying that, you know, Alien doesn't need a sequel. But then they made Aliens, and it was like, oh, cool. Damn, like, that's <laughs> arguably, arguably better. It depends on who you ask, like, shit. Yeah, and, and but so that Terminator, we have... You know? Yeah, Terminator is another actually really strong, solid example. There's a lot of Terminator fans who would say Terminator 1 is one and done. It's it's golden. You don't need to touch anything else. But it's like, yeah, but I like Terminator 2. Oh, okay. I mean, if we're going to use the Star Wars example, you know? One could argue Star Wars could have worked with one movie, yeah. Um, Predator, even though I dislike a lot of the Predator sequels, <laughs> like, but at the same time, you know, I, I have a fondness for Predator too to some extent. I it's just it's just interesting to think because that's just all a different era. It's it, all those examples are so far gone, so far away. I suppose what's funny is we were talking about the um, the the nature of like the faithfulness because Arcane uh, is like very famously just. You you would never know what you're in for by being like I'll play the game version of Arcane, like that's uh, not even mm -hmm. really lol at all. Then you have something like but The yeah. Last of Us TV show that's like it takes it stays on the rails but goes off every once in a while. Uh, and it's it's like parallel rails because uh, Joel isn't quite Joel, Ellie isn't quite Ellie, but that like it's close enough and there's a lot of big payoffs that they just take one for one. And adapted pretty like close we've got all these um, examples of like different levels of faithfulness and different executions and different expectations but um halo is funnily enough one that i think is just such a startlingly fucking abysmal attempt in I almost think, every um, way you could imagine we've talked about it before and i'd want to reiterate it because i it feels like um there are some very distinct eras of video game adaptations. The one that we were in for, I guess, like 20 or so years was um, they were very embarrassed to even be like video game adaptations. They didn't recognize how much people value video games. They didn't recognize how popular they were. And so you saw a lot of adaptations that were in-name only, but were so different that they yeah. could often be like completely unrecognizable. Unrecognizable to the point that they barely even had any of the iconography or the music or anything. And like what we've seen, especially over the last few years, and it feels like Sonic the Hedgehog kind of marks the beginning of this era, funnily enough, that you begin yeah. with that film being very obviously of the old era of they were, they didn't even think it would be worthwhile to make Sonic look like Sonic. And then they realize, yeah. oh, that's a bad idea. It's a good idea to make him look like Sonic. And then you see that transition. Now, obviously, it means that that film still kind of is in both worlds. I feel like the new Mortal Kombat was kind of in a similar place as well of sort of being in both worlds of like, well, the characters kind of look like the characters, but there are still changes. Like the fact that you have that insert character because they felt yeah. that they couldn't have it be like Johnny Cage or anything. But now we're firmly in the era of, at the very least, they're going to look like the thing that you recognize. Um, they're probably going to sound like the thing that you recognize. And fingers crossed, you're actually going to start to capture the spirit of the games because they're no longer embarrassed about doing video game adaptations. Not only are they not embarrassed, they finally realize there is so much money to be made in doing it, uh, and you lose nothing by trying to, at the very least, get the surface level things right. And so then you can see it reflected in um, I've only seen the first episode of Fallout, didn't really like it, uh, but like it certainly looks like Fallout in a, in a lot of ways. Um, 
obviously like the mario movie definitely trying to capture the art style like sonic the hedgehog 2 felt like it was moving more in that well, direction know, I, on the yeah. note of mortal kombat specifically right like uh capturing the spirit i, I would argue is the number one thing that all fans actually want it's just that we i think it's and this is reasonable we'd all slightly disagree on what capturing the spirit of a particular ip even is um the nature yeah. with the uh, mortal kombat like having that main character was just like what the fuck are you doing like this is mortal kombat if anything goofy, we would have been happy if kano were the main character instead of that guy exactly even though it doesn't make sense guy. from like a fan's point of view but the fact that we've got carl urban johnny cage is going to be in the next one like oh god that yeah. could work so well it could also fail but yeah. that could work so well exactly mm. um and it's like they're starting to realize that and then you see a whole bunch of permutations of uh what it means to be faithful because even though we're saying like arcane uh you know if you looked at league of legends it would be it'd be like wow okay that seems different but it's like yeah but they're still they got the characters they've got things that they carried over like references and nods and and pulling from the world building and clearly coming from a place of respect and what you see with halo very much feels like the end of the last era slightly bleeding into the new one yeah of, like they haven't have got the message yet Pretty much, like, you've got the suits of armor, you've got, like, uh, assault rifles and battle rifles, and you've got grunts and elites and stuff like that. You've barely gotten the surface-level thing in, in certain scenes that make it look like Halo, but you are, you don't give a fuck, you don't respect it, you don't value it's, it at all. It's a vehicle for you to tell your own story, because you're embarrassed that it's a video game. Yeah, it's the caring without caring, in that mm -hmm. there are some people, you could tell some people care, but they seem to be in the minority. Um, I think yeah. it, probably the great microcosm of all of this is that the show knows that we should have battle rifles. We need to have battle rifles that look like battle rifles with the scopes and the, you know, the carry handle sort of design they have going. They know to have the battle rifles, to have them prominently. They're automatic rifles in the show, though. They're not <laughs> three-round burst. So yeah. it's one of those, like, you knew to do everything except like the most iconic thing about them or you just passed it off to the person like all the prop guys really gave a shit but then when they passed it off to the director and the vfx people and everything they didn't oh. it didn't get translated yeah. into it being a a burst fire weapon i gotta say if you watch the behind the scenes stuff talking about making the show it's a little grim because the prop guys and and like there are a lot of people on the crew who put there was there was a clip where a guy was talking about he he put more thought into explaining why Soren's son Kessler's like Master Chief helmet, the way that he created it, than was put into the writing of the show. He's like, yeah, so this is like a this is based on a pilot's helmet in the show, uh, and they're orange, so we needed to have like an orange hue coming through, even though it was painted green. It's like, dude, like look at all this effort that you're putting into like creating all of these props and making all the guns shit. and stuff that look yeah. great. And it's How like, did, who left this man on set? <laughs> get him out of here. How did you exactly. get in here? <laughs> it's, it's like, there's a lot of work that clearly goes into it. All lever but, but like, if the script failed you, th there's, it, that's it. Like, that's, that's it. You know, you can appreciate all of the work that goes into the props and the sets and the effort, even though a lot of the visual effects are really wonky, that obviously a lot of time <laughs> got put into it. But it's like, yeah, your core is soulless. Um, there is, and, and a really good... If they had, if we had this level of writing, stories, and characters, but it was in a show that had a lot uh, that was just dripping with good references from the games. We had a lot of variety in terms of the way that the aliens looked, the weapons that they used. We had accurate sound effects to the games. If it was like dressed to the nines in all of that stuff, and then on top of that, just the fight scenes were well choreographed and shot really well and shot interesting. And the first person view on the, uh, on like the helmet was really well done. It would buy so much goodwill Absolutely. to the show, even if the show was written as shittily as it is. But they you know, couldn't even get the, you know, like the aesthetic and the flavor stuff. Almost like know, they gonna... just refused to do it is what it is. It's a refusal to do it because they could have just done it. All the games are right there. It's all for the taking. You have the rights to it. You just chose not to use it. You it know, was it seems a choice. Like a, a clear example of refusing to even use it. The soundtrack. I cannot believe. I can't believe That's that bizarre. the music in this show is what it is. It's I can't so believe that. Forgettable. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Oh yeah, there was music. I can barely remember the title theme, and I heard it too many times. No, it's uh it's crazy to me that you have 
You know, I gush over it all the time. I'm going to do it again. I love uh, the soundtracks that Marty O'Donnell composed for Halo. They're awesome. They're like some of my favorite tracks in general, not just for video games, but in general. I love it. I love the tone that's conveyed. I love the disparate nature of the music, yet how it somehow manages to have a level of consistency and, and a unified vision. Um, I love the chill tracks. I love the epic tracks, the ambient tracks. Uh, I love the motifs that get carried throughout the games. Halo 3 being like sort of a best of compilation of all of the songs the fact that odst manages to create a very distinctive feel for itself with all of its jazz saxophone like lots of emphasis on piano uh halo reach creating an own its own identity for itself its own kind of like iconic uh choir and monks uh even though it's a different thing and it's awesome and it's like you could have just you could have just taken the tracks and just plopped them in you know the timeline like while they were editing it together and it would have been fine but it's almost like there was this refusal to not even like it has to be the most generic uh sci-fi tv show music imaginable there is not there's not a single memorable track across all two seasons yeah there isn't literally isn't i can't remember any of the halo of, of like whenever they occasionally feel like using a halo song which is fucking rare that they even like use a halo song i think maybe i think there may be four or five instances of them actually using like halo music and it's always a terrible maybe, mix yeah. It's, um, there's yeah. very little resemblance to the the game scores that's for sure and that includes season one and this yep. the music for season one was done by sean callery who is famous for 24. his work scoring 24 which and i'm a i'm a I'm a huge yeah. fan of his work. I think I thought he did an excellent job with 24, but I have to admit that his style doesn't really fit Halo. And there, no, there's I, there's I, certainly no kind of memorable melodies that were built by Sean Callery or this new uh, crew that's working well, on season so, two. Like the Bear McCreary did the theme and then the title, he had yeah. his production team do the sort of generic score episode to mm -hmm. episode. Yep. Um, well, so yeah, uh, and we, you, just none of it the, is uh, resembles the games. You see it in the EFAP TV when it eventually comes out. When we were watching, uh, like episode one has um, it has like so. What you'll notice is season one and two actually have a different intro music. Um, the intro music in season one is basically unrecognizable as being inspired by Halo, aside from essentially like the most basic. Uh, da, like a couple da, of pieces da, of melody, da, da, da. and then it well, does you got to remember they don't even have the proper like monks. They don't have the same choir. It's like that Halo Four choir where it's like a different. It's just a totally different sound. It's different, um, yeah. With its own little theme, where they're like, bwam, 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 bwam. that's like their theme for the show, and it sucks. Uh, or rather, yeah. it doesn't suck. It's just lame. That would be the better way to put it. Season two, they actually like do the Halo Two. Uh, rendition of the Halo theme where they've got like the higher uh, vocals coming in midway but the problem is that because it's rushed and condensed it doesn't sound as good you've condensed something that lasts maybe like 40 seconds into 15-20 seconds and it messes with the composition and then it just goes back into being more generic like Halo music um, or like a generic right. um, a generic uh, rendition of the Halo music it really it bugs me so much because Halo's got so many cool tracks and it's so like it's easy. Cool yeah. It's so easy. Like, and it would be so epic, you know. Like, if you used any of that, could you? And 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 I just don't see how do you? You would earn. It maybe would piss people off, but if you just use the epilogue music from our Halo Reach, like after Vanek got killed, that people would probably like that a lot. Um, yeah, they'd probably be like, "That's a cool callback. It's a great song." And it's just like that's easy. You could just plop it in there, and people would like it. Well, and you think um, they'd like, have a custom track for the final fight with? Uh, chief and officer you, you, you think, think they would yeah and you think, you think it would like play a, into the scene huge before the fight starts like the music would be booming just before we get into well, it i mean i can imagine just using like unyielding from halo 2 like just use that as like the fight music people would probably think that was cool as shit uh but instead they decided not to do that it's just like i i just don't get it it's easy it's easy and it, it, it requires like less work <laughs> like, <back> down, I, just, <laughs> I don't get it it's it's whereas uh i i definitely got the impression in season one i will say i feel like in season two i even got less of an impression of the music oddly enough uh season one had like some very mass effect kind of like knockoff mass effect sounding music uh i noticed that a little bit more in season two as well kind of like um more synthy uh like more of like the kind of synth that you would hear in like uncharted worlds um right but not as good because uncharted like the, worlds is like a well, it's 
it's interesting that you bring up that song specifically because I think I mentioned it to you and you called it before I even was able to say the yeah. name specifically, but we were playing Helldivers 2 <laughs> and the mission select music on Helldivers 2. I was like, Fringy, what music does this remind you of? And you're like, oh yeah, Uncharted <laughs> Worlds. So it's like, yeah, this is clear. I think that this was like inspired by it in a way that's distinctly different, but still kind of harkens back to it. That's and fun. so that's sort of like the inverse of taking something and using it as inspiration. Whereas there is, well, let's put it this way. Rings of Power soundtrack is more like memorable than this. It is more memorable than this. And Rings of Power remember, is barely memorable. I as remember a, a couple of tracks from Rings of Power, a couple. <laughs> as a fun fact, uh, there's a song in ODST's soundtrack that isn't in the album version that also sounds like Uncharted Worlds. Um, mm, you hear it in Firefight. I would if okay. I heard it, I would know what you mean. If I if I heard it, um, if you know what it is, uh, put a link in here because I bet if I heard it, I would know what you mean. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but I'll try to find it. Okay, I gotcha. It's um, uh, there's there's so many good tracks and 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 it's it's not a matter of yeah, but they wouldn't fit. It's like dude, they, they, it's like they cover basically anything that you could want. There's a immense well, like covered in dance, you know, that's like a funky track. Well, it's like that kind of thing. Yeah, what you said there. Here By saying the Halo music wouldn't fit our Halo show, already yeah. you're like, well, wait, wait, what? Isn't that yeah. already like, isn't that the, the big yellow, potentially red flag that goes yellow up? Yellow flag. Like, why? <laughs> like what, what do you mean? The, the, the incredible, memorable, arguably best soundtrack of a video game series ever in history so far. It's not fitting the, you know, the, the show adaptation of it? How could, how could that be? <laughs> That's an interesting thing to think about for as much as it would be easy to incorporate a lot of the music in there. The reality is that it wouldn't be achieving the, the purpose of what that music did and what music is supposed to achieve, which is it, it accentuates the moment as it is and makes that moment memorable and uh, to a place where the music can be intertwined with that memory rather mm -hmm. than you hear it and you think of the thing that you like. Uh, like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that reminds me of that, that, that moment in Halo that I really liked. Uh, like if it was like this is the hour, for instance, and they played it here, I, I'd just immediately be thinking about the actual scene in like Halo Three, where all of the right. ships are flying in, uh, like to the uh, to the excavation site on Earth, like the portal to the Ark. I'd be thinking of that, or if they had "Wake Me When You Need Me," whatever the context would be for that, I'd just be thinking about the ending of Halo Three, um, or like if I was thinking about. Um, uh, Damn it, I can't believe that it's escaping me right now. Oh, under cover of night. Like it's uh, you know, I'd just be thinking of uh I'd just be thinking of the level. It's just like, yep, that's unfortunate. But you've Isn't that what you want though in an adaptation? I guess what I'm getting at is that um in a good adaptation, you would be able to be happy that it exists as a great track what? that reminds you of the thing that you love, but also that it could be now attached to a new memory rather than you see it and then you're like oh shit, that just makes me think of this other thing that I like. But at the same time, I don't see that you lose anything by just having these tracks in the show if you, I, wherever they can fit. I would mention um, Eric Nyland's Halo novels. Uh, having played the games, the games are similar to the visual storytelling that he does in his writing. And so having played the games, you get kind of a reference to know what he's talking about, and then you can kind of build on that in your understanding of it. And I think that's an example of an adaptation where referencing the thing that it's adapting builds po uh, positive associations and has it yeah oh yeah I think absolutely so. by playing totally the games and then that. reading the books was it it was like yes this is the kind of book that it's what we it's a book series that we reference a decent amount not just for you know good you know good books to read that are you know, science fiction but like video game yeah. themed kind it's, of it's, actiony books they're just it's really good cool. young adult military science fiction it's not something that I think really stands up to like, oh, yeah, I'm in my 30s and I'm going to read this. But I do think that like if you want to get young people into it and they were into Halo, then those would be good books to get them into. Yeah, I think if you're a legit fan of Halo, the books do the, the books are a good, you know, they do them justice in a way. Um, they offer a different but very clearly Halo experience, obviously and in a different medium. The games don't rely on the books and the books really don't rely on the games either. That's true. You could read. The they books work together, on their but own. they are yeah. standalone. Which is different to what happened on the three four three, where like reading the books became essential, required uh, homework to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you if you jumped into Halo Five without reading like Halo Escalation or any of these books, it's like yeah, good luck. Like, That's weird too, because the first five Halos they did not have complicated stories. 
They no, were not like you don't have to you don't have to bring up the cork board with the lines and the yarn and the thing. It's just no, it's just <laughs> well, they're well um, executed, fairly simple ideas that are just they're just done well. I think uh, I think the the strength of the games was it's it's you think of it like an iceberg, right? Of on its face, it presents a really entertaining, straightforward, fun story, but that there's a lot that you can extract from just the world building, the environment design, the music. Uh, yeah. a desire to look into things further, terminals and things like that, that there was just like, it was clear that there was a lot under the surface that was supporting this. And you could kind of go in whatever direction you wanted in terms of how much that meant to you or how much that mattered. Uh, and, and that's like a good way to make something that's really accessible, but also has like a lot to uh, delve into for people who are really interested rather than being in a place where you have to be immersed in it so much to the detriment or the exclusion of other stories, other media. It's the, um, the gameplay of Halo is more than just... Uh, it's one of the reasons why it lingers so much in people's consciousness is that, yeah, like, there, there's been plenty of really fun shooters over the years. There, there are very, very many fun shooters. But it's the shooting element that helps to... You know, it, it, it's got the characters, you know, them being distinct. It's got the world and the designs of everything. It's all... It all goes together, and there's other elements that aren't necessarily the, uh, aren't necessarily the gameplay. Those are the those are the reasons why we're talking about it, you know, twenty years after the fact. Well, that's a sad mm. fate for Halo is that it seems to just be fading away, slowly stripped away of everything. Very Star Wars ish. I think, I think it's just a victim of the uh, streaming gold rush, where every yeah. media company was trying to set up a streaming service and get as many IPs as they could on their exclusive service, and so they just we get? rubber stamped a Halo show, and then this is what this is the output product i don't think paramount particularly cared very much about the quality of what they were making or what they're it, what they were having made it's it's interesting that you say that because uh this show went through development hell it was announced in 2013 by steven spielberg at the xbox one reveal is this that's this, where is this, this tied to this project yes steven spielberg is uh executive amblin entertainment production yeah, yeah that's right steven oh, spielberg Jesus. is attached to the show in some capacity so it actually took them over, and it was meant to be on Showtime uh, before it uh, ended up shifting to Paramount Plus. I think that was uh, COVID, I. Uh, so happening. I thought the Steven Spielberg thing had just like died in production hell, and this nope, was something that's different. This. this is it. This is the. This is the product of that. How do you work on something like this for a decade and come out <laughs> uh, with this? I I do. I will say I kind of find it funny that the the kind of like the end point of the destruct, even though you know it's like you said, it's kind of fading away, but. What feels like kind of a culmination of the destruction of Halo began at the event that destroyed Xbox's uh like reputation in a way that they still haven't recovered from. I feel this feels like there's something poetic there. It's sort of yeah. applicable. It's not just awful entries that destroy everything. It's also mediocre shit that you know some people think is fine or good enough. Like uh, any franchise that used to be on top. I was talking about this with um, Alien, Predator, Terminator, Jurassic Park. All of these franchises that we're starting to enter an era. It seems. With Romulus, uh, Frozen Empire, even fucking whatever happens with Jurassic as an IP next, and probably with the next Terminator, where they'll do the safest thing possible, kind of okay-ish, but kind of badly, and that that's its fate. It's going to become a consumable like vending machine franchise that you, every once in a while you just pop it out and go, yeah, and then it's like, crazy how long this is. You know, like Simpsons? <laughs> it's just like around. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you understand what this used to be at one point? Does anyone? You know, we're the old people in the fucking rocking chairs. Like, back in my day, it was actually good. And it's like, it is good. Well, it's like, no, it used to be fucking great. An old man is talking. That's uh... <laughs> I know that <laughs> reference. Well, that's the thing, and, right? And like, meanwhile, we live in the universe where we had the turnip tree with the turnip juice for our lemonade. It's, it's, Turn, it's, it's an um... alternative thing to the like TLJs. That's a different f sector. It's like these other things where you're just like, oh, I guess that came out and now it's had this effect on... Because, you know, like, Infinite wasn't... Um... Wasn't like the TLJ of Halo or anything, was it? It was just it just sort no, of no, no. disappeared. Well, as much as I say that uh, Halo Five is the TLJ of Halo, it's like well, on a campaign front, sure, but like you know, multiplayer was fun, and it's kind of the interesting thing with like Halo is it's almost like it takes a few months for it to sort of settle into the conclusions about it, and every time it's not been like a complete, absolute, like one hundred percent through and through disaster. It's always just been there's been a lot that's like to be said that's wrong with it. Um, and it's almost like, uh, it, because it takes so long to catch up, it's like 343 can never learn the right lesson just in time. 
Uh, Halo 4, they got a lot of smoke blown up their ass by the gaming press for Halo 4, despite the fact that uh, multiplayer died very quickly. Uh, MCC was pretty was, miserable. MCC, obviously, massive disaster. That was just a clear failure. But even then, it's like a failure tinged with, yeah, but these are games that you like. Uh, Halo 5, uh, you know, it had, like, its, it's, certain, its campaign sucked. Multiplayer was really fun, but it was a very different kind of experience than what most people would have wanted from Halo. And obviously, Infinite's problems are pretty well known. Like, like, that's yeah, a game mostly, really yeah, it was like mostly solid base gameplay, but everything surrounding it was bad. So, and then it it, it did not arrive complete. It you didn't gotta recover stop fucking enough. doing that. You can't do that mm -hmm. anymore. It's just if you oof, hopefully, lesson were learned. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. But uh, but yeah, now it leaves Halo like. And with this show, it's like there there is a level to which the destruction is complete, but at the same time, the series is gonna continue. As for whether Probably, this show continues, yeah. is the question the show, mark for sure. We'll I see. hope not. I hope it just ends and dies here. Um, I hope, I it hope ends. that they. I mean, ideally, what they do is another game comes out. They actually like release it as a finished fucking product. They don't have twenty dollar white armor skins and bullshit like that. Yeah. Hopefully, like hopefully it'll be like the Hell Divers teaches everyone a you lesson. Need too. Oh, well, yeah. and, um, it's funny you one. brought that up because I was going to bring up Hell Divers. The Halo fans were very much trying to make Hell Divers kind of about them, yeah. and it's that was not. that was kind of just like the final blow for me, where it's like, I don't think I could you ever call myself a Halo fan to... again. Like. Yeah, I, I think it's just it's Hell Divers' time now. Like Halo died. It, Halo it, needs to. Just... It needs to have the la It needs to have a hurrah, or it will be done. Halo. There is yeah. still clearly there is interest in Halo. There I don't is... think there's a team that can bring it back, though. Is the problem? That's the that's the thing. I, like, I, what do you do? Who do you? And who do I you honest, give it to? I honestly don't even know if there's actually that much interest in it, in in bringing it back. When... Uh, I think that Microsoft is uh, Microsoft is very attached to Halo. They they've said frequently that they essentially believe that Halo is like really important in terms of maintaining Xbox. But maybe that's the delusion. Maybe Xbox needs it to get is. to a place where they can refresh and have new things that people get excited about, rather than clinging to the idea that like Halo, Forza, and Gears is where they're gonna find salvation. As a, well, as start a start. They were they tried to buy Starfield as their new like. Uh, uh, flagship yeah, flagship ip that was going to carry them and that fell through too it's almost like there's a recurring party in the story of microsoft uh game studio projects that is causing these issues well i guess now they're probably looking to like call of duty is going to be really useful for them um but you know who, who fucking knows well, what halo is going to look like yeah the, there's knows? also a concern of where you go narratively from here in the games because i mean you did yeah. we did like the one halo ring and then there was an array of halo rings and it's like uh what now because it felt like with halo 4 it was like running dry on ideas. probably just more reach style narratives covering various battles throughout the, the war yeah yeah mm-hmm but unfortunately, we got this. Was there anything else anybody wanted to uh, like throw say about uh, the show? If uh, um, or I, hate I it. feel I, uh, so, I feel like the show missed the point that Master Chief was separate from humanity, but still inexorably linked to humanity through this armor. Because uh, it used to be that the armor had to be put on by other people; the Spartans couldn't put on their own armor. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think removing that element just kind of further. It increases the divide between John Halo and regular humans. Which is weird when they think that the show is meant to be about exploring his humanity, yet they've made it so that he's actually pretty cosmically divorced from humanity. Pretty repeated. Yeah, he's insane. He literally psychopath. just, it's if he weird. just steals his armor and keeps it on, he would be unkillable. So <laughs> yeah. I don't see why he ever takes it off. It, we yeah, were well. talking about uh, thematic earlier, about like the the identity of a soldier. And uh, I think there's one of the issues with the show is the writers and the producers are sort of conflating these two ideas of dichotomy where you have like, because there is the du the, di the duality of a soldier's mind. Uh, and like all the best war movies explore that. It's like Full Metal Jacket. You have the guy with the helmet, the peace symbol on one side, Born to Kill written on the other. Uh, I think the Halo um, 
writers are confusing that dichotomy with the idea of uh, John as a person and Chief as a separate person. But there's no duality there. They they are one in the same. Yeah. And uh, they they're they're mixing those two up. I think, and so that's why they think that you can't explore Chief's humanity without taking the helmet off. But the games were already doing that. They were exploring that character's humanity without, with while keeping the helmet on. Well, um, um, I'll leave it to you guys to wrap that up. I've got a call. I need to head on out. Uh, so we're sort of reaching the terminus of this discussion. But um, for me, I hated the show. I hope there's not a season three. I don't think this show will have any lasting impact other than being just another on the big pile of bad examples of what not to do. I don't think it will garner any passionate fan base. It will just disappear into the mist of history, and people will occasionally go, oh, yeah, that's right. There were those seasons of that terrible TV show. Huh, yeah. And that'll, <laughs> that'll be its yeah. legacy. That's about it. Yep. All right, I got to head out. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up and talking about Halo Season 2. Fringy was uh, sort of the tip of the spear in this discussion. Poor lad had to watch a lot of... <laughs> Halo show content for this, so I'm glad we were able to give it the the best, most thorough discussion, probably on the internet. So Biggest there you scroll. go. There we go. Um, all right, I will catch y'all right. later. I will see you. Toodaloo. Wait, I later, see you later, man. Bye bye. Later. Uh, I still want to. Yeah, like if anybody still had uh, anything that that was sort of on their mind about the show, if they wanted to chat about it, more than happy to do that. It's bad. No, the, that thing about confusing dichotomies is was my thing, and I think yeah, yeah, I, the one of the was one thing. of the core problems with the show. I agree. Uh, it's it's. I think um. I think what I've noticed about the attitude that both the writers of this show and three four three seem to have is that um, like Halo as presented in the Bungie games, they don't believe like the conflict there is interesting enough to carry uh the series. Like it's not interesting enough to be absorbed in this world with the UNSC and the Covenant and the Flood and the Forerunners and the Backdrop, uh, the, the Human Covenant War or the reveal of the Flood and having to deal with that and then learning about the Monitors or like Gravemind or anything like that, that having uh, Master Chief be the vehicle for the player and potentially in an adaptation or further games, uh, the viewer to um, like participate and interact with this world, that that's not enough to carry it, that you need to you need to create like the, ah, well, he's got the inner turmoil that he's grappling with. Of, is he even a human? And what does it mean to be a soldier? And questioning orders and questioning authority and stuff like that, that they they feel like they have to do it because they don't think that Master Chief is interesting enough on his own, or that they don't believe that you can have a static character be the lead of a story, uh, or that you can't focus in on the external conflict uh, as like driving uh, potentially other characters to be more dynamic, characters like the Arbiter or something that you had to create the inner conflict and turmoil in John Halo, otherwise it wouldn't be worthwhile. I definitely get right. that sense. And it's um I think I think it's misguided. I think it's um I think it's the same kind of misguided that makes people not realize that you can have static characters who are still very compelling and interesting. Um it it, it in in response to that desire they created somebody who is so unpredictable, so unhinged, so like unsure of himself that he's pretty incomprehensible. Uh, which is worse than creating somebody like Master Chief, who I used to think was impossible to misunderstand, but apparently that has happened uh, with uh, some people, that they actually think he is a robot and not that he has a personality or that he cares about people. So, Right. Do you Are you guys terribly familiar with what's been going on with Star Trek in the modern day? Not hugely. I've no. got like a tangential set of knowledge thanks to a real BBC, but... No. <laughs> yes, no, um, yes and no. Is that so, like Picard and Discovery? Are those yes. the two active ones? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there was a plot line back in the day in Deep Space Nine about an organization called Section 31. It was a sort of black ops organization that kind of went against the morals of the Federation, but made sense that would exist. Uh, they, they were extremely clandestine in their operations and trying to further the interest of humanity, even though... Uh, Humanity was supposed to be above having that kind of uh, intelligence service. And uh, it feels like it, it's only like three or four episodes. It's mostly just a side plot for Dr. Bashir to 
kind of explore some of his uh, character. And it feels like the writers of the new stuff, when they were watching the old stuff, really latched onto that idea and wanted to like make their entire show about this Section 31 premise. And it feels like the same thing with the Halo show. It feels like they went through the Halo media and found this thing that they wanted to hone in on. And it, this dumb, edgy topic of like uh, the child, their child soldiers. And what, what, what do they feel about that? Instead of focusing on what is actually the core theme of what they're adapting. In Star Trek's case, it's about humanity overcoming petty differences between people and kind of working together for a better future. In Halo's case, it's about a guy in green armor that goes around shooting aliens. I mean, Halo is about more than that, but that's kind yeah. of my point is that it seems to be a recurring problem on Paramount that they take away the wrong message from what they're adapting and end up making something darker and edgier for no reason. Um, I, I wonder if I'd say that that's like a Paramount problem or if that's just like a problem that's been pretty persistent in a lot of our... A lot of these like kind of adaptations lately of just like kind of misunderstanding what it is that people like but then it doesn't help when like john halo doing the thing where the elite charges at him and then he ducks and shoots him with a shotgun that like that made people happy doesn't help uh in yeah. terms of conveying like what people actually or, or maybe it doesn't help in terms of it sends mixed messages compared to what i like about halo which isn't just john like master chief being not afraid of anything and being super cool like that's one thing but there's like a lot of things I really like about it that are not captured in this show at all beyond like everything that we really talked about. I really, I really hate um, what they've done to like the forerunners as an element. I kind of like adore the idea of the forerunners as an element in Halo, like that you can go to this place that's like this natural, like natural beauty meets like far flung science fiction futuristic tech that hides like a, a deep curse and like a hidden secret and a dark backstory um like that's super cool there's a lot of mystery and awe like an image that stands out to me is uh it's when uh it's when guilty spark takes uh master chief back to the control room and he's walking towards a control panel with like a big sweeping shot of the uh interior and it's like dude this is awesome and like i feel yeah. like i get none of this in this show of just like being struck by the pure awe and majesty of like this universe and, and the forerunners it's it's like they're the camera zoomed in two times and you really want yeah. them to just zoom it the fuck out so you can see what's going on yeah exactly mm -hmm. and, but it, um, it, that even like somehow transcends into the writing where you just wish that they would stop and zoom out so you could see the bigger picture exactly i, yeah. I mean you can i think um i i definitely come away with the perspective that john halo is astoundingly selfish and I think one of the big reasons why is just there is too little attention in his dialogue and his conversations with people and really a lot of people's conversations with everybody about the human covenant war. It's just that we'll often fake like episode five, uh, which is right after he wakes up after the fall of reach. He has a conversation with Halsey about what she did to him before he's like, wait, what happened to reach? And it's like, dude, that doesn't. Like, you can protest, like, we gotta go back and help. It's like, yeah, but that feels hollow when you just spent the last, like, five minutes and the first five minutes of you being awake talking about yourself. Uh, but you know why that happened. It's like you said, they've zoomed in too much. They're, like, so zoomed in on this handful of characters that uh, the broader conflict is lost to the background. It's like a blur that occasionally comes into focus when they zoom out just a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's me. That's me satisfied. Yep. The show yeah, is uh, pretty yeah. bad. Pretty bad. <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts there, are on the show? Uh, it was uh, a waste of time. <laughs> yes. yes, it was. A waste of, uh, a waste hate... of It's a waste of uh, the people who's made it time. It was a waste of our time. It's a waste of your time for watching this. Yes. It's just... it, is, it is grim. The, I hate it. In, um, the introduction cool. of the Flood was the only mildly interesting thing for me in this season. but And I actually would prefer if they just postponed it to season three and have the flood be revealed within halo somewhere and mm -hmm. like yeah that just feels like more it's thematically appropriate as a pandora's box story now it just feels like there's nothing special in the belly of halo that it's like why are we even i don't even care about exploring halo it's like we already know the floods out there it's wreaking havoc on onyx or whatever like why are we even doing the halo thing anymore you know like well, you have to find thing. out. In <laughs> what a great three, quote! Why are we even doing power. the Halo thing anymore? <laughs> <laughs> so, who, 
Who who's betting that uh season three will be a thing and who's betting it won't? I am leaning toward the uh, fact that we haven't heard anything yet. Uh, after at this point, I think three weeks since it ended makes me wonder. I'll throw out a uh, yes, but reduced budget. Like uh, final chance. My answer mm -hmm. would actually be: I think that the most likely thing is season three, but it's the end. You got to wrap it up. This is it. We'll let you finish it, but that we're done. Yeah, I'm going with absolutely. That there will absolutely be a third yeah, season. Yeah, I mean they they get they get the use from these things. Brand name on a streaming service. That's that's the True. trick. Our it's only true. salvation is if Paramount Plus just dies. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> one can hope. Our only hope it is seems, Hollywood just stops. It seems fifty fifty to me. Either they just decide to cut it off, or it's like okay, one more, wrap it up. Hopefully, we can yes. cash in on. The fact that everybody knows this is the last season, so they're gonna tune in to find out what you're happens. You're gonna have all your favorite stuff in it. It is <laughs> not unlikely. It is not unlikely that season three, uh, that season two will be the end. That they'll cancel it. I would say it's not what I would lean towards being the most likely, but it's certainly not so unlikely that it's like a small percentage chance. I, I think the <laughs> fact that it hasn't been renewed instantly should say something. Imagine they announced uh, right. Keith David will be joining the voice cast for the season. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Really desperate, yeah. I, I just don't want to. I don't want to see. I don't want to see Noble Team. I don't want to see Real Arbiter. I don't want to see Johnson. I want them to be safe and cozy, tucked away in their beds at night, having a nice drinking sleep. cocoa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just having, I don't know. They're having a grand time. Arbiter's I don't know. Marshmallows. A riveting novel with his little lamp on as he's sitting in his bed, like oh, I love this book. <laughs> with his slippers on. Yeah, I find yeah, it hard exactly. to care. It doesn't ruin the original thing for me if they bastardize it in the show. Cause so I kind of want them to do like a just meme compilation. How much more shit can can we reference? Mm -hmm. How many more references yeah. can we cram into season three before we get canceled? Get rid of the abstract. Little crazy shit happens. Yeah, just like really deep lore cuts. Yeah, I want it to end personally. I don't mm -hmm. want it anymore. I can't take it. Hurt <laughs> my soul, wounds me to my core. But uh, I imagine yeah. the end of season three would be basically the end of the first game where Halo blows up and Chief no. says we're just getting started. Cut to going back. by the pace, ah, going by the pacing of this show, it would probably end in like the middle of Halo three or something. It might actually end with them coming oh, yeah, maybe. to the Ark. They might only spend like two episodes on Halo before they're already back to Earth and then go into the Ark. Well, I was they thinking wait. about mentioning that earlier. Like yeah. they don't have anything to do at Halo, so they might as well just go straight to the invasion of Earth. Mm. Right. Yeah, like I, I seriously yeah. it, it's weird that they simultaneously take a long time to get to Halo, yet at the same time you think about the fact that they did Fall of Reach, the Flood, and the Spartan Threes all in one season, along with their own expanse subplots. Like that's a tremendous amount to jam in to our uh, eight episodes of television. Yeah. So yeah, I could I could see that happening. I was about to say but uh, we don't have to think about that anymore. But that's not true. I still got to think about it. I still, <laughs> I still, I'm still working on a good old. EFAB, yeah. Do you uh, do you know how soon we can see some of those um, episodes? Uh, well, I think uh, Mubes. It was uh, fairly soon, right? It was uh... the release of the episodes. We got yeah. Three Musketeers will be Wednesday. Then we'll have a week off on Wednesdays, and then it'll start up to be pretty consistent. Uh, only to be interrupted by another war movie arc, which will be the following month. Yeah, How many you episodes again? Eight. Good. Uh, eight episodes, yes. Eight so EFAP what? TV episodes every... Not every Wednesday. They'll be out every Wednesday. <laughs> um, yeah, but it will be consistent, which is uh, good. Enjoy our suffering in real time. Highly edited. Fun on the bun. Yep. Jam-packed with references. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, lots of fun. Not for us. <laughs> But fun for you. Yeah. Well. Uh, but yeah, that, um, that about does it for uh, Halo Season 2. I, I hate it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we've covered all the stuff. Wraps it up. We yeah, don't it recommend it. I just want to make that clear just in case anyone was wondering. No, from all it. that coverage. It's, it's, not fun. it's not funny bad. It's not fun. No. No, it's, no, fun. it's really boring. It's fucking well, so Someone boring. asked, why didn't you do an episode by episode breakdown? It's like, because that would have been fucking painful. Yeah. Going through <laughs> the amount of wasting time in this, the amount of just nothing happening. 
think uh, it better suits for a bouncy conversation, this sort of thing. It's not like a Marvel movie where you get reliable cringe every five seconds. It's just not like that. It's not a Madam <laughs> Web. <sighs> what a shame. Um, in any case, before we end up going, Patrician TV, where can people find you and what are you up to? Uh, they can find me on YouTube and I'm up to the same thing I was up to last time, which is working on this WoW video. Sweet. So you're going to be shitting all over WoW, huh? Uh, not really, because I'm talking about the vanilla era, so hmm. it's a bit more, bit more of a positive video from me, although I do make fun of the uh, 20 years of bad decisions that we're coming up on here this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's still around, right? It's still hobbling along. Mm -hmm. Good old, good old wow. Are you, do you uh, talk at all about, I remember seeing it on Twitter, Asmund Gold had a recommendation of how to save wow. Do you uh, see what he said? Um, I don't really talk about retail, so I don't really have a thing about that. I was going to look into some Asmongold stuff, uh, but more so to do with the classic era than with That's retail. Right, yeah. I, if, if he, I doubt he came up with it. It's probably somebody else, somebody else's idea that he's kind of just riffing on and working out of. All righty then. John CJG, what are you up to? Uh, John Graham on YouTube. I'm working on a new Machinima series. That's uh, I'm going to get the first episode of that out pretty soon. So that's what I'm working Excited. on. Now. Sounds Thank awesome. You. New is in brand new, fresh, new everything. Well, it's a reboot of a show, Hard Justice, that I did back in the early two or mid 2000s. That uh, is that the one really where the guy off, was but a... I like. Sorry, Is the ahead. one where the guy was in his apartment thinking about killing himself? No, that was a different one. That one's super cringe. <laughs> that's that's a lot of life remaining. Hard Justice is good memes. It's funny. Hard, hard Justice, I always liked the premise and characters, and I thought, you know what? I can do that better. And now I'm just basically doing it again, but better this time. <laughs> Trying to. We'll see. All righty. Um, ER, what, are you, what thing are you hating right now, other than the American Society of Magical Negro. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm still angry at uh, Netflix's um, uh, Avatar. Oh, yeah. Are you doing like a big thing for that? A very, way too big thing of it. Mm. I probably need to trim down quite a bit if I ever want to actually get it out. But well, yeah, that's. As long as you get it out before season two arrives and then season three arrives. Uh... And the, <laughs> what, what are they doing? A movie? A movie, okay. yeah. An animated movie? They're doing a movie as well. They're doing a sequel series. Atlafan's eating good. Lots of posts recently about how good Cora is. I've been seeing. Yeah, yeah. you got to cover. You got to cover the Fortnite stuff too. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll be playing. I'll actually be playing that eventually sometime. Oh. You are playing Fortnite. The sacrifices you make for your audience. <laughs> yes, I know. Truly, I'm a martyr. Well, very exciting. Man. Good stuff. Uh, links to everyone's channels in the description. Myself and Fringy just getting everything ready for you guys. More stuff coming on the uh, the old Moolah channel, including but not limited to, of course, the our trek through Halo. You're gonna get all of that very soon. War movie arc continues. Next week will be Rebel Moon Two. Oh, oh. legendary <laughs> film. Oh. Everything oh. that's posted about it is cringe. Rebel Moon is a film that's reliable for entertainment. I would say. Uh, I'm. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I'm kind of looking forward to whatever he's gonna do because it's it's gonna be so stupid. Like this is the one where everything <laughs> happens, guys. We did all the character stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny to think about, isn't it? The Scar Giver is that the second? Yeah, one? The yeah. Scar right Giver. Now. This one's got I know loads nothing of about Rebel Moon. Okay. <laughs> I'm ex I'm excited to hear that it's like funny bad. Well, I'm a little bit upset that you said oh, okay. Yeah. It's like, dude, lightsabers. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we need some more funny bad stuff these days. It's all just boring yeah. bad. I, I dude, said Justice a... League make me cry laughing. So if this does the same thing, <laughs> I'm I'm on board. Well, so that's interesting because Army of the Dead made me want to die. Like that 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 one was <laughs> too much. But yeah, there's there's uh it can happen. It can happen. It's funny. It, Rebel Moon has an element of funny in that it, 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 like, what it is. And also the meta's making it really funny that this is the one that's kind of changed the perception. <laughs> like, I'm like, hmm, you know what? Maybe Zack Snyder he ain't that it's, great it's, of a filmmaker at all. You, know, you nailed it when we went over fucking 10 million times we talked about this, but like the, uh, 
There's no DC to hide behind this time. There's no DC skirt that he I... can hide under. He's he's. It's, <laughs> it's been too long. He has to actually stand on his own. Army of the Dead slipped by. He was super fucking lucky that the, if that released today, could you imagine? Oh my God, he'd be oh, slaughtered. God. But <laughs> yeah. luckily enough, Snyder Cut was a big event, and it sort of it was an umbrella away from all of the noise. And I'd love to know the actual engagement on Army of the Dead. You must be have they not like squirreled away that as an IP at this point? Like nobody gives a shit. Which is funny when they wanted it to be a franchise, but that's not happening. But if Rebel Moon Two. Oh. Is as bad or worse than Rebel Moon One? Uh, his reputation is going to actually be dirt. Like he's going to destroy himself as an artist. And there will be so, no well, amount of I'm... the director's cut will save me. Kind of that's not. Even yeah. Really <laughs> oh god. Right the in. Snyder cut for Rebel Moon One and Two put together. How long is that? Like six, seven, eight hours oh, or some shit. Oh god, it's going to be long. Yeah. I'm curious, Mahler. What What do you think saved Army of the Dead when it? came out uh, like why, why, why would it be a disaster now same time too close in proximity to snyder cut oh. to the point where people weren't really they didn't care to pay attention to how bad it was it's sort of like oh i, I, I see even... all the snyder cut hype right yeah a lot yeah. of people at the time who had seen it who weren't people like us who like just really thought he was not very good were like yeah yeah i didn't really like it Ugh, it was it was there but anyway you know snyder cut that's a really interesting sort of cultural event meanwhile now right all the Snyder Cut's over. Like, there's no... There's still people who are saying, like, oh, Netflix, give him the money and he can continue the Snyderverse, which is so funny to me that that would even be a thing. <laughs> He's recent. Yeah, yeah no thanks. Just license out a competitive... Yeah. To a competitor, a competitive IP for their, their, their DC, like, universe. It's insane. Uh, he's recently said he'd have he'd be happy to do it animated. <laughs> if, if the, you know, oh as if like, God. isn't it funny how that works? It's like okay, fine, not live action, but animate. No one cares about animation. <laughs> Let me do that. Yeah. Like, so sad. But anyway, uh, I'll I'll be interested to see what's going on with that. We are expected to have uh, random film talk and little platoon with us to discuss it because they're both well versed in Snyder's isms. Um. And yeah, after that, uh, I'm not even sure. Uh, the, you know, a whole week, I can't be expected to plan further than just a couple of days. So hopefully, you guys will be excited for that. Uh, we will obviously get to all of the kind messages and donations on uh, the catch-up portion of this this stuff. We sort of split them up now. Um, and of course, Rags had to, had to pop out. But it, it was a wonderful, how long is this? Six-hour stream. Not quite as long as Not the one we did with Patrician it. before on uh, Never Knows Best. That was a classic. Especially the ending. Mm. But um, <laughs> that'll be it for us for now. Unless there's anything anyone here wants to say. No, I'm good. Well, Rags yeah. didn't get to share his final opinion, so I'll speak yes, for him. He loved the Halo TV show. He did. <laughs> no, Couldn't get enough did. of it. Just Praising it lies. here and there and everywhere. And I won't stand for it. I think he did enjoy <laughs> it. You know, he was like, this is better than, uh, like, Lord of the Rings sort of thing. And I was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Everyone's entitled to an opinion. Um, well, all right then. Goodbye, everyone. Have yourselves a wonderful day, afternoon, night. Did that and the other. Toodles. See you later, Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs>